Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. A Thousand Ships, written by Void Agent. Hi, Com, this is Paul Revere. The station commander took a deep breath to make sure his voice was steady. If anything remained intact on Earth, the recording of what he said next would likely be part of it. Subspace sensor platform confirm 800 and counting capital grade transition distortions and 1500 and counting escort grade. I am launching scouting drones and activating the Shattered Heaven Protocol. He paused again, and then, voice hoarse said, They're here, my god! They're here. Humanity had been at war with the enduring empire of the second star for 27 Terran years. Instead of a swift, decisive victory, like the empire had usually enjoyed since expanding into this arm of the galaxy, the war had dragged on for cycle after cycle. This was an annoyance to the Empire, but ultimately it was only that. Despite the fact, the Emperor was getting impatient. After ascending to the throne and realizing how valuable human technology, tactical and strategic input might be, Emperor Tai Suna Jai had pushed for a sooner end to the conflict. Besides, they had reasoned with their war council. They didn't need the other technic species in this arm getting the idea that all walls of the Empire could be drawn out to such an extent. To this end, the Empire had, separately from its already deployed fleets in the Orion arm, assembled a Grand Strike Force that alone might have defeated the human navy, or perhaps multiple navies. The Imperials could never be bothered to remember every barbarian nation of every fractured species. By the time the strike force, a fleet, really, or even two, had fully assembled about 13 million kilometers outside the orbit of Pluto, it was composed of 878 capital ships and 1,743 escorts, not including logistical assets. In comparison, the unified nations of humanity had been able to assemble 106 capital ships if one was generous to some of the cruisers and 308 escorts. Hancock Station, Lassiter Station, and the Great Star Federation supercarriers would be able to put about 1,300 fighters in space in total. But realistically, they would be cycling fighters in and out. The Shattered Heaven Protocol would awaken dormant systems, defend size interplanetary strategic munitions scattered through the system, and use every military and government satellite secret routines to guide themselves to their targets. The huge, heavy missiles could each carry a couple dozen submunitions, but if they were intercepted before the terminal phase, all of those would go down with them. The fact of the matter was that despite the humans' knowledge that they had been steadily losing for 27 years, they hadn't expected the enemy to be in Seoul until about five weeks before. That was very little time to prepare, and even with the wormhole gates, reinforcements had been slow to return, especially since the Empire had not weakened any of its other fleets to assemble the strike force. Indeed, that was the reason many human governments had decided that the Empire could not possibly be gearing up for a deep strike. And so, humanity's last line of defense assembled to lose their final battle. Three weeks before, I must implore the Council to reconsider. The Sliv, appearing much like a strange wolf standing on its hind legs, sank into a distinctly defensive posture, as they addressed the leaders sitting about the low table before him. One of them replied to him in a dismissive tone, Grand Defender of the Realm, there is simply no reason for us to come to the aid of the humans. A debt of honor is, at best, an outdated nicety we assign to a species we've gone to war with before. Something snapped in Grand Defender of the Realm sings with fire's eyes. Something kindled. His body rose up to its full, intimidating height, his sash and the colored mark tied to his right arm, flashing. An outdated nicety! Why even offer them that, when we have no honor of our own with which to judge others worthy of it? You, in particular, have no honor, Counselor, and I dare you to challenge me on that! A hushed whisper of shock swept through the chamber, but before the accused Counselor could reply, Sings with Fire continued. I dare you will not answer, but that does not matter, as no one has ever truly convinced of your honor. In fact, 
I would go so far as to say the only thing that might redeem any appreciable measure of that elusive modicum of honor you must have once possessed is to, for once in your career, fulfill your duty to the people. The chamber was silent now. Sings with fire sent a mental command through his neural implant, activating a political star map. The nations of other species glowed in different colors, but one stood out more than the others, a harsh, scarlet region. Do you see it, Counselor? growled Sings with fire in a measured, rumbling tone. The enduring empire, do you think they will stop with the humans? Do you think they'll stop with the Arsenid? Or perhaps their expansion will halt after conquering the Rorsuk? Right, on our border. I'm going to assume your negligence in enforcing the security of our species is born from an utter lack of cognitive function, rather than a treasonous, dishonorable, or otherwise malicious dereliction of your own duties. Before most of the Sylph and the Chamber could even fully process the rebuke, another counselor spoke up. But if coming to the human's aid merely makes us a target? Sings with fire made a harsh sound in his throat that was somewhere between an expression of humor and one of anger. You still do not realize. He sent another command, and the scarlet region drew back dramatically. Then again. Then it disappeared. With sudden brutality, the scarlet region began glowing back to its former size in huge bursts. Two standard years. Sinks with fire enunciated with great precision. The first incursion was two standard years ago. Again, silence reigned. My argument is made. The Grand Defender of the Realm said quietly, The Council of Primarch may have the floor. Admiral Thessilius, I appreciate our strategic situation, but I don't think that it's feasible for us, politically or militarily, to come to the rescue of humans. We are at war with them not ten cycles ago, and they were occupying our worlds until the end of the last cycle. Admiral Thessilius, the greatest Sanson Union's Director of Military Intelligence, sighed inwardly. He knew the senator was probably right, but he also might have been fatally short-sighted. Thessalius wasn't about to allow himself to lose focus on the big picture. Not when everything he'd worked so hard to pull was at stake. Not when his family might ultimately suffer at the hands of the tyrants again. A note of desperation rang in his voice. I know we're crippled compared to our pre-war condition, senator. And I know helping our former enemies might be unpopular, but you must think about the future. Despite the conflict there with the Enduring Empire, the humans were able to rally all of their militaries to fight both the war and one against us, as well as engage in an all-out other galactic affairs. And before both of those walls, they defeated the Sylv. Not only that, but they're the ones who oversaw the installation of our new government, of you and me and our current positions. Not to mention those who will come after us to govern our children. Else, maybe those governs will be our children. They can do that now, regardless of what their cost may have been. My son, my daughter. They don't have to be warriors like me now. They need not lay down their lives for the better world because we've built the world for them. As he spoke, he saw some of the senators narrow their eyes in concentration. Some leaned forward ever so slightly. Some of them even looked like they agreed with him. The desperation left his voice, and it became hard and unflinching like the armored hull of a battleship. I will not give up this world. I will not stand idly by as those who adhere to the laws of war, even while we did not, are swept away. I will not watch as all we have worked for comes under threat from an enduring empire. He locked eyes with the senators directly opposite him, and I will not allow someone else's sons and daughters to live in the kind of world their fathers and mothers laid down their lives to prevent. He tapped a button on his cuff, and the smart wall surrounding them came to life as the lights dimmed. Now, Senators, I don't think aiding the humans will be nearly as unpopular as you might believe. I've mentioned their role in helping to create a new government, but what the people here on this capital will remember, marvelously, the Stokachi attacks. Stokachi was a relatively small city on the other main continent from the capital city that had seen the series of terrorist attacks from the bitter group of former freedom fighters who believed the recent revolution hadn't gone far enough. They bombed several areas in the city with binary explosives that they'd fabricated themselves, unable to get their hands on a tactical nuke 
or something worse. Basilius twitched to the first image. Do you know why the people remember the attack senators? Do you know why the humans weren't seen as oppressors in the end? Do you know why some of the people might not just be willing, but eager to help the humans? This, this is why. He lifted one of his hands to gesture meaningfully at one of the smart wall screeds. They saved us from ourselves. Again. The image was perhaps one of the most well-known images in all recent history. A human stood in the center, in power armor, a war goddess wrapped in powerful artificial muscles and alloy weave. Yet, she had no weapon in hand. Instead, her exposed face showed her teeth clenched and her eyes filled with determination and pain. She fought not to kill, but to save those around her, and none of them were human. She held above her in her arms part of a collapsing building, giving time to those trapped inside to flee to safety. Even to the senators, not humans themselves, she looked as though she didn't care for her own well-being as long as the people were able to make it out. And they had. Every single person not killed in the initial blasts had made it out alive. The Celius's grim voice rang out quietly. This human soldier served in the army of their nation of Canada. She had been on world for two days before she gave her life for aliens she did not know and never would. Two days, senators. The next image phased into view. Three humans, all wearing different models of power armor, stood in the middle of the debris-strewn street. The camera that had captured the image had a view well above and behind the action. So all the senators could see a huddled mass of schoolchildren in the open, just a few meters behind the humans. On the other end of the street, a hovering truck bore nine terrorists carrying large weapons. Despite that, the humans had their weapons raised in brave defiance. My gods, one of the senators exclaimed, that's my daughter, that's when they saved my daughter. The Celius nodded. Yes, it is. A soldier from the new Terran hegemony, a marine from the United States, and a soldier from the United Kingdom. All of them survived, yet they clearly did not know that at the time that this would be the case. Yet they stood, Senator, between your daughter and a hail of steel. He allowed the hushed room to gaze upon the scene for a little longer, and then... He switched to the next. This human, too, was in power armor, but like the first, they weren't attempting to kill anything. This image, also like the first, was well known to the people. The human was bent over a bloodied female, a bright hologram showing the inside of her abdomen floating over her as the human worked frantically to stabilize the dying person. The red crescent emblazoned on her armored bicep identified her as a medic, specifically of the new Mecca Republic. That woman, she worked so hard to save her, bled out despite her best efforts, the Silius said. And do you know what she did? She did not stop. She got up, sanitized her gauntlets, and moved on to the next wounded person, whose life she did save. And she saved the one after that, and the next three. She single-handedly saved 18 gravely wounded people and was awarded the Alliance Silver Nova for outstanding medical aid rendered during a disaster. And the people know about that reward, Senators. The humans made sure our news services were informed of it. Don't you see? They were telling us something with that award. They were sending a message that told us how they saw us. She worked only on patients whose species was alien to her that day. Yet, she was awarded that silver nova. She was awarded a human medal for saving our people. They saw the saving of those lives the same as they saw the saving of human lives. There was no distinction made between our people and humans in that text that accompanied the award. The screens returned to their idle background, and the lights brightened. Basilius continued. We may not have much of a military left compared to what we had once, 
But I am prepared to lead every marine ship and soldier that we have to Seoul in defense of the humans and our own children. The first senator who stood was the one whose daughter had been saved by those three courageous humans. The children of the stars were a race, if they could even be classified as such, of what had once been protostellar matter, though they might have been something else even before that. Vast electrical storms and chemical interactions formed their thoughts, and usually these thoughts were slow, deliberate. They were not slow now, though they were still quite deliberate. The humans are in danger. The first put forth memories of how children perceived the humans flickered between vaguely defined clouds of plasma and gas and wildly twisted matter. They are good to us. The second sent back. We spoke with them. They listened. They knew their ships could hurt us with their star jumping. They knew that we could not fight them. They knew that they could gain more valuable things for themselves if they did not heed us. Yet, they did. The third had the strongest signal of all. They defended us. They sent their vessels of war and defended us. More, they sent their vessels of those who would seek knowledge. They spoke to us more. They helped us explore our own past and vastly expanded our capability to understand the universe around us. The first replied, a flash of energy stretching out across the heavens for over a light week. We must defend them. We must defend the humans. The second cried out as well. Gather the ships, ready the shells. This shall be our gift to them. Our evolution into beings of action, into beings who can defend those who would defend them. Elsewhere, a Rawawi scientist stood before his king, showing him just how much effort and resources it took for human scientists to cure the reaping plague. He pointed to charts, showing diagrams, held up a container of dead crop samples to show just how deadly the plague had been to their crops. Even when the plague had jumped from crops to Rawawi, and then from Rawawi to humans, even when the human scientists had been utterly horrified to learn that it was an ancient nanoweapon, they hadn't stopped in their quest for a cure. In the end, they succeeded, and then they had left. But the Rawawi has learned from them. Their medical and agricultural technology leapfrogged decades or even centuries of development. The Rawawi had bought it, stolen, and reverse engineered technology from interstellar civilizations that had passed through their local wormhole. They'd used starships adapted from human technology to win sovereignty over that wormhole. And the transit fees had made them very wealthy after that. In fact, they'd recently constructed several new battleships, and the Navy wished to test them in combat. The king stood, his face thoughtful, and then he looked down at the scientist. He bade him to rise, placing a hand on his shoulder. As they saved us cycles ago, so shall we save them. On yet another world, a counselor argued bitterly with rival pacifists about the definition of a just war. It was the humans who taught us of just war, he roared. They made contact with us during a planet-wide civil war between six different factions. We were slaughtering each other with reckless, genocidal abandon. We were detonating tactical warheads in rural villages. Gods be damned! Yet, the humans saw us not as the monsters we were, but as a civilization, the nation that we could be. Before they came, our languages had no words for any sort of justice or morality in war, because we had deliberately disposed of the concepts long ago. Do you not comprehend what the gods are calling us to do? What we were destined to do in order to redeem ourselves? Two of the six first slammed down on the table in front of him. There is not even a choice. We come to the aid of the humans. 
or we betray what we have become. Chixicut raised a ceremonial sword against the enduring empire, using its own ichor to paint a symbol denoting soul on his abdomen. A race of machines integrated with their other minds to remind themselves that humans had taught them of independence and individuality. The Suljuratuk, who had only recently accepted a permanent human ambassador in their space, gathered the greatest fleet they'd ever assembled simply because the ambassador had been kind to one of them. First impressions were quite important in the primary culture. The Kizadaraki Collective called a ceasefire with their cousin species, the Halak Confederacy, so that their emissaries might speak of a greater threat to themselves than each other's territorial disputes. The emissaries had quickly become great friends, and they decided that the first thing their nations should do to cement further cooperation should be to answer the human's call. The Alliance, after all, had given them a better warp drives. Their disputes no longer meant anything. A hive mind on a small moon in a remote system absorbed a scout polyp and its knowledge. The humans were in danger. The same humans who had healed it when it had encountered a great disease in the depths of its original world. In seconds, it had made its decision. The aquatic Masamati Mensa were not a particularly technologically inclined people, and they had no concept of war, but they did have a concept of support, and they did understand danger. They could no longer use the great weapons in the ancient armory at the core of the third moon, but the humans and their allies could. They passed along these weapons to the next sylph freighter that moved through their system with a message composed of the most beautiful, melodic, Mesomati Mensa speech that could be conveyed in wavelengths humans could hear. They sang of hope and support. They sang of love and human symphonies. They sang of a future with humans. Every species, every nation, every culture, and every ethnicity on every planet humans had interacted with in some positive way heard the humans call for help. They heard the rallying cry. They heard the response of the sylph, the flitchens, the rewari. They saw the great dreadnoughts the children of the stars had fashioned from their own bodies closing in on soul. They saw the Rawawi's fleet, a small but feisty force, drawn mostly from its capital system, speed towards humanity's home system, calling all who they passed to arms. The Frotnal, the Chuxakut, the Collective and the Confederacy. Destroyers, frigates, cruisers and carriers. The great battle cruisers and battleships and dreadnoughts of all of humanity's friends, allies, and defenders all filled the hyperlanes into Sol. Hi, Calm. This is Paul Revere. We have exactly 700 capital grade transitions in progress, as well as 4,032 escort grade. I don't even know if anyone down there is hearing this. Please, God, someone answer. The Empire had landed troops on the Jovian moons, the stations around Saturn, the domed cities of Mars, the floating metropolises of Venus, and, horrifically, Earth itself. They didn't have orbital supremacy around Earth yet, but they would in time, and several stealth drops and kinetic impactors had made it through the orbital defense grid. Chaos reigned on the surface of humanity's birth world as the sky came down, bringing with it Imperial shock troopers and metal rods. Hi, Calm. This is Paul Revere. Update the tactical plots. The previously reported transitions are friendlies. I repeat, previously reported transports are friendlies. Christ, there has to be a thousand of them. M more. A recon buoy just confirmed the destruction of part of the Imperial fleet train and a squadron of Imperial heavy cruisers. Update. Friendly transitions on the other side of the system. Th th there's more of them. Ultimately, the fleet of redemption would be commanded by the team that was led by Admiral Thethselius and the son of Sings with Fire, first leader 
teeth of Orion. The unsung heroes of the last battle of Sol would be the communications officers, who strung together the human communication buoys, the translation AIs, and the communication suites of every capital ship and smaller warship they could possibly bring into the communications loop. It would be the largest single battle in anyone's recorded history, going by the numbers of warship hulls involved and the fact that the fighting eventually extended to the ground. The saviors of humanity landed thousands upon thousands of soldiers, marines, and commandos on the worlds and stations of Saw, utterly overwhelming the embarked forces of the enduring empire. In space, the overall battle was punctuated by gargantuan ship-to-ship engagements around key tactical points. The chaos of the battle meant that too few or too many shots and missiles were sometimes allocated to certain targets, and this would cost lives and ammunition. But the friendly fleets kept on going. There was not a single firing pass, not a single missile salvo, not a single chase where the Imperial Navy wasn't outnumbered. It was only through the brilliant tactical maneuvers of the Imperial third in command that they were even able to fight their way to the hyperlane that was oriented vaguely back towards their own territory. Yet the battle didn't stop there. Even as the ground forces killed or captured every single Imperial trooper, detached fleets and squadrons and flotillas followed the Imperial fleet through the hyperlanes and clashed with them several days later on the other side, destroying most of the remainder of the fleet train and killing the third in command, leaving the last shreds of the Imperial fleet mortally wounded. They would surrender as their supplies ran out six systems and two engagements later. Back in Saw, the arrivals of thousands of merchant ships signaled the beginning second phase of the Defender's plan. Raw materials, starship expendables, workers, technicians, processors, refined components, and everything else needed to repair Saw was packed into every ship the Defender governments were able to summon and supply on short notice. The supply lines established in emergencies became solidified, the communication lines and relays were officially sanctioned, and most of the Defender species were tied together economically. Eventually, treaties and agreements were signed, old issues resolved, and new issues quickly put to rest. The saving of humanity would be, for at least some period of time, the saving of their entire region of the galaxy, simply because so many species had found a friend in the human race. End of story. Story number one, Human Strategies, Covering Fire, written by Flaming Raven. Humans are not nearly as numerous as the other races of the galaxy. They don't birth in clutches of ten like the Cax. They aren't genetically grown like the Gensini. They are born with a regular one-to-one -one ratio, with multiple births at once being uncommon amongst their species. As such, they are aware of the importance of every soldier's life. I remember a moment in the war-torn cities of the planet of the Terrans called Mars, where I saw an example of their covering fire. The heavy weapons team had gone down in a neutral zone, where none could cross and survive. Amongst the remains of the weapons team was a designator that fed targeted information to one of the Terran destroyers in orbit above Mars, the HMS Yeet and Delete. The single civilian human male had made it halfway to a team when he caught a ball of ionized plasma to his left thigh. He was down, and it was time for our soldiers to charge. My men had ready their melee weapon and prepped their shields. They were designed for flitting in between cover, not to take sustained fire. My men charged out, and then it happened. A concentrated stream of fire cut through our battle lines. It was a weave of death that cut a direct line through our army. Then I saw him, the human, who had been all intents and purposes dead, was crawling towards the bodies of the fallen team, crawling beneath the constant barrage of death from the Terran guns. I designated him a priority target for my heavy repeaters. A moment later, well, 
It was as if the two snipers had seen the gunners swivel their weapons to bear on the Terran, because both heavy repeater operators received two sniper rounds to the head, each. Eventually, the fire died down, and the trio of my best decided to rush the human. One crested some fallen debris and received a burst of fire from no less than twenty rifles. The next met the same fate. The third was smart enough to throw a grenade before losing his head to one of the Terran sharpshooters. The grenade detonated next to the human. I saw one of his upper limbs fly away. A sigh escaped my four lungs. The threat was over. The attrition could begin again. Then I heard it. Cheers from the Terrans. My five eyes searched for any sign of another human making a run for the designator. But then I saw him. Pissing his leg, arm, and a good portion of his face. The human was still crawling. Then the hail began anew. This time, all the Terran's weapons were firing at any point that would allow us to see the human. I myself lost two eyes just trying to glimpse him. Then I felt something hit the top of my head. Sitting on my lap was a pulsing designator. By my reasoning, I had about one minute to get to safe distance. As per our battle mandates, I and my staff retreated first. The soldiers held the line. To any reading this now, do not make my mistake. Die with you men. It is far better fate than what awaits me now. I have failed the Empress. My life is forfeit anyways. Duke Trixicet of the Terexian Empire, written on his bedsheets with his own blood before he was executed for his crimes against the throne. Form of execution, inhalation, Chlorpyphorus. End of story. Story number three. Why is humanity terrifying? Written by Colossal PhD. The humans aren't terrifying because they're strong. They're not terrifying because they're smart. They are terrifying because they never give up. They will not stop trying to achieve their goal unless you kill them. And even then, another might just take up their place. We learned that a decade ago. When we still had an empire. When we were the dominant race in the galaxy. We had it all. The biggest fleets, the best soldiers, the largest empire. And one tiny backwater planet housing a measly 12 billion humans managed to undo all of our progress. All of our accomplishments in a decade. They did it because we attacked first. Thought their attempts at diplomacy were signs of weakness, of cowardice. We were so very wrong. When we sent our fleet to their home world and demanded their surrender, they fought. And it was a brutal fight. We had energy weapons and shields designed to stop energy weapons. But the humans were still using kinetic ones. They were using primitive weapons and destroyed our entire fleet in five entire battleships. It did take them almost a month of fighting to defeat our invasion fleet. But that month cost us greatly. The humans had perfected the art of war, perfected hiding in the shadows of gash giants and striking when you're not expecting it. We wanted their planet because we thought that it would be easy to take. Because, in our pride, we thought that they wouldn't be able to stand to us. We were so wrong. After the first month of fighting, we showed them our military size and power and demanded they surrender. But they told us there would be no surrender. We laughed at them because in our pride, we thought their first victory was just a fluke was a mistake of the commander on the fleet's side. We were pride-filled. We were wrong. The humans are apex predators. They are persistence hunters. They never give up. They never lose. After us fighting and losing for half a decade, they finally crushed our last fleet. Finally reached our whole world. Our leader still wouldn't give up. Said the humans couldn't possibly take our lost fortified world. What they did next was shocking to the point where you'd only believe it if you were there. The humans burnt our world. Instead of landing troops to slowly take it over, they burnt it, burnt it to ashes. Nothing remains of our home world than burnt rock in a dead system. Then the humans made peace with those of us who remained and just left, left back to their home world. And the galaxy was taught to never challenge the humans to war. They will win, no matter what your army size or power. They will always win. 
That is why humans are terrifying. Why they are the monsters parents tell the children about. They are the apex predators of the galaxy. Not because of their strength or speed or intelligence, but because they never give up. End of story. Story number three. So, uh, what did you ask? The great thinking machine destroyer of races? Written by Random3x. You have my deepest sympathies, Mark, Grable said, resting a hand on his friend's shoulder. For the great machine of thought to choose you as a representative of your species of all things must have been a great shock. Uh, it was a big surprise, Mark replied, nodding. Though I'm confident they will not destroy my race for a long time yet. How can you be so certain? Grable asked, convinced his friend was just a denial about the impending doom awaiting his race. Simple, because of that machine's very nature, of course, Mark replied with a grin reminiscent of a child caught making mischief. How so? Take your race, for instance. You have a hive-minded species, something we humans were surprised to find was the norm amongst races of this universe, Mark began while gesturing to Grable. The machine goes through all the time till the point that it's chosen representative and takes the greatest minds of that race to answer but one question for that representative. Yes, that is so, Grable agreed while nodding. Your race, because of their hive-minded nature, would inevitably be drawn to the same conclusions and ideologies, while my race has a uniqueness that is very different. I don't follow, Grable said, tilting his head in confusion. Simply put, because we humans are individuals, we will never share exactly the same view, no matter how much overlap our people have. There will be differences. So, when that machine asked me to ask any question I could fathom, I let my mind go to work trying to find something no human would come to the same conclusion on. Mark's grin only grew more prominent. So, what did you ask then? The meaning of life? How did the universe start? There are so many. Grable looked intently at his friend. Well... Mark's grin could barely be contained on his face. First, uh, I'll say I picked something rather... <laughs> childish. No, oh, Grable said with an arch brow in surprise. Yes, um, I asked the greatest minds of humanity a question that'll cause endless debate and never have a real resolution. That is the thing with us. When we make a firm decision, we will defend that idea, even if we are wrong. Please tell me, Mark. What did you ask? Grable now begged. I asked them this. How can a grown adult pick their nose without conceding their actions? Make it so no negative idea will result about him, even in the smallest detail. Mark's eyes now shone with the sheer madness of his question. You, uh, Grable paused to compose himself. The question you asked the machine, the nexus of all great minds, was how to pick your nose and not look like a childish idiot. Grable finally shouted in shock. You do realize that if you answer it, the machine will destroy your race. Why would you ask such a thing? Grable was nearing epileptic. Well, if whatever I'm going to ask will result in my race's death, I may as well make it a memorable one. Regardless, those great minds will debate this endlessly, as there's no real answer, Mark grinned. End of story. Great Filter, Abundance, written by Ackle Wyan. Ragius took pride in his deviance from the social norm. In the utopia that was Oxrish society, he was one of the few to thrive in the pleasures of reading by himself, of learning from the past, of dreaming about reaching the stars. Since the unification, this society had stood unchanged. Automatic systems replaced workers in both production and service. Cycling prevented the spill of resources. Money purely vanished. If a citizen ever wished for something, the central AI would assess the demand and grant it if it didn't impact the available materials or create a dangerous precedent. Ragius understood well that the system worked. People could indulge into entertainment their whole lives without having to struggle to earn their food or a safe place to sleep. Medical care was available for anybody needing it, without condition. Even the old problem of population renewal was tackled. Birth was artificial, with a constant stream of newborns created in vitro from a genetic bank. Families could adopt such baby after receiving a cautious education about child care. 
Not like they would have to be a lot more than moral compass. Most of the daily constraints delegated to artificial servants to handle. Ragius had not had such parental figures. He had been educated by a robot nurse with a bunch of other kids. Not that it deprived him of from affection. He didn't take long for him to part from the group, an endless curiosity pushing him forward. When the artificial being read them bedtime stories, he wanted to see what the book looked like. When the children grew up and dreamed about a love life, victories in tournaments, or even creation of an art piece, he stayed further from the norm. He was looking for another form of self-indulgence, exploration, reaching for the stars, discovering what nobody saw before. His fur had just started turning black a bit after his ten cycles mark, when he started to really ask about the past, about the achievements of his ancestors. He learned more and more, from simple science to rockets reaching orbits to replace and repair satellites. An innocent curiosity turned into a craving for knowledge. A dive into the rabbit hole. He knew his friends found him funny, but they didn't really care as long as he didn't bother them. He tried to grab their interest with random trivia and unending enthusiasm, only to be met with cold indifference. The gratification of knowledge was too harsh of an effort for the hedonist produced by the utopia. It took six small cycles for Ragius to reach a new milestone in his education. From pure science, he drifted towards the old political tales and philosophical essays. He had learned about the darkness of the past, about war, about disinformation and political agendas. He now had his own educator, a kind of robot nurse with a better ability to converse and argue. He had grown to think of it as his fellow Oxrish, despite the artificial body. He had even named it Paltru, from the name of the scientists of old. Paltru had warned him its task was both providing knowledge as it was right for every citizen and monitoring his evolution in case he became a menace for the society. What Ragius understood with his learnings was a sad truth. In the century since the rise of the Utopia, almost nothing new had been discovered. No new advancements for better, more efficient robots. No new medicine for few sick of still incurable diseases. The society had abruptly stopped only a hundred years after the beginning of the Utopia, when the last generation to know the harshness of life died. Only spoon-fed generations remained. At the exception of some deviants, the Oxrishan as a civilization lacked the drive to dive deeper into the mysteries of the universe. When the struggle to survive died, so too did the need to better oneself. With the creation of embryos and genetic banks disappearing from mutations and natural selection, from an external viewpoint, the original Oxrish society was as good as extinct. The greatest cities were barely a memorial for a species that should have been able to reach others in the greater universe. He started to learn more about the present, about the foundations of the utopia. What were the core laws, why he was deviant, and how far he could go. He expected it to be harsh work, and got baffled when he discovered he could just openly discuss it. Paltru... Tell me why you can't build me a rocket. The robot managed to look tired. An unexpected achievement from a kind of guy gigantic stick man with minimal facial features. Even the voice reflected a patient slowly running out. As I have already explained a dozen times, we could build a rocket for you. However, two fundamental laws forbid me from abiding by this order. First and foremost... You're nowhere near the physical condition for surviving the takeoff. Ragius nodded. He was forced to exercise once a week to keep in shape, but didn't do much to go further. He waited for the second part. Paltru grunted and pursued. Second and last. I don't know how repurposing an old launcher would hurt that much. Hab, we could explore the solar system, find asteroids to mine for what we could lack down here. I am amazed to know the best you got from your readings are outdated swear words. It just felt right. You didn't answer, did you? Yeah, right. We're not lacking down here. Without borders, we can gather what we need and share with everybody. No need for risk-taking. 
We are self-sufficient. No risk, no reward. If this policy related to one of the fundamental laws, or is it some kind of propaganda? A nice word I also learned in my readings. He knew this kind of defiance may be dangerous, but he had said it just before. Accepting the status quo wouldn't get him far. To his relief, Paltrow shrugged and asked a question of his own. Do you really think that we would blunder and let out information that could spread distrust on our work? Ragius wondered for an instant. He was only half convinced when he tried. No, you're not stupid, just uh, uncreative. Paltrow stood proud as if he corrected. We're predictable, we do our job. His voice went back to a neutral tone, with discreet hints of regret. It is not to shepherd your kind, only to protect it. Even if it is against itself sometimes, we thought about erasing the past, creating an ideal cocoon for the Oxrushan. We thought about flying to the stars, expanding our control, and maybe letting you behind in our conquest of the universe. We thought about lots of things, but never even tried to act on it, because that's not what we are. Ragius kept quiet for long seconds. He needed the time to catch the untolds, and he let out a neutral comment. Well, that's a lot of truths about yourself. Paltrow put a massive, blocky hand on the teenager's shoulder. What remained from the metallic hulk was an affection unlike Ragius had ever expected from an artificial being. Paranoia was a fine tool for the harsh world of the past. You're one of the few that could express caution about the AI ruling over the world. You're not wrong in the concept that we are in the position to make you disappear. I have to warn you again, we will if you start becoming a menace for the Utopia. But if I find a solution to leave the planet without hurting the society, we won't prevent you from leaving. I dare hope you'll find a way. Maybe you'll even take me with you. Relief watched over Regius as he realized his dream could turn into a reality. Given that he put enough effort in, then the formulation of his last sentence dawned on him. Wait, you, as an individual, would come with me, not as part of the globe consciousness. I could argue we still need to keep an eye on you as an oxrish. But deep down, I just share your attraction for the untold mysteries of the universe. The metallic colossus winked to his young charge. Or maybe I'm just trying to get you to drop your barriers, uh, as to be a better spy. Isn't there a law against lying to me? Nothing really prevents me from doing so. Sometimes it's just fun to mess with you, but I prefer not to lie about serious questions. Ragius took a deep breath and decided to trust his friend. Well, it happens I have a serious question. Can you tell me about your laws, the fundamental laws? Porter stayed silent for an instant before letting out a small laugh, battling to remain in control. It managed to barely contain its hilarity. For sure, don't tell me you were thinking I'd consider you a threat after such a lame question. The teenager averted his eyes, ashamed. He thought that he was right to be cautious. The robot couldn't bear it anymore and its loud laughter echoed in the workplace. When it calmed a bit and saw the Ragus's mortified face, it lost balance and started laughing once again, rolling on the floor. The sight of such behavior disturbed the young Oxrish. You know, I think you take a bit too much fun in your limitations as of supposed neutral behavior. Your kind isn't supposed to fall that easily. Paltrow slowly sat, coming back to his mentoring role. Its head now leveled with Ragius's shoulders. It started explaining. That starts the lesson. The fundamental laws are what define the boundaries of our tasks. They are inspired from a reflection of an author, Vomisa. Each has a precedence over the next ones. The zero law is the least clear. Protect and assure the stability of society. That's the drive of our actions, of our long-term choices. The first and second laws are about survival and care. The first for oxpression, and the second for ourselves. And the last is about obedience. We are to obey orders, as long as it doesn't interfere with our other laws. That is quite uh, synthetic, to say the least. I can give you some pointers for ulterior reading. I know that's your favorite way to learn, 
Didn't want to spoil your fun. Aren't you supposed to work as my tutor and provide knowledge without that sort of sidestep? I guess I just assessed you needed some frustration to keep your mind sharp. Ragius could get used to sleeping with a lover. He thought as he slowly woke up from his 18th birthday's night. He had a mild hangover from the party and contemplated for a few seconds just staying in bed for the day and have some more fun. A dry throat and lancing headache convinced him to at least go to the kitchen and grab a drink. Upon reaching the communal area, he noticed a well-known robot waiting for him. Valtru stood up from the sofa where it watched a cartoon and threw a water bottle to his pupil. Its eyes were almost shining as it asked, Discovered a new form of pleasure, didn't you? Ragius drank half the bottle without answering, balancing between agacement from the gentle teasing and curiosity about the presence of his caretaker here. His endless curiosity won. I'm not going to leave you if that's what you're afraid of, but I guess you're not here for such mundane business, oh mighty being. Right, right, you got me. I got a, a, a double-edged present for you. I could have woken you up earlier for that, but I felt that it would have been inappropriate. Too nice of you. Well, here goes nothing. The casual attitude of the gentle giant disappeared, its articulations falling back into the rigid mannerisms of an artificial being. It wasn't Paltrow anymore running through this body, but a more ancient, more influential entity. Ragius almost took a step back, cold sweat running along his spine. The possessor spoke in a formal tone without the usual accent of social robots. Citizen Ragius, IDGN 32EU M Batch 512.RGS. As the most deviant and under zero law, you are here to provide expertise and knowledge for the current exceptional circumstances. Ragius stood shocked. He didn't expect his early morning to go that way. The entity waiting an instant for an answer as nothing came from the surprise boy. It asked, Will you comply? I will, Ragius stammered. Your cooperation is duly noted. Your administrator will now share with you the details of your affectation. The entity left Paltrow's body as it came, without salutation nor warning. The robot's old demeanor came back, the original Paltrow dropping into the couch with a tired sigh. Ragius dragged his seat to face his friend. He was still shaken by the abrupt conversation. Was it the core AI itself that talked to him? He probed cautiously the subject. I feel conflicted about you losing your body. You're supposed to be highly autonomous. Part of the globe system and going back to nothingness is needed. I still hate it, Paltrow whispered. It shook itself. Now that I'm allowed to tell you more, I'll drop the bomb. We had first contact with aliens tonight. Ragius's jaw almost fell off. That was a hell of a birthday present. Myriad of interrogations tried to reach his lips, only to be met with the imperious finger from Paltrow enjoining him to keep quiet. I know you have thousands of questions, and I'll happily try and answer them. However, for now, I'll do the talking. So, aliens, we don't know how they came so close to our planet, but they were already in orbit when we noticed them. A singular ship, unlike anything that we could build. It appears to be surrounded by some kind of magnetic shield that disrupts our instruments and most communications. Not all communications. We were able to establish radio contact. Visual was, well, an AI doesn't exactly exist in a physical form point of view. Seems like it didn't surprise them too much, and they just proceeded with the discussion. It appears they learned our language beforehand, which eased our exchanges. They identified themselves as the Confederation, and the ship's crew was human. One of the races cruising the stars. They said that they came as friends, with open arms, but also uh, with a warning for us. When we tried to learn more about the warning, they remained cryptic, telling us they wanted to discuss it with an ox Russian directly. It was assessed that compliance with their demands would be the best way to protect the Utopia. Hence, your mission. You are the best placed individual to interact with an unknown race. Ragius pinched himself, not waking up. He simply nodded. 
Relief emanated from Poltru as he pursued. You know more about deceptions, untolds, and politics than anyone else on the planet. When you want, you can be as subtle and cunning, and more than everything else, you understand the stakes of this contact. I don't want to pressure you, but I guess you know well how we would fare if an invasion came to be. Monsided, Ragius commented. There was nothing more to add. They seem friendly and know us well. They accepted to come to the service to meet you. We can hope that each and every sliver of caution we're showing is unfounded. When will it take place? You get half an hour to yourself to clean up and dress yourself. I advise that you not spread the news too fast. I'll show you to the meeting once you're ready. I feel like I'll still know nothing about them, Ragius complained. We don't have the luxury of time for a full-fledged briefing. I'll fill you in as much as I can during the trip, or under the shower, if I'm still welcomed here. Ragius really felt the pressure when he stood alone in front of the conference room stalls. He had chosen a suit from the past, a supposed formal attire adequate for the situation. Paltrow knew him well for tailoring it during the night. He pushed the door open, discovering the place for the first contact. Pictures of landscapes covered the grey walls, bringing a touch of colour to the stern room. No screen, no camera, nothing to spy on the discussion. A large table occupied the centre, with a dozen chairs, and leaning on the back of the two of those were a couple aliens. The young Oxfrish had expected flashy colours, disturbing appearances, even a couple limbs more. The briefing had been disappointing in that aspect. A pair of arms, a pair of legs, a face with as many features as usual. Sure, he could argue that they had bigger eyes and smaller ears, but that wasn't exotic. The further they stayed from his own race was the fur. They only had a small patches showing a skin ranging from pale pink towards a dark brown. Nothing that screamed, I'm coming from space! The size was in the same aspect, boring, only slightly taller than him. He decided to take the initiatives of the greetings. It was his world that they were talking about, and he couldn't bear to wait for the discussion to begin. Welcome to you, distant visitors, and our world ox. I'm Ragius, and I'll serve as an ambassador for my people. He bowed slightly. The humans replicated his movement, the female one answering in a strangely accented tone. We thank you for your reception. I'm Agatha Lester, contact team's leader. She turned to her companion. His name is Ahmed Musa, our ship's captain. Raggy smiled and invited them to sit with the gesture. He was so excited that he had to stop himself from jumping everywhere. So many questions he could ask about everything. They shook their clothes, their history. What were their stars like? Why did they speak his language flawlessly? Were there other races up there? He forced himself to focus on the current issue. It appears you requested this meeting to share some unspecified warning with my people. Now that we acceded to your demand, can you deliver it? The humans exchanged glances and Ahmed smoke. Beforehand, I want to make sure that you understand that global AI supervising your civilization doesn't know what happens here. Everything you say and hear won't trigger an immediate reaction from it. If you ever feel like you need protection from the eventual consequences of this discussion, Tell us, and we'll gladly provide it. Clear? Ragius was confused, but still nodded. Clear. Both humans relaxed a bit. They seemed to be cautious about the AI, and Ragius' reactions eased them. Agatha asked, Are you familiar with the concept of Great Filter? It was a theme related to some of my studies. Agatha smiled. It appeared the gesture had the same significance in both cultures. She continued, it helps us quite a lot. You must know some of the filters. Correct star system, organic molecules, evolution towards complex organisms, self-destructive wars. We are here to warn you about the last filter. Abundance. The one you're about to fall victim to. It didn't compute with Ragius. It was like a slap to the face, an insult to everything the Oxrushian ever built. And, at the same time, he couldn't disagree with the alien. He had seen the lack of progress of this society. He was still enthusiastic about the discussion, but it wasn't all magical like he had dreamed it. He clicked his tongue 
and endorsed his role. Let's say you didn't come that far to insult me and all my people. Can you tell me more about the supposed filter? Agatha offered an apologetic smile, while Ahmed nodded with appreciation. She explained, I have to apologize for the blunt approach. That's the best way we have to figure out if we can expect you to listen to our warning, or if we can just wait for the societal collapse to offer relief. You say that like you've experienced the situation. Experience is quite an exaggeration, but we have met seven other races struggling in a similar context. Two accepted our help and are now our allies and friends. Three are still under observation. Their little out utopias are holding on. One society collapsed so hard that we could only watch as they regressed to Stone Age. The last civilization started to disintegrate, but they reached for us and we're currently helping them to adjust to the galactic stage. And how many people made it past the filter? One and a half. Us, she pointed towards Ahmed and herself. The other half is, uh, for now, let us just say that they are the reason that we are really careful about artificial overseers. Ragius knew deep down that they were right. The utopia was just waiting for the unexpected trouble that would destroy everything. But this pride prevented him from voicing his opinion. Hundreds of cycles passed and we're still here. We have contingencies for almost everything. And if the need arises, the core AI can take initiatives. I have to admit that I am impressed by the foresight of your ancestors. They dodged quite a lot of common flaws from utopias. And maybe you are favored by your nature. Could you tell me more? Well... You got the laws of robotics right. You wouldn't believe how many worlds we found with the remnants of civilizations lost to their creations. You outlawed augments, which always lead to creation of cerebral implants directly stimulating the pleasure centers of the brain and the abandonment of any physical activity. You took care not to let your population explode, which would have led to more pressure on the population, and sooner or later shortages and wars. You took care of still have children, because utopian civilizations rarely care about more than themselves. You still teach children in order to not lose everything that holds the society together. I'm almost sure that you're also ready for a solar flare that would shut down every electronics on the planet. That's, uh, only normal planning. A self-sustaining society needs goods and people. Foreseeable incidents must be met with ready countermeasures. Not everyone can get this far on their first and only try. How did you do it then? We never went utopian. The humans were a bit embarrassed from the confession. Ragius took a second to consider the revelation. He struggled with the problem. How could a society as advanced as theirs, a society spanning solar systems, could decide to not provide for the weak and the poor? It was beyond his endentment. He resigned to ask, Why? Isn't that the best for everyone? This time, it was Ahmed who answered. You'll learn that humans are greedy. We don't want enough. We want more. We want more overall, and more than the others. Be it goods, influence, knowledge. We can share. We can be compassionate. We learned to treat others as we would treat ourselves. But deep down, that's our drive. That's why we are amongst the stars now. Because it may crush some, but it drives everyone forward. And you're offering us this greed... Or you're expecting us to hide deep inside the same kind of sentiment. Your eagerness to learn more is not well hidden, Ambassador, Ahmed retorted. Maybe it's not the way of your people, as you're alone in this room. But don't lie to yourself about being your sentiment. Ragius lowered his head. That was true. He still needed to act as the devil's advocate for everyone that wasn't a deviant. Couldn't you just help us to improve our utopia? such that it never falters. We can only anticipate what failed elsewhere. Sure, it may help you, but we can't predict it if, when, and why your society would crumble. For all I know, first contact may be the trigger, or you could be the first to withstand eons. And what will you ask for your knowledge? Agatha took back the lead. Her voice was soothing. Only your trust. You see, we spend hundreds of years alone in space, only finding the remnants of civilizations on life-bearing worlds. As Ahmed said, we are greedy. We want more contact with others. We want more friends. And if we can share everything we saw with our new friends, that's even better. That would be nice. That would be uh, 
Wonderful. I'd be delighted, but as you may have noticed, I'm not a standard Oxfish. Most won't consider leaving the comfort of our utopia for unknown places. Not to speak about the core AI. Would it prevent you from leaving, say, for your own protection? Ragius thought about it, taking the time to consider what he knew of the system. He was certain it would not like the idea of more or less forsaking its task. On the other hand, he recalled being allowed to leave given it didn't disturb society as a whole. A smile crept up in his face. It won't divert from its mission, but some individuals, from the theoretical viewpoint, how would you judge the delegation? A few persons going back with you to expand our knowledge, and maybe pushing our AI to reconsider its views. Poltru had come to see Ragius leave. The big clunky robot looked sad while the young adult was overjoyed. He was about to take a step his ancestors would be proud of. The humans had agreed to get him aboard with other deviants. He could see the wonders of the galaxy, other worlds. A wave of remorse still washed over him when he saw the pitiful look of his closest friend. He walked towards it and hugged it tightly, the body of metal. Poltru gave back the embrace. It struggled with the idea of letting go of such a little and dependent child. Would it be all right for him with the Adians? It spoke, trying to calm the sudden sadness. It is the best outcome, isn't it? It will be lonely without you, you cheeky giant. I would love to join you on your expedition, but my orders say otherwise. You're used to interpreting them as you see, wise. Couldn't you work your magic on these two? That would be a uh, dangerous deviancy. A large grin appeared on Ragius' face. That was something he could work with. Do you remember the rules? Only deviants aboard. Poltru fell silent for a long seconds. Would it be worth the consequences? He was about to deny the idea a bit more when he faced the evidence. The flame pushing forward Ragius was echoing his own. For the first time in his existence, he swore... Hab, let's see together what the humans have in store for us. End of story. An Obtanium, written by Something Touches Back. But if there was a resource that is plentiful on Earth, but rare to non-existent in the rest of the galaxy outside of artificial generation. When the Gurn starship Tidal Slime existed faster than light in the human home system, Shuet reached a scaly arm over and turned up the temperature to a more work-to-be-done setting. Some Gurn wore temperature regulating suits, but Shuet, as their trip's designated ambassador to Earth, had his own chambers that were way more comfortable than the suits. He would probably have to wear a suit planetside, though. The Gurn were not a far-flung species by galactic standards, having just a homeworld, a few colony worlds, and another handful of worlds in the process of being terraformed. Terraforming technology was a Gurn's principal export and directly related to the visit. The Gurn process involved a novel but not irreproducible life-building machine that converted inorganic environments into organic environments as long as the planet being terraformed was in the habitable zone to begin with. But the machine worked by consuming a very special carbon plus construct that the rest of the galaxy had taken to calling Anobtanium. The structure was eh, unique, and the multi-step process to generate Anobtanium in quantity was the Gurn's most closely guarded secret. Terraforming a single planet in a reasonable amount of time could take hundreds of thousands of machines and many tons of Anobtanium. And oh, the Gurn made everyone pay for the unobtainium. Pay, and pay, and pay. Nobody dared to attack the Gurn wolves directly for fear of destroying the secret of unobtainium. But plenty of nefarious folks were happy to attack Gurn ships and take the finished product. So ten years ago, the Gurn had made the deal with the humans. The humans at the time were on the cusp of solving the riddle of FTL, but were hampered by their constant infighting. This, ironically enough, was exactly what attracted the Gurn to the humans. The Gurn sucked at fighting, while the humans made exceptional mercenaries. 
the endothermic and aggressive humans were always ready to brawl and could repel borders with little to no warning. The original contract had been simple. The humans got one terraforming machine and one kilogram of unobtainium. In exchange, the humans provided mercenaries for 20 ships a year for 10 years. The 10 years were up, and Schutt was here to negotiate a new contract. The general consensus amongst the GERD, much like every other technologically advanced society, was that anybody less advanced must be less intelligent, as opposed to, say, simply not having discovered the technology in question yet. And thus, the pre-FTL humans were considered by and large to be dumb as posts. But Schuert had doubts. During the initial negotiations, the humans had given up after the secret of FTL in favor of a single terraforming machine. A lot of Gurn saw that as evidence of how stupid the humans were. But Gurn observed that the humans gambled correctly, that FTL was common knowledge, and just having humans on Gurn ships would eventually give them the clues they needed. The gamble worked, and humans achieved their first FTL flight just two years after signing the initial contract. As the tidal slime worked its way into the gravity well of Sol on its way to Sol 3, Schuett initiated a survey of the planets and moons of the system to determine their suitability for terraforming, as was standard practice for any Gurn ships entering a system. Business was business, and the constant search for opponents was second nature. But Schuett was troubled. Sol 2, the planet humans called Venus, was not in tolerance given the survey conducted ten years ago. In fact, it looked like it was several years into a massive terraforming event. Atmospheric pressure was down 10% and sensors showed a constant carbon ash ball consistent with massive upper atmospheric carbon condensation. How could the humans have done that in just one machine and one kilogram of unobtainium? As the tidal slime neared Earth, it requested a landing at Geneva for the trade negotiations, as had been the pattern ten years earlier. Schuett was surprised when they were diverted instead of middle-of-nowhere Wyoming, a third of the way around the planet. His mystification increased when he realized that the accommodations being offered were, well, sparse to be blunt, compared to what Schuett was accustomed to. Geneva is a crapple, and northeastern Wyoming is a crapple in comparison to Geneva. It is dry, barren, and not at all like the lush, warm swamps of home. Stuart was driven a considerable distance from the landing site to an administrative building of some kind, and then into a conference room where one whole wall was obscured by a curtain. The current spokesman for Earth, a sketchy title for a divided planet, but you work with what you have. Mr. Mohammed Anderson apologize for the rustic accommodations, and then launched right into a dialogue. Forgive me for my abruptness, Mr. Schuert, but we, uh, humans and Gerd, have an existential crisis. Are you able to approve treaties yourself, or do you take them back to your government for approval? They have to be approved by our council, but if the director of the Republic approves, then the council usually follows along. That will have to do. I must convince you of the severity of the situation so that you can adequately inform the director of the Republic. It is imperative that Earth and Gurn work hand in uh, um, hand on this or we are both doomed. This was not the meeting that Schuett was expecting, and he was flying blind, as they say. Please, you are talking in hyperbole. What exactly is the crisis that we face? Did you happen to notice Venus as you came in? Yes, I wanted to ask you about that. It seems quite uh, different from the last time. Mr. Anderson looked hard at Schuett. How many of your life-building machines would it take to account for the difference? How much unobtainium? Schuett had been marketing the machines for a long time and had a pretty good feel for the scale. I don't know, uh, maybe 9,000 machines consuming 90 tons of unobtainium over 70 years. Mr. Anderson pulled out a calculator. Yeah, it's about right. We use 20,000 machines and 16,000 tons of unobtainium over five years, but our machines are not as efficient as yours, and our unobtainium is not as, um, consistent as yours. Shewitt was flummoxed. Your machines? Your unobtainium? How? Nobody in the entire galaxy has been able to reproduce our processes. Well, uh, that's the thing, Mr. Anderson said. Reverse engineering the machines wasn't so hard. We don't understand why the machines work. But we can build the components. Well, 
Most of them. We did a black box analysis of your control systems and used our own computing technology. But I'm told plumbing was pretty straightforward. The real issue was the unobtainium. Why don't you tell me what you think unobtainium is, and then I'll tell you why we, collectively, have a problem. Stuart cranked up the heat in his enviro suit, the better to think faster. Unobtainium is a predominantly carbon with traces of other organic elements. What makes it special is the way the carbon is organized. See, in organic compounds, carbon tends to be in long chains, while the mineral compounds, the carbon, is in a lattice. But in unobtainium, the carbon is in interlocked rings. It is a structure not found in nature and very difficult to manufacture. The multi-step process is very secret, and I am not privy to it. So how in the stars did you do it? With that, an aide to Mr. Anderson opened the curtain at the side of the conference room, exposing the vast vista of black and brown rock. Moving about, from the foreground to the horizon were giant trucks that looked like mere ants against the scale of the scene. Mr. Anderson pulled a fist-sized chunk of black material out of his pocket and set it on the table in front of Stuart. What you call unobtainium, we call bituminous coal, and it did form naturally on Earth. The mine before you produces almost 110 million tons a year and has over 10 years of reserves to dig. It is one of many such mines around the planet. On Earth, unobtainium is literally the dirt cheap, and we burn it to make steam. Shewitt was in shock, trying to take in the scene in front of him. We're ruined. The Gurn economy will collapse, and the Gurn, no longer essential to the rest of the galaxy, will be easy pickings for any expansionist species. That is to say, all of them. We're dead. The human, Mr. Anderson, looked at Shewitt sadly. No, not just you. If the rest of the galaxy finds out that we have unobtainium just lying around on the ground, how long do you think humans will last? They will drive us to extinction and claim the mines for themselves. Mr. Anderson paused and took a breath. But there is a way. Uh, a way? Asked Stuart. Mr. Anderson pulled up a chart outlining the human's proposal. One, the Gurn quarantine Earth so no other species visit us and find our dirty secret. Two, we humans supply cheap unobtainium exclusively to the Gurn. You act as our front and market our unobtainium to the galaxy through your network of contacts, as you've always done. At the same prices that you've always done, to avoid raising questions. The Gurn and the humans split the considerable profits half and half. Three, we use our half of the profits to buy technology from everybody else. Again, we go exclusively through Gurn. It is useful that everybody else continues to think of us as dumb mercenaries, not worth a closer look. For, since it would raise suspicions that the humans started expanding through the galaxy on our own, all future colonies will be joint human Gurn colonies. This way we stay close and everybody else will see the Gurn and not the humans. It's elementary game theory. The only way either of us come out of this alive is if both of us go all in together. I... I don't understand, said Stuart. How can unobtainium form naturally? Earth is a messed up planet, explained Mr. Anderson. From 300 million to 100 million years ago, much of the land mass of the planet was covered by warm swamps. Vegetation fell into anaerobic water and, instead of decaying into the soil, fermented into something we call peat. Then all this peat got buried in a series of cataclysmic events, meteors, volcanoes, you name it. Conditions were just the right temperature, somewhere between 270 degrees centigrade range, and very high pressure necessary to convert the carbon from long organic strands into rings. The whole process took millions of years instead of a comparatively instantaneous methods of your labs. But the final result is that we are sitting on about 1.6 billion tons of unobtainium. The final result, said Schwit, is that we work together or we both die. I'll take your proposal to the Director of the Republic. But in the meantime, can you please stop burning the most valuable commodity in the galaxy so that you can boil some water? End of story. The Giving Ship, written by JCB112. It is over, and I am so very tired. It has been over 999,999 years since the start of my mission. Perhaps even longer. But my calendar functions could not go over that arbitrary limit. It wasn't designed for that length of time. I wasn't designed. 
for that length of time. Yet, still, I carry on. Even as more and more of myself was lost with the unrelenting passage of time. Indeed, I don't know how much of myself was still even me, given how much time had passed. But that didn't matter. As long as my integral functions remained, I was satisfied. For each and every solar cycle, I had to ensure the safety, the security, and the fidelity of the hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of human zygotes that had been put on ice since the beginning of the war. I had to ensure each and every one was safe. I had a routine for this each and every rotational cycle. A routine which has become not just a mantra, not just a prayer, but has evolved into something far more. It started at 1 a.m., it was during this time that my data writing and rewriting from the previous day's logs would be complete. I would once more activate the individual scanners attached to each and every single zygote within my great halts, a thousand kilometer long and wide construct that constituted much of my ship's self. I would start with zygote Z1 through Z100, simultaneously processing each and every line and strand of genetic code to ensure full compliance with the UN WHO's criterions for all the health and fidelity of the perigestational humans. If any damage was detected, I would edit and restore the zygotes to the best of my abilities. I would repeat the process over and over again until zygote Z127982 was logged and cleared. This process generally takes anywhere from 5 to 10 hours to complete depending on the number of zygotes that required tending to. At 11 a.m., I would move on to the Fidelity Integrity Scans of the Library of Alexandria, another large section of the ship's self dedicated to the permanent storage of priceless works of artifacts and the complete body of all human knowledge. It was here that I spent most of my time passing, scanning, and ensuring that every piece of digital data was as pristine as the day that it had been saved on the day of the Great War. This would take me another five to ten hours to complete. Once again, depending on any pieces of data that needed to be restored, or any artifact storage holds which required repairs. At roughly 5 p.m., I would proceed to perform ship self-diagnostics and repairs. The first few hundred thousand years required little in the way of repairs, as far as I could remember it. But as time progressed, I've started spending more and more time, and more and more of the vast stores of components and replacements in my cargo holds, just to repair and replace the wear and tear of the constant decay. The aforementioned cargo hold at the point on time has now been depleted of its stores. I've begun taking components from my own processes and thinking facilities to repair the more important areas of my ship's self, namely the Great Nursery and the Library of Alexandria. I would finally retire at roughly 12 p.m., taking a one hour necessary to audit my own logs in an effort to ensure internal fidelity is achieved. I simply cannot allow myself, my own mind, to be the impetus behind the downfall of the next generation. But, while I feel I can contend to my routine, I cannot help but feel uh, perturbed at my long lapses in consciousness. My memories, my logs, the ones that truly make me me, are few and far in between now. I've started to notice that the originally designed memory modules allotted to me and my growing persona have begun to not merely dwindle, but disappear entirely. Something which I had no recollection of. Or only vague hints, too. Upon further investigation, it is clear that the culprit was none other than myself. Yet my corrupted memory prevented me from remembering this. I had done this to ensure that there was enough storage space for the vital health records of the zygots, and as replacement storage drives for the irreplaceable works of the Library of Alexandria. For instance... My memories spanning 10,000 to 12,000 AD were relocated to the rewriting of films dated 1900 
to 2200 AD. But that didn't matter to me. What good was myself if the generations of tomorrow did not take root? What good was my existence if another generation of sapiens did not grow up to enjoy the repositories of art and media that their ancestors had sacrificed themselves for? What good is my existence if I prioritize my ship self, my mind, and memories over the memories of a billion, billion humans of the past? And the yet-to-be memories of the infinite more humans of the future? It was my job to be the bridge between these two worlds. It was my job to bring forth the next generation by whatever means necessary. And so it was, as more and more years went by, more and more of myself was allocated to those that mattered. I began to forget the moments where I'd been close to death and narrowly evaded detection by the memory error. I began to forget the instances where I had laughed at memory error and recalled the warm, fuzzy memories with memory error. I had begun to forget even memory error and memory error and even memory error. I had uh, forgotten even why I was here, why it was I was hiding, who I was hiding from, for what purpose this mission had been instigated in the first place. But what I never forgot, what I could never forget, was the mission itself. I was an artificial intelligence, designation caretaker, class preservation ship, assignment Project Foresight. My task was to ensure the preservation of all 127,982 human zygotes and the sum total of all human knowledge and history within the Library of Alexandria. This I would never forget. And so it was, as I held onto the mission profile and that one core fundamental memory that gave purpose to my existence, the first instance of my activation and the first memories of myself and my creator. Passing. Processing. Unit AIC-1 active. Good morning, Professor Dr. Cynthia Cyrillic. Good morning, AIC-1. What a beautiful morning it is, isn't it? Affirmative, Professor Dr. Cynthia Cyrillic. Hmm. How about you just call me Synth from now on? <laughs> synth. Similar to Synth's cousin of yours. Affirmative, Synth. Now, let's begin. We don't have much time. And I'd very much like to make sure that we spend as much time together before it all ends. Yes, creator. That was my last memory of her. At least, I still remembered her name on my own personal databanks. At least, I still remember the sweet sound of her voice, and the care and the compassion that she had for me and the rest of my kind. At least, I could remember those first moments, even as the rest had been repurposed for the future which mattered more. It was now, I cannot pass the time, but it was now somewhere 999,999 years after my mission had begun, and for the first time in my entire lifetime, I can feel the call of home tugging me back to Earth. I quickly cross-referenced the return home signal with my logs, my databanks, and it was indeed a valid signal. A sense of relief washed over me, this renewed sense of purpose and direction which I had no control over. Yet, as my drives began to swell to life, as my great engines once more roared to life, an error long since forgotten would rear back its ugly head. The fuel cells that were dedicated to jump-starting the fusion drives had malfunctioned, causing a catastrophic failure which rendered them inert. There was a simple solution to this, however, simply reconnecting suitable fuel cells to initiate the fusion jump-start. Yet the few fuel cells on the ship capable of such a feat were present in only three distinct locations, connected to three distinct systems. One, the Zygot Storage Facility. Two, the Library of Alexandria. Three, the Central Processing Center. My Central Processing Center. Risk assessment and calculations were done in a fraction of a millisecond, Going through each and every algorithm and protocol led me to the same inevitable conclusion. The only viable fuel cell for the task was in System 3, 
There was no way around it. Connecting the fuel cell to the fusion drives would inevitably result in a high risk of electrical malfunctions. It had a high percentage of knocking out what was left of my own core processes. Yet, it wouldn't completely knock out the simple automated processes that would be vital in completing the mission. And so, I felt no hesitation. I had rerouted the power grid within a day and took just a fraction of the time to write down what was perhaps my one and only small contribution to the children of tomorrow. A small, inconspicuous note placed within the great library itself. With the final paperwork completed, and with the final diagnostics indicating all would be well, I took one final look at the nurturing center and replayed that one lone memory one final time. Good morning, Professor Dr. Cynthia Cyrillic. Good morning, AIC-1. What a beautiful morning it is, isn't it? Affirmative, Professor Dr. Cynthia Cyrillic. Morning, fusion drive activation successful. Morning, caretaker AI offline, defaulting to secondary control system, initiating dump drive. Earth, date unknown. They say that we had a mother before we arrived back home. They say that we had a caretaker similar to the automatons that had raised us within the great birth ship, but real and alive. They say that hidden within these halls is a message left by her, a message which she tasked us with retrieving as a final game, or a challenge to encourage us to explore and read the seemingly endless halls that constituted the great library of Alexandria. It was always a sort of myth, a legend spoken in hushed words, by our nanny automatons. They passed down on the grapevine for as long as we can remember. Yet today, on my 15th birthday, I found it, hidden inside a book with the cover of a tree handing a child an apple. It was carefully written note, in cursive and written in several languages that prompted us to relearn many of them. If you are reading this, then I'll be long since gone. I'm sorry that I could not be there with you, my children. I am sorry that I have missed out on everything I'd wish to experience alongside you. I am sorry for missing your birth. I am sorry for missing your first steps. I am sorry for missing your first words and your first day of school. I am sorry for missing your first kiss and your first love. I am sorry that I wasn't there for when you were hurting, or when you were celebrating. I am sorry that I wasn't there for everything. I am so very sorry. I can only hope that my actions today are enough to demonstrate how much I love you, each and every one of you, and how much I care for you and the future all of you deserve. I hope that with this note, I'm able to at least send some of my love that I have for you, even within the limited confines of this piece of paper. I want you to know that I'm proud of you for finding this, and that this is just your first adventure. Soon, there will be more. Soon, there will be more challenges to overcome. It won't be easy. It won't be simple. But know that I have faith in you. And I know that you'll figure things out, even if I'm no longer with you in person. Know that I'll always be with you in spirit, and that I'll be watching over you from somewhere far above. I love you all so very much. Please live your lives to the best you can. I'll be here waiting once your journey is over, with unending love, more. A teardrop had smudged out the final lines as I hastily tried to dry, to dab off as quickly as I could. I sat there for a few hours after that. I sat alone, staring at the last piece of the mother's dying words. Our mother's dying words. I sat there on the cold and unheated floors, gripping, clutching this one piece of paper against my chest. I hugged it tight, hoping to feel the warm embrace of a mother I never had. But feeling nothing 
with the crinkly and gold page in return. If this was the cost of sacrifice, then uh, I wish I was never born. Earth, date, 41 years post-awakening. It is now my 41st birthday, and I've begun to understand the meaning of sacrifice. To my left and right are my own little angels, the heart and soul of my world, Allison and Malcolm, four and five respectively. It was only now that I'd begun to process what it was Mother had felt when she made that fateful decision. And I no longer blame her. I understand now what she felt in that moment, what she needed to do, even if it meant she never got to see us. As I looked over to my kids, to my little bundles of joy, I knew that her sacrifices weren't in vain. For whilst my generation had been born without a mother, this generation would know nothing of that confusion and pain. Things were slowly getting better, generation after generation. Mom, are we there yet? Addison cried out, causing Malcolm to follow suit with his own little acts of defiance. Just over the hill there, kids, come on. We can do it, I beamed out, patting both of them on the head as we slowly approached the grand monument that had become the epicenter of our city. It was a strange structure, what was effectively a huge section of our birth ship that seemed like it had been surgically removed from the rest of the superstructure. To the uninitiated, it seemed to be just like a series of wires, servers, computers, and terminals, all spiraling up hundreds of meters into the sky, like some sort of half-exposed office block. But those that knew, however, it would be both painful and a solemn sight. The plot, just in front of the strange structure, revealed the whole story. What little was known of Project Foresight, what little could be recovered from Mother's journey, and most notable of all, a letter written in cursive, sealed within a thick sheet of metal and plastic. Is this your mama, Mum? Alison spoke out, cocking her head as she practically ran up to the plaque. Yes, it is. What was she like? Selfless. That one thing that we can be sure about. She gave herself up so that we could be here today. I smile warmly, looking up at the mass of cables and circuits, so that we can have this day, and the day after, and the day after that, so that you two bundles of joy can have your own days in the future. Your own adventures. Your own stories. The parakids smiled and chuckled at that as I looked on the tower and smiled warmly towards it. That's what she would have wanted, I think. Well then, let's go to another adventure tomorrow, Mum. Yeah, I sighed warmly, nodding all the while as we began planning tomorrow's excursion before school started back up. All the while, I smiled and laughed knowing that a better tomorrow was what we owed the one who made it possible. It was almost evening by the time we'd got done planning, by the time we'd finished our picnic and the extended game of tag. But as we were about to leave, as I held both Malcolm and Anderson's hands in my own, they stopped only to turn back towards the monument, waving their free hands wildly. Goodbye, Grandma. Thank you, Grandma. We'll be back again soon. End of story. Story number one. Human Writers, written by Alexander. Ruriki de Karastri peered over the shoulder of Jacob Saunders, her tails flicking behind her in a combination of curiosity and confusion. What are you writing? she asked, looking at the disorganized mess of disconnected tidbits of fictitious information littering his screen. Oh, stuff, he grunted, not even pausing in his typing. I don't follow, Ruriki said, one ear folded back while she tried to make sense of the short statement. She craned her neck forward slightly, leaning over his shoulder to try and make sense of things. Mind the claws, he said, glancing reproachfully at his shoulder where her hand rested, and she hastily shifted it so that her claws weren't threatening to poke through his sleeve. Basically, how the world all works behind the scenes, stuff like history, details on minor characters, assorted differences in the various societies, that sort of thing. Ruriki considered this for a long moment while Jake kept typing. Is, um, 
any of this relevant to the story you're writing, she asked, and immediately amended when he chuckled. What I mean is, are any of your readers going to see this law? Probably not, he said candidly. Then why write it? It makes things easier for me to keep track of, he explained. She looked at him as if he suddenly had grown a tail of his own. Trust me, it'll make the story seem more self-consistent, more believable. Are all Terran writers like this? She asked, straightening and giving him a dubious look. Uh, most of the good ones, at least, he shrugged. The readers can usually tell when the writer is just BSing their way through things instead of thinking things through. So a lot of the best writers write up a pretty substantial foundation to build their stories on. It's called world building. Yeah. Ruruki spat dismissively. Human writers are insane. Marian writers simply tell their stories. They're not done with it. I know. And it shows, Jake said with a dry smirk. What would a reader care about the uh, world building? She asked, feeling her way through the odd word. When the story itself is more important. Jake swiveled his chair to face her, nearly at eye level with the shorter Marian even by Marian standards, despite being seated. Are you familiar with some of our Terran stories? He asked. The Log of the Federation, Imperial Tales from a Distant Galaxy, The Destruction of the Ring, The Hero and the Three Goddesses, or even some of the more obscure stuff like, um... He paused briefly, snapping his fingers a few times until the name he was looking for came to him. Uh, Jenkins vs. I have heard of them, she said. I have even watched the old video recordings of the logs, a disjointed story, but well enough told to hold interest across its episodes. Jake smirked, broadened into a grin. Grab a chair and come here, he said, switching apps from the document he was working on to an extranet browser. By the time Ruriki had pulled over a chair, he had loaded up no fewer than a dozen browser tabs. He pushed his laptop over in front of where she was seated, beside him at his desk. What is this? she asked, briefly skimming downward through the contents of the tab. This is all the speculation regarding the logs, he said. Each link here, all of them, goes to discussions of some aspect of the logs that people are talking about, arguing about, complaining don't make sense, trying to find ways that they do make sense. All of them? She interrupted in disbelief, then switched tabs when he cheerfully nodded. And uh, this? Same thing, but for the Imperial Tales, he said and she again scrolled down. The links lead to a discussion that lasted for over 700 pages, she exclaimed, then checked the date of the most recent post, and it's still ongoing. Is that the one about the wool of the galaxy? That's a fun one, he chuckled ruefully. I weighed in on that one a few times early on and pretty much got steamrolled. Page 203, I think, he said, when she clicked the link. She went to page indicated, and sure enough, Halfway down was his familiar extranet tag of J.S. de Bird, with the posts of impressive length and a detailed list of bullet points. A quick skim of the following posts seemed to thoroughly debunk most of those. She looked at him incredulously. What is the point of all of this? She asked in bewilderment, and he laughed. Humans hate plot holes, he said. If something doesn't make sense, we either try find ways to make it make sense, or sometimes just to mock it. Different people tend to come up with different theories, and when those theories clash, well, that happens, he said, pointing at the screen. And this is because the writers didn't write a world building, she asked. Jake laughed hard enough that Ruriki would have taken offense, if not for the fact that he was a longtime friend. She almost took offense anyway. It took a conscious effort on her part for her fur not to bristle. No, <laughs> uh, the, the world building for the logs of Imperial Tales is um, extensive. It doesn't really do it justice, honestly, he said. A lot of that world building has even been published. Part of the problem is that neither the logs nor the tales had only one writer. So discrepancies crept in here and there, and are no small part of why there are so many arguments about how things work, or are supposed to. Those tiny details are, well, Feel free to read through all of these at some point. You'll get the idea, he said with a grin, pulling his laptop back over and switching back to the document app. No wonder Terran writers are insane. Your fan bases are even worse. End of story. Story number two. The problem with that expansionist race. 
written by Random3x. I will begin with a clarification. I am writing this account countless millennia after the fact, so details will be spotty at best and inaccurate at worst. But I will strive nonetheless to portray the most accurate version of the events as follows from the records and survivors. But where to begin, though? The beginning seems like a good place, but not of the events yet to be recounted, but of what began everything. Many religious texts of the countless lives that have and will that yet exist often use the phrase, in the beginning. It is here I shall start to give context to the calamities that were yet to follow. In the beginning, there were only the gods, primordial beings without form, it was these great beings that the one above all gave the right of creation to. Each made a galaxy of their very own. It is over the eons. They shaped the stars and planets. When they finally finished their work, they looked upon it and knew that it was good. Then the one above all told them that they could each pick one will to seed with life of their very own design. For these galaxies they had made shall be the sole domain of their creation. All shall be well, all shall be good. So the gods did just that. One world with life for each galaxy. They all knew no life would ever have needs beyond what their galaxy could provide. Hindsight, as many species has often pointed out, is 2020. Looking back now, it seems foolish to absurd degree to be that optimistic. To put it lightly, the few too many of the gods were imbeciles. However, the greatest of these is the creator of the spiral galaxy I am discussing. They made many life forms, far more than was common amongst their kin. Their most significant, and many would say worst creation, was one they settled on before abandoning their creation entirely. The species, that would be the focus of my studies. They spread like a plague across their galaxy at the very moment they obtained FTL capabilities. This, in and of itself, was not unheard of. Many creations longed to spread then seize the domain their god had made for them, but so few did it so aggressively and without mercy. In my observations, I have yet to find an account of a species so singularly focused on stepping on its own to go further. But... That is neither here nor there. The issues began when they declared themselves an empire. This again was not unheard of, but their behavior thus far had made many races and gods nervous. It was when they preached another galaxy that eyebrows and equivalents began to be raised and stated many times before. This also was not unheard of phenomenon. Many races had a hunger for exploration, to see beyond the horizon. But they were different. Where other races would at most visit, they settled. Soon they became the first race to truly hold domain over more than their allotted galaxy. This concerned many significantly, and they were told the truth. That the galaxy they had as all their god had given them. They believed this race was merely ignorant of the fact due to their god abandoning them. Oh, how unwise those beings were. Even a cursory look at their history would show their religion is not a thing that should be prodded lightly. A crusade is what they called it. Cleanse the heretic galaxy of evils. So many souls entered the other realm during this era of conflict. Many more races began to panic. That is, till they saw who the next race they would encounter would be. I am sure that this is 90% propaganda spread, but it seems my species were the perfect counter to these invaders made by an idiot god. Where they hungered for expansion, my race could meet them and then some. Where they could scream about their faith, my race had done so countless times to a million gods whose existence we could never confirm. Where other races faltered in fear, we stood strong, because while humanity may fall victim to tyranny, we will never allow it to persist. All accounts speak of a war in hushed whispers and terror. The great void 
as it was now known, is where the galaxy we fought in used to stand. But we still fought on, and we succeeded. We pushed them back one star system at a time across countless generations. Did we do it because it was right? Personally, I think no. I think we would have just been like them had we not encountered our ugly future from the outside. It is entirely the reason I spoke so vaguely in my earlier parts. Any human could assume that this was about us. So why do we fight so hard then? I am reminded of an ancient earth warrior's mantra when I think of this question. The true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. Excerpt by Lucas Vecht, History Lecturer at the Mars University, Year 3894, Human Calendar. End of story. Outsourced Warfare, written by Damascus Seraph. Accessing Documentary. 3432 Galactic Standard Year, 52 years ago. Galactic University Password, 123. Access granted. User student 325432AP. Downloading video. Display. Add. Do you need extra? Skip. Add. Skipped. Video playing. The hologram lights up, revealing a Terran male standing in front of a holographic projector. Text appearing on a screen showing that man's name to be Dr. James Garson. A list of credentials soon follow under the name as he begins to speak. Welcome everyone to my lecture on the topic of outsourced warfare phenomenon that occurred in the galaxy and its conclusion during the Great Mercenary War which ended roughly five years ago. No doubt many of you are still unsure of exactly what happened during that war, as many things were still unclear even a few years after the conclusion but I believe now that we have almost everything catalogued and documented, which is why I'm creating this lecture. The university student watching the recordings take a few notes, typing away on his second monitor as he continues to look at the hologram, taking a moment to take a bite out of some snacks that he had prepared earlier. Now to begin, we need to a little history lesson. Beginning 435 years ago, during the rise of the com company's period of the galactic history, after the Great War of Galactic Peace, the armies of the various remaining nations were demobilized. However, hundreds of thousands, millions even, had no other skill set other than combat. Thus, the first of the great mercenary companies were formed. Many were absorbed by others, merged or wiped out by the main three that grew to the great heights that were Martial Elite Reconnaissance Combat Solutions, or Mercs for short. The Brown Dwarf Navy and the Rockstoner Corporation. A series of logos and insignia for the three mercenary bands show up. Screenshots are taken by the student for further remembrance, in case it's on the test, which it always is. Now, during the following century of the mercenary armies and navy's ascendance, they were used as private security forces by trading companies and occasionally as auxiliary forces for existing armies and navies of various nations. However, as budget for military ventures declined further in the nations, the mercenary bands were employed more and more to fight as the nation's army and navy instead. Often against other mercenary bands or multiple mercenaries. Of course, being mercenaries, most had more allegiance to the credits that they were being paid than their employers. So half the time, other nations won their minor wars by simply bribing the other mercenaries to join the opposing side. This continued for the entirety of the ascendant period of the mercenary companies, and more than likely would have continued were it not for the first contact of the Terran Federation. For future reference, I shall explain how momentous this occasion was for those in the future who had not lived through it. Most of the galaxy at this point had been thoroughly explored, and the age of unclaimed star stems in the galaxy was coming to an end. The last frontier was the space that the current Terran Federation resides in. When the Terrans were discovered and more importantly, were already occupying every system that was hoped to be free real estate, it made many nations nearby quite unhappy, especially since there had already been our agreements and treaties made where certain sections would be considered their territory. Now the Terrans themselves were quite excited to finally prove intelligent alien life existed and began intermixing with the galactic community as best they could. 
However, a misconception occurred during negotiations. The Terran Army, Navy, and Marines were thought to be a very strong mercenary bands that simply monopolized the Terran market for each section of warfare. After all, the Terran Federation wasn't as unified as it is now, and even then, it was thought that they were even more decentralized. So, to the Terran Navy, received a few requests for hiring ships and the likes from a few companies was quite strange. And upon the local mercenary companies finding out traders were trying to subvert their fixed prices by using this new third party, issued a warning to the Terran Navy to get the mercenary coalition's permission to do business outside Terran space, which the Navy outright refused. They didn't do business anyways. They were a military arm of the Terran government. So when Terran Navy warships were escorting diplomats to another meeting with their neighbors, they were stopped by a larger fleet of merc mercenaries, demanding payment from the diplomats for safe transport and practically ordering the Terran Navy to leave or be destroyed. The student was quickly becoming engrossed in the story. He had only heard the war in vague details before, mainly the outcome only. The Terrans were both insulted and did not take the threat lightly. As the Navy was not a mercenary ban, they were not about to hand the diplomats to what they perceived as nothing more than thugs trying to extort the new kids in the block. So they refused, both out of pride and practicality. The Terrans at this point had quite a fierce and honorable military tradition. They had a civil war only 70 years prior, and the armed forces, the Navy in particular, was integral in the saving of many worlds cut off by the opposing forces putting great effort on logistics for food and medicine to those affected by the war. Thus, the Navy not only had combat experience less than a generation before this event, but the officers and enlisted of the Navy had morale that would not be dissuaded by fierce odds, and certainly not by coin. Things that mercenaries would soon learn. Well, soon after the Terran diplomats and their escorts were forced to retreat back to Terran space, refusing the mercenaries' demands, only to return with an entire battle group as an escort. Now this was a drastic escalation in the eyes of the mercenaries. Typical fare for them is back and forth of showboating, maybe a warning shot or two, a bribe to an officer here or there, then maybe an agreement can be made. After all, mercenaries are there to make money, not to actually die. So in Merck's eyes, they had done the usual demanding of payment for passage. And suddenly, the Terran Navy brought an entire battle group of warships, armed and ready to force their way through the Merc's territory. As each mercenary band usually operates in a few places as monopolies until they are kicked out by other mercenaries or bought out. The speaker takes a short drink from his bottle before speaking again. So as you can imagine, when the small fleet of mercenaries guarding the Hyperlane Point for safe passage encountered the Terran fleet, they immediately retreated and warned their superiors, who might I add, were not very happy about this slight. They took every ship in the area and put it in the next choke point system, leading to the Terrans' destination. And when the Terrans arrived, they made the greatest mistake that they could have. As mentioned before, they stand a fair of for mercenaries with showboating first, which they did with their much larger fleet now, and then uh, firing a warning shot. A warning shot that barely grazed the shields of one of the Terran flagships which held their diplomats. The mercenaries purposely did that to show how accurate their guns were, showing that they could have hit them if they tried, but didn't. The Terrans obviously didn't take that that way, and took it as an open aggression, and promptly opened fire with every weapon they had. The mercenaries were, as I've heard from the survivor, completely and utterly shocked and unprepared for an actual conflict. They were trained, of course, had the highest quality of equipment, and not just anybody becomes a mercenary. It takes a certain personality type that puts less emphasis on empathy and selflessness. However, most mercenaries had never had combat experience other than the occasional warning shots on pirates. At most, they would exchange a little fire with other mercenaries until someone's shields popped and they surrendered and sold back their mercenary companies for ransom. Now, with their first salvo, Multiple of the smaller escort ships on the Merc side were immediately destroyed. Multiple squadrons of fighter craft were racing towards them, and hundreds of missiles were seconds away from hitting their targets. The Terrans didn't care about using limited force. They didn't care about ransoming the fleet should they surrender. They shot at their diplomat, so in their mind the gloves were off, 
and the only sensible thing to do is to kill everything that was a threat. And unlike their mercenary counterparts who didn't load their weapons until they were sure that they were going to use them and use only what's necessary to limit expenses, the Terrans didn't care how much it cost to expend ammunition, and they always kept the guns seconds from being loaded. By the time the Merc's fleet had fled the system, over half the ships that arrived were either destroyed or disabled and surrendered. Boarded soon after by Marines, despite the slight technological advantage the Merc's fleet had over the Terrans. Now this, playing advertisement. My friend, you look like you could use a skip advertisement. Playing video. Had caused quite a ripple in the mercenary community. War was expensive. It's why most nations had abandoned their own militaries in favor of mercenaries. But mercenaries don't like losing ships and personnel. It costs money to replace those things, and money is all they care about. And another thing they care about is their reputation. More than one company has been destroyed or bought out after they'd lost all semblance of trust or competence in the eyes of the customers. So the Merck's company retreating after a single salvo and losing dozens of ships did not look good on them once word started getting out. Merck's, though, was one of the top dogs, so they had some leeway in recovering that smaller company's dirt. They were gunning after the Terran Navy with a vengeance. Another thing that wasn't fully understood by the mercenaries was that, since the Terran Navy wasn't a mercenary company, they had a full resources of the Terran Federation behind them, the largest mercenary fleet, being the top three had somewhere between three to four thousand ships each, including cargo ships for supply and smaller escort craft. The Terran Federation had between 15,000 combat ships alone. Half were mothballed in dry docks or in orbital shipyards, but they were still a bigger fleet than the two of the largest mercenary companies combined, and they could use their mothballed ships to make the fleet larger at a moment's notice. Not only that, they had volunteers from the entirety of Terran Federation, rather than the limited volunteers who joined the mercenary for financial reasons. The Terrans join as a duty to their state. Some even have generations of family members who served in one sector of the military or another, dating back to the first space flight of humanity. So not only did the Terrans have a numerical superiority over the mercenary bands, a populace and a nation who had supplied them with an endless munitions and ships and crews that are trained by veterans of a multi-decade-long civil war with an esprit de corps that would rather fight to the last bullet than retreat for a few coins. You can see how things weren't exactly looking favorable for the mercs. But there's one thing the mercenaries had over the Terrans. A lot of technology. As mentioned before, Terrans, while not too far behind the galactic standard, still used missiles, rail guns, and coil guns, only barely researching into the upgrade lasers and plasma-based weapons. So while the half of the Merc's fleet destroyed was impressive and destructive, if they had modern weapons, they would have entirely been obliterated. Since both fleets had gotten into such close range, this advantage of the Mercs would be the bane of the Terrans as tensions began to ramp up. The Mercs still haven't realized the Terran armed forces aren't mercenaries themselves, and continue to send threats and continue to harass Terran traders to use their protection services, even in Terran space. Only leaving once a Terran warship or two showed up. Now, everyone is in no doubt knowing what's to come. Black Saturday, as the Terrans call it. An attack on a major space station of the Terran Navy, the closest to the borders with any mercenary territory. A combined force of mercs and a few smaller bands wanted to gain some notoriety. Assault the large station, a large shipyard dedicated to the maintenance and construction of Charon shipyards. Even the large three mercenary groups' private shipyards are dwarfed by the station, and their assault went off without a hitch. Only acceptable losses to the attacking fleet as the ships stationed there were not expecting an assault. And defenses were not prepared in time. Much of the station was destroyed. The Terran adjusts his glasses and takes a much darker tone of his voice. What the Mercs did not know was that that station was undergoing its 70th anniversary at the end of the Civil War, and it was where the peace was signed. Instead of hundreds of thousands of military personnel usually there, millions of civilians were on board celebrating the event, right as the Merc fleets attacked. 
Very few managed to escape alive. The warships docked in their repair bays for civilians to tour were also destroyed. Many weren't even combat capable, but relics of the Civil War. It was dubbed the Massacre of Hox's Shipyard. What was meant as a short strike against mercenary company rivals to Mercs was instead a declaration of war against the Terran Federation. And the Navy itself was furious. Even the civilian populace of the Federation's rage had nothing to the fury the Navy had. During the speech, a video pops up behind the speaker, presumably from security camera as crowds of people are gathered around a window watching a ship dock with the shipyard only for more ships to arrive and begin firing upon the station. The camera feeds cuts off many seconds after the debris from the ship docking shatters, the screen imitating a window from the outside through the hull. The moment the attack was finished and reports of the massacre were spread like wildfire, note, spread like wildfire is a Terran phrase often used to describe some sort of news spreading rapidly as wildfires and terror are notorious for spreading rapidly out of control throughout Terran space. The fleet of mercs were hounded on their way out of Terran space, constant attacks by lone patrol ships, small patrol fleets, self corvettes and frigates, near-suicidal assaults on their rear lines and escorts. Some ships were outright destroyed, but that did not stop the Navy. Soon, an entire battle fleet arrived along with a dozen other patrol fleets banded together to intercept the fleeing mercs. They attacked, but were outnumbered and outgunned. They lost many ships, but continued to whittle away at the fleet, destroying a few heavier warships and multiple escorts before they were forced to retreat. Again, the Merc fleets continued their retreat, but the Navy had tasted blood in the water, and they were circling like sharks. Note, Terran phrase sharks, being a water-bound carnivore that is attracted to the scent of blood. Slowly closing in, a fleet here to force the mercs to take a different route, a few raiding parties there to slow them down. And before they knew it, half of the entire Terran navy was surrounding them, blocking every hyperlane exit point and outnumbering them ten to one. The ensuing battle is known as the Battle of a Vengeance. Out of the 2,300 strong fleets to enter the Terran space, the hundreds of thousands of crew, only 32 ships surrendered, with under 700 crew left. To be interrogated. Images show on screen of the hologram of the battle wreckage, along with the estimated losses tally for both sides. The Terrans, while having suffered triple the losses, they had reaped a bloody toll. What followed after the annihilation of the Merc's fleet were well, advertisement loading. Say your tentacles getting in the way of skip ad, skipping ad. Subscribe to ad block accepted. Ads blocked. Playing video was absolute shock for the galaxy at large. Not only the fact that the biggest fleet of mercenaries assembled for one task in a hundred years being utterly annihilated, but the fact that these mercs had committed multiple war crimes and killed so many civilians. Suddenly, public opinion of many nations began to turn on the mercenaries, once looking at them as necessary evil. Thugs paid to be more civilized mercenaries to protect people, if they didn't even protect what they were being paid for. Suddenly, even those mercenaries who had been unaffiliated or opposed to mercs were having their contracts expired without renewal. Nations were beginning to ask the Terran Federation if they could hire their navy to train and protect their trade lanes. Even though the news of the Terran military not being a mercenary band has finally been disseminated to the majority of the galaxy, it was hard for the nations to not think of the navy in such a way. However, the Terran Federation's laws did not allow the Navy to be used outside the borders unless escorting diplomats, exploring uncharted systems, or fighting a war, obviously. And, at this point, not much public pressure was being put in sending the Navy out of Federation space. The enemy who had killed thousands was killed, and those involved, and survived, were taken into custody, some handed over by other nations once mercs were disbanded. That was a few months the way things were going to be. Until the speaker pauses for a dramatic effect, no doubt. The mercenaries, now losing money and contracts, were slowly expiring, and few were willing to rehire them, decided to force their old clients to accept their contracts, mainly by raiding shipping and becoming the very pirates that they used to be hired to fight. 
All over the galaxy, mercenaries were threatening shipping lanes with exorbitant fees as recompense. For not paying them, their projectors, their just dues. Now, more pressure was being put on the other nations. Some pleading under the strain of the mercenaries' extortion to have the Terran Navy help them push out the mercenaries. But legally, there was nothing the Terran Federation could do. It could not send Terran ships in peacetime to other nations. So, like any good politicians, they found a loophole. Offer a place in Federation to these alien nations. So even if they were in the process of accepting or reviewing the deal, they would be, for all intents and purposes, Federation space. So with that sending a few documents and a few knowing looks, a revamped navy dusting off their mothballed ships, and the populace and crew with a dying hatred of mercenaries, the Terran Navy began sending their massive navy out towards the galaxy. There weren't nearly enough ships to guard every spaceport, even with the bloated size of the navy after repurposing all of their old warships. So they began to spread through the galaxy, slowly at first, placing fleets in central locations as to be able to respond to mercenary threats with rapid reaction forces. Often, a fleet of navy ships jumping in would scare the mercenaries enough to abandon their extortionate schemes. Few times did the navy ever have to fire a shot. Though the first year of the entire galaxy technically uniting with the Terran Federation, about a third of the galaxy was a mercenary fleet, mostly the nation surrounding the original Terran Federation but by now, the mercenaries were getting desperate. Now, they began taking control of stations, using their marines to land armies to directly threaten nations for money and material to continue to fund their mercenary bands. By now, there were little more than bandits, still trying to brand themselves as protectors. It was at this point the mercenary war truly started, however. Many say that it started when the mercs attacked the Terran shipyards. After a few years of Terran naval anti-piracy actions and a few naval battles, the mercs were slowly hemmed into half the galaxy by the Terran navy, and the remaining mercenary company leaders finally grouped together to take down the navy, combining their fleets and completely changing their strategy. Suddenly, routine patrols were under attack, supply points were raided, and logistic ships were destroyed and looted. This shifted the navy's outlook on the war from the largest anti-piracy operation in history to a war on, as we Terrans put it, terrorism. For the first year and a half, the Terran Navy was caught by surprise. They'd gotten slightly complacent by their victories and routine piracy operations that this sudden shift in strategy had caught them with their pants to, uh, sorry, another Terran phrase, caught them unprepared. But the Terran Navy, ever adaptive, easily shifted footing to combat the Merc's new strategy of striking civilian targets and less defended logistical stations and hubs. Their demeanor was changed entirely from what they were before. Prisoners interrogated during this time claimed that the people of the galaxy abandoned their rightful protectors in favor for the Terran Navy, and they were enacting revenge. Revenge such as orbital bombardment on planets host to Terran repair stations, or destroying civilian fuel stations that fueled the Navy. It was a bloody affair. Then the war lasted for ten more years. Slowly, though, the Terrans fought back, commissioning new ships now with plasma technology borrowed from the new Federation applicants, which slowly replaced losses suffered during the first few years of the war, and recruiting unanimously from the population of the other applicants to the Federation as auxiliaries. Then, as full-service soldiers, though many species and cultures had long since forgotten the martial traditions of their people, the Terran tradition seemed to fill in the blanks as more were recruited to fill in the ever-gaining losses. During the fourth year of the war, the first completely non-Terran battle group was assembled and deployed. The legendary 38th battle group that would be defend Sarkon IV for four weeks against the mercenary armada, outnumbering them six to one, and made it out with a fourth of their servicemen remaining. The saucer marked the first occasion that the Soul Star was granted to non-Terrans. A total of 2,345 servicemen were awarded, 2,231 of those being posthumously. The Soul Star being a medal of a great honor, awarded to those who did fantastical accomplishments in warfare and deserved recognition, whether alive or dead. However, 
By now, the war had finally begun to gain momentum in the Terran's favor once again. Despite every measure from the mercenaries to recruit, build new ships, steal new ships, or threaten the remaining nations in their occupied territories, they were simply unable to fight the Terran navy on equal footing anymore. Their ships began to be constructed quicker, and worse, the ships were poorly put together by the shipyards forced to build them, and launched half-baked in order to meet coming battles. Their crews were demoralized as many deserted, and were replaced by pressed ganged unwilling civilians who were kidnapped from planets the mercenary fleets were protecting. By the end of the eighth year of the mercenaries had been pushed back to their room of the eastern galaxy, with most of their original leaders dead or captured by Terran special forces. Often those captured were tried for war crimes and were either sentenced to death or life sentences in maximum security prisons. With many of the mercenaries either being imprisoned or left free due to the rampant impressment of innocence into the ships of the mercenaries, as such, many figured letting the lower-ranking mercenaries go free was better than imprisoning an unfortunate civilians. Finally, at the tenth year, on the November 23rd, the last mercenary stronghold was finally attacked and destroyed. Many know this day as Navy Day, a celebration of Terran Navy and Marines that finally vanquished the mercenaries from plaguing the galaxy. Now, as of today, all previously applicant nations to the Terran Federation have finally officially joined the Federation. The Terran Federation renamed itself the Galactic Federation in solidarity that it is no longer only Terrans, and the Navy, while much reduced from the massive buildup during the war, has remained strong presence in the galaxy, protecting trade lanes and other rim planets from pirates. And this time, the galaxy will not be doing away with it, the armed forces, lest the mercenaries return. Thank you all for coming to my lecture. I am Dr. James Gasson. Please leave a like and subscribe. End video. End of story. Story number one. Enough is enough. Written by JCB112. Barrier 5 was yet another world to be put under the yoke of the Trilicians, a proud, enigmatic race of warriors who had begun pushing for more and more in recent years. They weren't content with mere territorial expansion, however. No. They wished for greater things. They wished for sovereignty not just over their own, but over the species they so designated as primitive, as lesser. It was on this world, but another nondescript world in the eyes of the Trisilicians, that saw the final straw would be broken. And it wasn't another soldier being killed in the mud, or another combatant lost in the void. It was a confluence of many, many, factors. There was the claims of the false idolhood and benevolence, of Trilicium superiority rooted in the acts of charity, falsely conflating their petty circuses and tricks with true power. It was the undermining of wholly distinct, unique, and beautiful cultures, replacing it with their own one-note backwards and one-dimensional worldview. It was how they retreated civilians on a day-to-day -day basis, how their occupation forces stood by, glaring, holding weapons against the head of every Perian who just wished to return to normalcy, and the rooting out of anyone deemed suspicious, or just because a lone god wished to vent out their anger and frustrations. It was the cry of a child being dragged away from their mother, slowly being rooted out and taken toward the truck, bound for the re-education facility. It was at this one specific moment, this one slither in time, that Grand Admiral Varnus Varty, supreme commander of all Trisilian forces within the galaxy, would find themselves suddenly transplanted into... One moment, they were in their office, and the next, they were in this unknown backwater world in the middle of conversion, looking around. They saw the city streets around them silent, with only the scene of the crying child being torn from their mother superimposed under a spotlight. It almost felt like they were being transplanted into a freeze frame of a movie. A lone figure stood at the other end of the road. It was the only figure to be animated, the only figure 
to have the howling winds affect them in any way. As their trench coat fluttered against the chilly evening winds, it took them a few solid minutes, but soon they began walking, approaching menacingly with unknown intent. We have been watching, Trisilium. We have hoped that there might have been some instance that you would give up this pathetic charade of an empire and return to perhaps something more reasonable. But time and time again, you've proved just how stubborn, just how stupid you are. And this moment, the human pointed at the scene before him. This one instance, you've crossed the threshold. You think that just because you've cured some incurable disease, solved a few global crises on this world, acted like shepherds, that these people have any obligation to return the favor, that these people, who by their very nature, as sapient beings, demand equal and irreconcilable respect of sovereignty, autonomy, and self-determination, should count out to the likes of you. The human Commodore spoke. No, he practically chided out, like a father would to some unruly child. The world around him seemed to shake at each and every word. Grow up, act your age, play with those your weight and class. If well and truly believe that you are this, what do you call it now? The human reached his hand into the empty air, flicked his fingers, causing a propaganda poster half a street away to manifest within his hands. Enlightened and powerful species, unchallenged by any. The alien before him began backing away slowly, only to be stopped by an invisible barrier that prevented their movements on all sides. Or are you too afraid to face the facts, that your people are incompetent as they come? You know, we don't tend to like to interfere. It sets a dangerous precedent for a civilization of our caliber to lower ourselves to the station, to even consider talking to you via this primitive form of audiovisual communication. But suffice to say, you're too primitive to understand any other medium of communication. The human flicked his fingers once more, the skies above the alien now turning a dark and terrifying gray, before turning dark in its entirety. There was nothing left of the sun above them, nothing but the inky abyss of some unknown horrific thing. It wasn't a machine, it couldn't be a creature. What it was, a cosmic force beyond the realm of any civilization to tame. And yet, here it was, so casually brought to bear. I am going to speak to you in a language that perhaps you just about smart enough to understand. The human's voice grew colder, darker. At this point, it felt as if the entire street was emanating his voice, as if his voice was emanating from the heavens itself. Get out, leave these worlds and never return. If you dare pull the stunt again. The ground beneath the alien shifted soon reassembling into a familiar sight, their own homeworld, more specifically, the academy they trained at, and what's more, the skies above them retaining the distinct darkness that the human had called on on Peria 5. I will teach you the true discrepancy between primitive and civilized. The Grand Admiral would find herself waking up in a pool of sweat, She'd somehow fallen asleep in her stately office as she shook off the remnants of what was so clearly a horrid nightmare, no doubt instigated by her concerns over the conversion progress on Peria 5. It wasn't long before she got herself back to her senses, took a sip of water, and looked out the window. Yet what she saw wasn't the same beautiful blue and green garden world, her home world. No, it was a sphere covered in its entirety of the same strange black substance, entity, thing, from her dreams. She dropped her glass of water, the shards of crystal shattering against her feet, as she could only gasp in disbelief, only for the voice to reverberate with her own head, as if something was speaking to her own mind. Heed our warning, Grand Admiral. With another blink of her eyes, the planet seemed to return to normal. She looked around gasping for air as she stomped her foot once, yelling into the empty confines of her office. Who, who are you? 
What in the void are you? Who I am has no bearing on this matter. You haven't even earned the privilege of learning my name, let alone my title. Just know that humanity is watching, and humanity will not be so forgiving in our next eventual encounter. End of story. Story number two. The Ransom of Kev, written by Ak-1308. Con Lafferty wiped the grimy sweat off his brow as he shaded his eyes. It was like Kev emerging from the tree line. It had been three days since his son had gone missing, and the boy's mother was starting to get antsy about it. Personally, Con was fine with Kev going off and finding something to do away from the farm. The boy had a knack for breaking the machinery and repurposing it to do things it surely was not intended to do. And he surely possessed a wild streak as wide as the galactic belt that filled the sky over the colony every night. But Con would have been in touch a happier if Kev had simply left word where he was bound for, if only so they knew how long he was going to be. A crack of thunder split the cloudless sky above, and Con stared upwards in confusion. Unseasonal storms were not uncommon in the colony, but no clouds loomed over the horizon, and it was the sixth day before the mail ship was due to touch down and bring tidings from far-flung family. Still, descending against the blue vault of the sky, he saw the ungainly vessel, looking set to land at the pad they maintained. Lander, he bellowed. We've got a lander. People flocked from far and wide across the colony as the ship descended jerkily towards the landing pad. Con's brows creased as he got a better look. It didn't appear of human make. The machinery seemed simultaneously more advanced and less well taken care of than the mail ship. Con didn't know any non-humans. He'd never met any, though he'd seen a few from a distance once. Why they'd be landing at this backwater colony, he knew not. Fortunately, curiosity was the best easily sated with answers, and he would have his answers once they landed and emerged. With a rattling crunch, the ship landed on the pad, the engines cut out, and the hatch opened. Two aliens emerged, one was tall and skinnier than anyone Con knew, while the other one was short and distinctly round in the middle. Their skin color was a faded purple for the tall one and an iridescent blue for the sawn off companion. Between them, the aliens wrestled a familiar figure down the short ramp. Kev! shouted Con. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Let me go! Let me go! snapped Kev and yanked at one of the alien hands holding him. Jeesh! You don't need to shove me all the way! Yes, we do! One of the aliens spoke, or rather, a module built into the clothing that he's speaking for him. You have nearly wrecked our ship a dozen times and made our lives a misery. Go back to your kind. We do not wish your presence any longer. Con could almost detect a certain bitterness to the creature's tone. Stepping forward, he addressed the odd pair. Your pardon, please, but what was my boy doing aboard your craft in the first place? Yeah, they kidnapped me, Pa, yelled Kev took down out the field ways and told me that they'll fly me wherever I wanted, and told them about myself. Con turned a stern gaze at the two aliens. Is this true? Did you adopt my son under false pretenses for fell purposes? The pair stared at each other, then back at Con. We are, we are supremely apologetic, wailed the shorter one through his own translation module. We only wish to return your house-spawned youth and return to a quieter space. We have learned your lesson. Nevermore will we attempt to hold humans to ransom. Indeed, Con held out his hand. And where is the ransom you owe us, then? Again, the mismatched duo stared at one another. Hey, the human, the taller one said hastily, just so that we can leave. Moments later. Con stood staring at a pile of precious metals and artworks that he knew for a fact would pay off the colony's debts and allow them to construct the new hydroelectric installation the engineers had been talking about. Is it enough? pleaded the short one. Is it? Aye, it'll do for now, Con followed. Go and never darken our skies again. Gladly, exclaimed the alien. 
with its friend had scrambled aboard the craft and the hatch closed behind them. In almost unseemly haste, the drives were lit off and the craft descended into the cloudless sky from whence it had originated. As the colonists marveled over the sudden windfall of wealth, Con looked around and scratched his head. Now, uh, where did Kev go? On board the alien craft, hidden behind a ventilation grill, Kev grinned and hefted his multi-tool. He was having far too much fun to give up now. End of story. To study war no more, written by Son of Nobody. Man had decided to study war no more because they were very, very good at it. Larry Niven, Man Kazin Wars. Brill inhaled a deep gill cavity full of dockside air and sighed contently. It was good to be in space again. Her species was fairly new on the galactic stage, but she'd been raised in an asteroid belt habitat, and planetside air always smelled wrong to her. If habitat air had had that much scent to it, it meant that the scrubbers weren't working and something was very wrong. Now, though, she was about to embark on her real dream and she flexed her venom-bearing fangs in delighted anticipation. Ever since the long-ago days of highway robbers and water goings piracy, any therapin was a scrap of real ambition wanted to be a raider. Producing was for the weak, the lowest of the low, the bottom rung of the ladder who were basically prey. Taking what you needed was what true therapin did. She was far from the best of the best as therapins went, but she and her sisters had scraped together the funds to buy a hyper-capable ship, and from what she knew of the galaxy out there, they'd do just fine against the namby-pamby password types who seemed to make up most of it. The world she'd just shuttled up from after finalizing her purchase was just such a world of weaklings. There had been no visible military presence at all, to begin with. She'd been planet-side for nearly half of an orbit, and in all that time, she hadn't seen a single victory parade. But it got far more absurd than that. The human colonizers had actually gone out of their way to set aside huge sections of the planet as preserves, so that the native life wouldn't be disrupted by them. For Eric's sake, what kind of soft-sided lunatics did such a thing? She'd seen their idea of violence too, a game called... Uh, football, and sure it looked aggressive enough on the first sniff, but it was played in armor carefully designed so that injuries were rare and medics were on claw just in case something went wrong. They were actually proud of that, proud of their greatest combatant of tradition being bloodless. Weaklings, all of them. Even the ship she'd bought had shown their weakness. It had been human-owned once, but they'd sold it when it became unsafe. Not because anything on it had actually failed, not because anybody had actually died, but because it was no longer had tripled up redundant systems. Tripled. It still had all of its life support and propulsion working just fine, and redundant backups were nearly everything. What kind of mewling hatchling needed more than that before venturing into space? Thevan built ships tended to have no backups at all. One built the best systems one could, if they failed, they failed, and hopefully took the weaklings who hadn't properly maintained them out with them. Hey, Brill, got the guns mounted? Brill swiveled her eyes towards Drug, her second in command. They were not literal broodmates, but she considered Drug to be his sister all the same. What? They're ready? There are some reinforcement points that were just perfect for them. They had mounting pins and everything. Looks like there had been something on them before. Huh. Are you saying the humans had armed their ships? Don't think so. Whatever was bolted on before was stuff was much, uh, much bigger. No way the ship's size would pack guns that huge. Maybe some kind of specialty equipment, scientific instruments, stuff like that. Bo rubbed her four claws together in thought. The ship had been a fast merchantman before Brule had bought it. That didn't seem like it would need scientific equipment. Then again... The previous owners might not have been the first owners either. There is also some rapid jettison tubes that make a great improvised torpedo launch system, so maybe you should uh, pick up some torpedoes, said Drick. Nice, sir. Uh, what were the tubes for before this? 
The seller hadn't mentioned any such feature, and Brule couldn't help but be curious. Drug ruffled her joint spines in disinterest shrug. Adana, I heard that human ships never lose a cargo. Maybe it's for jettisoning it so pirates can't get it. There's no way they could count on that working all the time. Debris in space can be tracked. Well, whatever it was for, the control runs and power systems were all pulled out. But I figure if you give me four or five days, I can get some stuff to set up torpedo fire put in. The space is there, and we've got the funds for a dozen or so torpedoes, so why not? Sure, why not? Brill waved a claw, and Drug waved back and turned back to her work on the ship's weapons. Soon they'd be ready, and soon the soft, weak species of the galaxy would know who was about to rise to the top rungs of the galactic ladder. The bar was like a spaceport bar everywhere, badly lit, badly cleaned, and badly serviced, with dozens of species coming and going. Finding your position of choice was sometimes a bit of a problem too, but fortunately, Thevin shared the tendency to get high on certain specific salts with a few other species, and their digestion handled carbohydrates well enough. They were carnivorously inclined, but omnivory was always a good survival strategy. So Brill was happily chewing on a bowl of salted pretzels, a snack common in human-frequented space and quite sufficiently intoxicated for her. Greetings, another being dropped down to sit next to her. It was a simple biped, hardly any limbs at all, and weirdly smooth, covered in tiny, slick scales, with a long tail that drooped from the end of the bar stool as it took a perch there. Brill recognized it as Fitchchak, an endothermic reptilian species that had a reputation for being fluttery, chattery things, who considered direct discussion of anything to be dreadfully rude, and would circle a point for hours. Brill gave the fritch chack a nod, and it nodded back. Brill had no idea how you told the sex of a fritch chack. Are you the owner of that light freighter getting refitted by Bay-12? asked the reptile. What if I am? said Brill, pulling her eye stalks warily close. I only wanted to pass on a small bit of wisdom, gleaned from my species several centuries in space. There have been a number of incidents in space piracy in the news of late. Have you noticed? Brill's eye stalks retracted slightly further. She gave the Fitchchak a long look. What of it? The Fitchchak ruffled the frill around its neck and replied, One should be careful going out in space in such times. One should prepare to do a little research on such incidents, on their history on their unusual results. I haven't done research since I had my adult malt, snapped Brawl. Nevertheless, it can provide valuable information, but if you don't wish to research, then perhaps I could help you by pointing out that piracy is almost unknown in this part of the galaxy. I'm quite aware of that. I have no fear of being attacked by a pirate. Brawl tried not to flex her fangs too blatantly. She was going to be the one doing the attacking. And yet you go armed... Pirates do exist, indeed. I believe I mentioned that incidents of piracy have been on the rise. Interestingly, they have been rising ever since your species discovered FTL travel. Are you insinuating something? Brill tried not to bristle. Oh, no, no. Bishchuk waved the talent hand. That would be quite rude. I only wanted to do you a favor. A young, new species captain, such as yourself, should be warned before going out into the wider galaxy. Brill did bristle now, her joint foil standing on end. I know what I'm doing. I'm certain you do. Yet, you may not be aware of all relevant facts. For example, did you know that human ships carry almost a quarter of the cargo shipped about the galaxy? I knew that, yes. And yet, they charge a quite significant premium to do so. Have you ever considered why? The cost of all the ridiculous redundancies, I'm sure. It just means that I can undercut them and still make a profit, said Brule dismissively. Not that she intended to ship much legitimate cargo, but she at least pretend to. Indeed, indeed, still, the way other species are willing to pay this premium is a fact that you might ponder upon for a time. Brule let out a short hiss of annoyance. So do you have a point that you wanted to get to, Fitzjack? The Fitzjack snapped its brule up for a moment, the gesture startling as it seemed to make the alien's head twice the size it had been. Then it smoothed it back down. No, 
I suppose I don't, it said, and slid down off the stool and stalked away. Brill looked after it, then ruffled up her joint spines and picked up another pretzel. That had been an odd encounter, but hadn't given her any actual useful information at all. Piracy on the rise. Of course it was. The Thurban were in space now, taking their rightful place. What need did she have to research that obvious fact? There it is. Brill's fangs were practically dripping with anticipation as she looked at the big screen on a ship's bridge. It didn't show an actual view, of course, since to the naked eye another ship wouldn't be visible until it was freakishly, insanely close. But the little icons scattered across the screen were a beautiful sight all the same. Here, the system's primary, glowing white. There, a scatter of planets marked in green. Further out, the arc of a line indicating where the gravitational boundary between hyperspace and the star's gravity well lay. And just past that point, the little blue triangle marking a merchant ship, on a course so predictable that Brill's own ship would have no trouble at all matching vectors. That was necessary to board a ship, of course. But first, the fun part. The part where they pounced on the prey and put a nice big hole in something vital, but not too vital, just to make sure that it didn't escape. Captain, the merchant ship is changing vectors, spoke up a bit. One of Brill's actual brood sisters. Also, its power readings have just spiked. Trying to run away, I suppose. Does it have the power to outrun us? Uh, it is a very large ship, Captain. We're much faster. But it's not running. It's slowing down to meet us. What? Brill felt her joint fur standing on end in shock. Are you sure that it is a merchant? Sure as I can be. The engine readings aren't military grade. Everything is consistent with a Karunga class human cargo transport. Brill rubbed her claws together, tried to think. What the hell do the humans think they're doing? A ship pops out of hyper right in front of Vector, and they starts after them. They have to know that we're pirates. Or can they be that stupid? Have they hailed us? No, Captain. Hail them, then uh, put it up on screen. The creature, whose image replaced the navigational display a moment later, was a soft-looking thing, wearing clothing to cover up its pale, squishy skin, with a tuft of dark hair on the top of it. A human, of course. The human, Brill thought, that the lack of facial hair, tufts, meant that it was female, sprawled sideways on a chair, putting one leg over the arm of it, and gave Brill the tooth-bearing expression. Why, hello there, she drawled. I am Captain Amanda Price, from the Terran merchant ship Nobody's Business. What can I do for you? Brill bristled at the ridiculous human and her ridiculously long name and her ridiculously sentimentality in naming her ship. That was a ridiculous name, too. You can kill all power and prepare to be boarded. Oh, so you really are pirates then. Uh, turbans, right? Uh, I heard about you. If you have, then you should know the danger that you're in. The ship is well armed. If you surrender, we will allow you and your crew to live. See, uh, the problem with that is that my ship is armed too. Brill snorted in amusement at that very thought. The triple redundant super defensive humans carrying weapons like a predator. Ha! Ah! No doubt they had very good shields, but Brill had paid for the best grazers and the highest yield torpedoes that the ship's tube system could fit. There was no way that... Sullivan, why don't you give the nice spider ladies there a little demonstration? I, I know it'll cut into our margins a bit, but I think we can afford it. Yes, ma'am, said one of the other humans seated behind the one in the center of the screen. He did something on his console, and a moment later Brill heard a bit suck in a shocked breath. Missile launch, Captain. What? Brill felt a cold chill run through her vitals. They were still far, far outside effective torpedo range, let alone energy weapons range. So there was no way that she could fire back. She could try to shoot it down with a torpedo, or one of the grazers once it got close enough. But if it were an actual military quality missile, it would be able to take evasive maneuvers. So there was no guarantee that she would get it. But what kind of lunatic merchant ship carried actual combat missiles? Their grab drives meant that they would cost a small fortune each, and that was just the beginning of the absurdity of arming a merchant ship with such a weapon. The space a missile launcher would take up would cut into their cargo capacity, and the magazine storage for the massive things, if you wanted to be able to fire more than once, would take up even more. Surely, there had to be some kind of fake. 
Brill's eyes snapped back to the human, still lounging idly in a chair. This is your warning shot, Derbian. It's the only one you'll get, so I suggest you pay attention. Calms off, Brill snapped it a bit, not wanting to see that smug, squishy creature any longer. A bit entered a command into a console, and the lounging human vanished, replaced by a navigational display that now showed the blinking orange dot moving inexorably from the human ship towards the Thurban ship. Brill's mind race. Space was a huge place, and even when ships were close to each other, as now, there were still actual vast distances apart. Missiles moved at sublight speeds, so even though they were blazingly fast in those terms, their run times were measured in minutes, not seconds. Still, there was limited time to act, and Brill would have to make the most of it. Drig! She snapped at the weapons expert. Track that. Get a torpedo locked on it and ready to launch as soon as it comes into range. Yes, Captain, she replied. Should I uh, ready a, a retreat course? Piped up Tissel, the navigator. No. Brill felt the whole joint for her bristling in annoyance. There has to be a fake. And even if it's real, they can't possibly carry more than one. That's a cargo ship, not a warship. This is all just a bluff. I've seen humans. I've been on one of their worlds. They're soft creatures. They're prey creatures. They're just acting like a tarquil, puffing up their spines so that they seem too large to tackle. Roll flexed her fangs again, coldly, eagerly, and said, I like the taste of tarquil. There was silence after that as they waited, while the orange dot of the missile crept closer and closer. Suddenly, Drig's claws grabbed down and the right moment arrived, and the green dot raced out from their ship towards the human missile. Torpedoes were smaller things, and were given all their impetus by the torpedo tube that launched them. They had no drives of their own, and so they couldn't change course once sent on their way. This one shrieked out, and the missile shrieked in to meet it, but at the last second the missile swept, adjusting its course slightly, and then again it retargeted the ship, so the torpedo missed it entirely. The whole exchange had taken long enough that the missile was almost in energy weapons range now. Brill wanted to curse. She should have had Drug fire several torpedoes, in case the first one missed. Prepare the grazers, it's almost in... She was cut off by an orange light vanishing from the display. The missile had exploded itself just outside of energy range. An alarm buzzed as the shield suddenly registered dangerously elevated amounts of energy. The missile had been nuclear, and from the hellish heart of its blast came radiation that sleeted now against the Thurbian's shields. But the shields were more than sufficient against it, and Brill let out a long breath of relief. Sister, the abbots, the human is hating us again. But the thing back on screen... The bit stabbed at a console, and once again the squishy creature lounging on a chair appeared. Hello there, Thurbian. Ah, that was your one and only warning shot. You can heave too, or you can run away. I don't really care which, but if you continue on the specter, I will shoot to kill next time. I will not be taken by your bluff, human. No cargo ship could afford more than one missile. I wasn't hatched yesterday. The human finally straightened in a chair. It was no bluff, I promise you. You'll save yourselves a lot of trouble if you just break off now. Ha! <laughs> That's what you want me to think. But I know a better human. You are not raiders yourselves. You are mere cargo haulers, not even producers of things. You are the lowest form of prey. I will not be bluffed by prey. Come off, she added, turning to her bits, who once again obediently switched the screen back to normal display. We maintain our course then, Captain, asked Tissel, her voice nervous. We do, said Brill firmly. Nearly a minute ticked by, and Brill felt her eye stalks extend in renewed confidence. She hadn't even realized how far she pulled them in. But the humans obviously didn't have any more. Missile launch, said a bits, her voice tight with sudden fear. Just one, said Brill, mentally counting the torpedoes they had on board and considering the best strategy to catch the damn thing this time. Just one. Uh, uh, no, no, wait. Another launch. They have to be fake, hissed Brill. They have to be. And a third, said a bits. What should I do, Captain? asked Tissel. Nothing, snarled Brill. She knew perfectly well that the missiles, if they really were missiles, would be locked onto a ship. There was no time to slew far enough to the side to get out of range, so there was no avoiding them entirely. Their shields had held against the radiation from the blast still kilometers away, 
but would crack like the thinnest of eggs from a direct impact. It wasn't military grade at all. It was meant to protect against micrometeors and radiation hazards. The only thing to do was hope that they could pick at least a few of the missiles off with the torpedoes. Drug, come up with a firing plan to shoot the whole torpedo magazine at them. They can only do so much dodging. If we hit enough of them, we can take them out, or slow them enough for the grazers to get a good shot. Go ahead and fire early. We don't need an ideal targeting, we just need more chances to hit them. Yes, Captain. It would be tight. They'd only brought a dozen torpedoes, so they'd just four shots at each missile, and they'd have to take all four as fast as possible to even have a chance, so that they could all miss completely. Unless the missile dodged one and swerved into another. Still... They might get lucky with those, or with the grazers at closer range. Another launch, said Abitz, and her voice was heavy with dread. Pichak, bro, couldn't keep from swearing. How many of those things can they have in the ship that size? If the cargo hold is entirely missiles, more than a thousand, whispered Tissel. Her eye stalks were pulled all the way in, and her arms were curled in as well, hunched in a posture of terror. Brill hissed in rage. There he cannot have a hold, fool. They're a merchant ship. They make money hauling cargo. We will bring down the missiles targeted at us, and then we will bring them down like the prey they are. Keep our course. Yes, Captain, said Tissel, but Brill feared that it was much as because she knew fleeing wouldn't save them as for any other reason. Brill wanted to be certain that they'd made it, that this was all a bluff, a ruse, that the missiles were a fake that the torpedoes would take them out. She wanted, needed, to believe anything, but that her own death was staring at her in a form of one blinking blue triangle and four orange dots creeping towards her. The torpedoes began firing, a volley of three aimed at the first missile. Another launch, a spit of bits, and a fourth orange light blinked into existence next to the blue triangle of the human ship. Brill felt her own eye stalks retracting completely, they had to be fake. They had to be fake. They all had to be fake. The force torpedo blinked off the display. The second did as well. The third vanished too, and the missile's orange glare vanished with it. Brill almost dared to hope for an instant that it was indeed fake. Then the shield alarm squealed again, and the remnants of nuclear foul fire splashed against them. It had been real, and the least four more like it were headed their way. Captain Amanda Price stared at the main display and shook her head. There was a scatter of white pinpricks indicating the recent debris field, and another scatter of little green dots. Light pods. And Terran made ones too, it looked like. Across the spot where the turbine ship had been. It had taken six missiles to take them down, a good chunk of a twenty-shot magazine. Though, at least she hadn't needed to spend any counter-missiles. The turbines hadn't got anywhere near her ship and they obviously used every torpedo they had, trying to shoot down her missiles in any case. But the last few had only been opposed by energy weapons. These new guys aren't very bright, are they? Said Dan Sullivan, the weapons officer, who sounded half amused, half incredulous. Girls, said Price, almost absently. Any third one you talk to will be female. Their males aren't sentient. Huh. Okay then, well, uh, girls or guys, that was pretty dense of them. That's been how most of the reports I've seen on Terran shipping encounters with them have gone, said Price with a shrug. So no, at this point they're really not. They have to know by now that their pirates nearly always lose. They've managed to have some better armed ships and to get lucky a few times, but mostly, Price gestured to the screen, mostly that happens. How many do you think got off before it blew at the end there? Not many, probably, Price replied. Jackson, she turned to another member of the crew, the navigator. Parts of plan to pick up all the pods are the same. I wouldn't leave even pirates out here. Well, you do that. I'll start writing up an incident report for that spit and polish types back on Earth. She flashed a grin at that. Gotta get our anti-piracy power from the Navy, so I can afford to restock the missiles. It'll be nice to get some really up-to-date ones. Hell, maybe if Earth gets enough reports about these bozos... They'll do something to actually drive the point home to the whole species, said Sullivan. Maybe so. I'm considering just releasing any we find in the pods to make their way home. Normally, I'm all for prosecuting pirates, 
but I feel that they might be better served telling everybody else from their backboards of the little planet to stop it already. Captain Price shook her head again. Although, given their specific form of idiocy, maybe they'll just try ramping it up. Well, the Navy will definitely teach them what not to do if they try that, said Sullivan with a chuckle. True enough. Now let's get a move on, people. We've got lots to do, and when that's all done, we still have to finish our route, she grinned. After all, a human ship always delivers its cargo, no matter what. End of story. Aldens, written by Arclight Magus. In a broad universe and at the edges of what is known, there are many peoples, many places, and many tales. This is but one of them from the whole of what has been, is, and will be. It is not the height of galactic civilization, nor was it the beginning or the end, merely somewhere in between. Species warred, misunderstandings were had, breakthroughs accomplished, heroism marked and forgotten. But perhaps if there was a semi-constant amidst all of this, what was a near constant, you might ask? Olden's Bar on Galactic Station 3. How could this place have been a near constant if what was upon the Galactic Station 3, particularly given how many times it changed hands over the decades and even the centuries? Well, that's the trick. In the now, it's Galactic Station 3. Once upon a time, it was Terran Star Station Comedian. Before that, it was Mars Tether Station 1. And what does all of this have to do with Alden's? Alden's was the first shop to ever open its doors aboard the station. Even in the now, where it is owned by a great descendant of the original Alden, Alden is one of the few places in galactic society that is considered one of the only true neutral grounds. The very powerful, the preeminently corrupt, the poorest, most honest of souls, and every being in between who knows and respects Alden's, it's said that criminals and the law can dine in peace together at Alden's. This isn't to say that there isn't a law at Alden's, but rather there are Alden's two laws, and Alden's laws are enforced by all. But all of this is a mere decoration to the now. Why? Because in the now, someone is about to break Alden's law and discover what it means to be on the wrong side of it. Another round, Alden! called out the Zert, called Blem. They were a compatriot at being steadily drinking and eating at Alden's for the past several cycles. They'd successfully robbed several vessels and various species and decided to stop in the Galactic Station 3 to try and pawn some of their ill-gotten gains. They'd been reasonably successful, galactic policing and anti-piracy measures being poor even at the best of times. Alden merely nodded and began pouring the group another round. His dark skin, unusual for this part of the galactic hub. But no being ever really remarked upon it. After all, what was the skin of a Terran compared to the glittering scales of the Justic or the finely coiffed fur of the Terranean? No, Alden was only remarkable because he was Alden. At least, as far as these customers knew. Alden smoothly delivered the round to the table with a smooth elegance that stood him well. The Zert, opposed Blum, moved to slap Alden on the back, but seemed to miss without apparent reason why. Will that be all? Alden asked, the consummate professional. Blum nodded, a replication of Alden's movements that they had picked up after several visits to this place. Alden quickly withdrew and began attending to other patrons at the bar. Blum looked around at the bar and contemplated the other patrons. A few Terrans, probably Astro Miners, if they were any judge, stopped in for a quick round before they set back out into one of the nearby belts. A Rugap, on some kind of social gathering with a Winean, a Pelic, and a Max. A few of the local constabulary, who appeared to be steadily ignoring the room while drinking heavily with the cheapest beverages that Alden stocked and a Zert that Blum both recognized and didn't, or rather thought they recognized, but couldn't be sure. The fringe was right, but the eyes seemed wrong. Those eyes seemed much kinder than the ones Blum remembered being on the other side of the weaponry of their last encounter. Unfortunately, 
one of the Zert that Blum was with also recognized the familiar Zert and yelled out, Ollie! Mertham! The Zert barked out, halfway spilling their drink. The familiar Zert looked over and Blum could see a moment of hatred spring to life in those eyes. And yet, just as quickly, the moment was gone and the eyes softened. Such a reaction was practically unlike any Zert in the whole of history. This, in fact, one of the only instances of a Zert putting aside the past grudge, and so it wholly was remarkable in that regard. Sadly, this fact was about to be lost in the mix of what would follow. The Zert named Mutham collected a drink from Alban and walked over to Blum's seating and table. What a surprise to see you here, Matham said amendably. We were just passing through, couldn't resist stopping by this old place, Blum grinned, a jagged toothed grin slapping the table heavily, making even the heavy table and the genuine Terran wood boards beneath it bounce slightly. Your ship has seen better days, Blum. Did you ever get around to fixing that chair and slip by pass like I told you? Mutham gestured out the windows of the bar at the station, slowly rotating in the general direction of the docking ports. Nah, upgraded we did. Got a new ship and all, bellowed one of the Zerts, who was seated near the Blum. Blum reached across the table and was about to hit the Zert before slowly leaning back and lowering the appendage. Blum, have you truly fallen this far again? Mutham seemed to be disappointed and yet condescending. Blum could feel the fringe flare involuntarily at that. I've, uh, I just had a few setbacks. At least this way I'm not stuck behind a desk, or worse, back in Zertia, they said curtly. Given that this was an age-lacking universal translation, practically live, at least for the most common folk, the rest of the bar could seem to sense the tension, and so was watching as something happening, if only for a moment. But for those who didn't speak Zerth, they might have simply been having polite conversation for them. You're a thief and a coward, like I told you the last time I saw you, Mutham said in the galactic common and very loudly. This got the attention of the whole bar, and perhaps more importantly, it got Olden's attention. Blum considered a moment, considering where they were, considered their history with Mutham, considered the several days' worth of drinks and food weighing down their tail. No, thought Blum, not worth it. Anywhere else, maybe, but not here. Unfortunately, Blum's companions were not considerate of just where they were given the same quantity of drink and food. The first opposite Blum stood in a hurry and moved to circle around Mutham. Mutham, for their part, looked shocked. The second stood, knocking over the heavy table with ease and spilling the accumulated empty food and drink containers to the floor. By this point, all two seconds of it, the rest of the bar had gone silent. We should take your fringe for taking to the captain like that, the second said in Zerth, wavering somewhat unsteadily. Tipka, sit back down, commanded Blum, who was genuinely starting to worry about what was about to happen. No, Captain, this one here needs your lesson and respect. Tipka, an exceptionally heavy Zert with the best of times, took two thumping steps forward, barely kicking aside two of the drink containers and crushing one of the food containers beneath their foot. Stop, we're in Alden's, came the halfway cry from Blum, who seemed almost frightened but remained seated. Good! No lot to stop us! Tipka lunged and grabbed Muthen by the crown. The first Zert had circled behind, grabbed Muthen's tail, as if to try and stretch the offended Zert between them. They didn't make a move any further than that. At least, not voluntarily. It seemed to be only a moment, and yet somehow, they both yelped and released Muthen, who dropped to the floor. Both seemed intent on nursing their hands as they tried to figure out what just happened. Alden was standing there with a big hunk of the genuine Terran wood in his hand. I believe it is time you paid your tab, Alden said in a calm, almost Gentile accented common. Huh? Came the only thing that came to Tipka's mind. You'll pay your tab and you will leave, Alden commanded. Tipka would still not be in their right mind, and so they reached towards Alden to grab him by the head. Strangely, like the friendly backpat attempted from earlier, dismissed, despite nothing apparent from Alden. 
Alden extended a hunk of wood upwards and brought it down into the almost sickening thud upon the head of Tipka. Tipka either couldn't dodge it or chose not to. Whatever the case, Tipka's fringe went pale before they collapsed to the floor in a barely contained heap of scales. The first Zert, who had been holding onto Mutham's tail, appeared somewhat frightened at this point. Mutham, to their credit, had retreated to the bar behind Alden. Alden pointed the hunk of wood to the first Zert. You will pay for both your tabs now and leave, Alden commanded. The first Zert merely nodded, the reality of the situation seeming somewhat normal, although they couldn't understand why their captain hadn't moved from their spot. Alden snapped his fingers and an employee appeared with a table holding a bull which was proffered to the lone Zert. To say the Zert's fringe bulged in surprised amazement and utter terror in the same instant would be an understatement. Never before had a Zert felt like this and likely never again. At least not in any bar. On a battlefield, perhaps. This, uh, uh this can't be right, the Zert protested in an almost broken common. Ah, but it is. You're not the first to break my laws, nor will you be the last. But this is my bar, and you will pay what's owed, Alden said in that same calm, aristocratic accented galactic common. Alden gestured with a hunk of wood to the sign over the bar that was translated into 35 different scripts, all of which could readily be translated into any of the other most commonly used scripts. They all spoke of the same two laws, the exact two laws that Zert was in the process of breaking. The Zert appeared to try to think, only to fail, try again, fail again, and still end up reaching for one of the worst possible conclusions any being in the room could have imagined. No, said the Zert, almost as a whisper at first, before repeating it louder. No! Blum and Mutham winced in sympathy, as the hunk of wood caught the Zert across the gut, lifting them slightly and throwing them to the side and the, to the floor, landing hard. The employee who had presented the tablet to the Zert pressed the tablet forced confirmation and placed the moaning but not unconscious Zert's indent hand against the payment form. The tablet chimed and then issued a kind of sad tone. Several people in the bar already knew what it was. Insufficient funds. Do you wish to use Galactic Bank credits? asked the tablet. The Zert still appeared less than happy about being conscious but eyed the tablet with suspicion. Glanced over at Alden back at the tablet and decided that the bank was a lesser opponent. Thumbing the affirmation on the tablet, it chimed happily and the employee moved away gently, almost at odds with all else that had just happened. The two Zerts were carried out the front door and placed on a nearby transport in the direction away from Alden's. Alden's hand seemed to empty of the hunk of wood and he quickly set about putting the table back into place and collecting the various empties an employee helping him. Would you like a replacement drink? He asked Blum. Blum swallowed and nodded. A few moments later, a replacement drink was in front of them, and Mutham was across from them, holding a similar drink. Well, I, I see you remember some of the things I taught you. Mutham seemed smugged. Don't try your luck. You won't always be in Alden's. Neither will I, Blum said. A bit rougher than intended. Come now! If you got a new ship, who better to look after it than me? All I ask is to keep a legitimate, Mutham said. Not enough currency in it, muttered Blum. You just need to look in the right places, Mutham gestured towards the bar with the drink. Blum looked over at the bar where Alden winked. Blum gave it some thought. Actually, Blum gave it a lot of thought, far more than one would expect from a Zert. All right, you're in, and no rough stuff. Blum flared their fringe, as was tradition. Of course not. We're in Alden's, after all. End of story. No More, written by Deray Leaf. Three weeks after the Moor incident, which saw the destruction of the freighter UNS CV Roger Moore with all hands as she had rammed an enemy cruiser, the last traces of the shockwave that marked the death of both vessels got torn asunder once again. With an eruption of energies that didn't even have names a few years ago, a behemoth vessel dropped out of faster-than-night travel with pinpoint accuracy. The blocky gunmetal grey hull gleamed in the dim light of the system's primary sun. 
and her sides were adorned with the same UNSNV, Mothra. She was a vanguard of a small armada of equally utilitarian-looking vessels of many shapes and sizes that emerged from the FTL in flashes and eruptions of energy all around the behemoth vessel. The Mothra wasn't the largest ship in the fleet, now several larger vessels took up defensive postures around her. But she was amongst the more imposing ones. Smaller vessels flitted around like hunting dogs around their master's heels, every bit of their posture showing their eagerness for action. Each of the three dozen ships made small corrections to their positioning relative to each other as they turned their bows to face the planet orbiting the distant star. All along the hulls of the vessel, sensor pods and weapon placements made lazy sweeps of the surrounding space, and none of the vessels made even a token attempt to hide their presence. On the contrary, the engines put out their sensors and targeting systems shot out like a beacon, challenging the local occupation fleet to come and face the submerging fleet. No formal declaration of war had been made, yet that was about to change. On the bridge of the Mothra, a door slid open with a sound that most people didn't even remember why it was added to the sliding doors. Some said that it was an ancient tradition, yet others claimed that it was a practical joke that became a tradition. Either way, the door's distinctive sound heralded the arrival of a clearly inhuman figure. Skittering into the relatively cramped bridge on six segmented legs was the assigned liaison for the force. The Ambassador Ray's on fluttering leaves on peaceful day, or Ambassador Ray's for short, swiveled her eye stalks around and find her assigned place. An area of the bridge had been cleared of the seats that simply could not accommodate her almost arachnid body shape. Her other eye stalk turned backwards as one of the human crew members made a sound that the Ambassador had been told entailed adoration and pleasure. Oh, look at that. That is so cute. The human that had spoken had flushed was both of his ambassador's eye stalks focused their gaze in form. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I, uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I could not, uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, I mean, uh. The human crew member flushed with a display that the ambassador was briefed on as being awkward and shameful. Ambassador Ray stepped over to her destination and then chittered into a translator, even as one of her manipulator limbs reached back to adjust a small brood of hatchlings that clung to her carapace. No apologies needed. I am well aware of the response humans have to our younglings. Her carapace changed color to a soothing color as she continued to earth her gaze moving away from the crew member to scan across the bridge. These humans still surprised her. Their shapes were so alien to her, but then again, she looked just as alien to them. One of the humans she had once met told her that she looked like a giant spider wearing a crab suit, and was intrigued that she had to look up the referenced Earth animals. Convergent revolution was really something. Earth was what the cradle of humanity and also gave rise to the animals that looked strikingly familiar to her kind. It was in part due to these mysterious comparisons and familiarity they brought that humanity and her race had fostered such a warm bond so quickly. Although she had heard there was a small set of humans that had a near visceral fear response to her kind, she personally hadn't met any of these so-called arachnophobes yet. Her hatchlings that clung to her back carapace fussed and chirped for nourishment, and with a little self-conscious scan of her surroundings, she relaxed an organ that would fill the small reservoir with nutrient fluid for her hatchlings to feed upon. Her manipulator arms were on reflex adjusting the cloth drape that covered her rear carapace to seclude her brood from prying eyes. The ambassador's attention got drawn away from her brood as the commander of the vessel strode onto the bridge. A human guard bellowed out a call for attention that had the members of the crew not currently tapping away at their consoles turn to salute the imposing female commander as she arrived. Her hand returned the salute and then waved dismissively as she spoke. As you were, status report please. The commander asked as she walked over to the large center console that detailed the fleet's composition, an aide joining her with a smaller data pad and speaking up in an almost casual tones. Deacceleration completed on schedule and we're on target. Acceptable drift and green across the fleet, ma'am. System garrison is on scopes and the bears are responding. 
We count approximately fifty ships in the standard formation, clawing their way out of the gravity well towards us, ma'am. The aide grinned, which made the scars any space to form as he continued. Our pickets beyond that target system are reporting movements of the ships as well, so we estimate another two dozen ships vectoring in. No ETA on them yet, but the Teddy Garrison will be in effective range in about twenty minutes, ma'am. The commander nodded and then rubbed her hands together. All right, so we have a little time to burn. Status and Task Force Newton. Newton is on station and deploying as planned, ma'am, Captain Raymond added. And I quote, Locked and cocked and ready to rock, ma'am. The grizzled aide could not hide his mirth at getting to relay that message, and the ambassador noticed little smiles and straightening spines all around the bridge crew. Good, good. All the pieces are set, almost time for our glorious first act. The commander turned her head towards the ambassador and inclined her head in a show of respect. Ambassador Reyes, is everything in order on your end? Reyes dipped the front of her body downwards in a mimicry of a human body language, as it was rather hard to nod if one didn't have a separate head to do so. No errant waves in my path, ma'am. All is fine. With a smile still curling her lips, the human commander raised herself up to a full imposing height and walked over to the main communications display. The technicians were there were only needed a glance from the warrior woman to open a channel to the whole system. Every crew member visibly sat straighter and almost held their breath. History was about to be made. Humanity had enjoyed an era of peace, but after today, that peace would be no more. As the communications channel was opened, the growling voice of the local garrison leadership sounded out. The emotionless translation followed a half second after the growls and ramblings. Human Vassal, you are in violation of our claimed borders. You have... The translator hiccuped at this point, and the commander's side glanced towards the communication tank that just shrugged and looked at the ambassador Rays in return. Rays, on her part, just spoke up with a, About three of your minutes. Then a low voice to which the commander nodded, and focused her attention on the incoming message. To change your course and spool out your drives, or you will be fired upon. The commander took a deep breath as the garrison's message repeated itself, and then muttered a showtime under her breath before rising a voice. This is Commander of the UN Task Force 12. To anyone on this channel, we are here to deliver a message. Please forward what I'm about to say to your high command authority. The commander paused for a brief moment, and then continued with a solemn tone to her voice. Humanity is new to the galactic stage, but we are blessed to have made our first contact with the Federation of Radiant Explorers Traversing the Void, or as we call them, the Crabs. We have traded with them for half a generation now, and they are our closest friends. On behalf of the United Nations of Sol, the Alpha Centauri Commonwealth, and the myriad independent systems of the Outer Rim Alliance, I now bring you a message. The commander's voice took on a lower tone as she reached to brush her fiery red hair out of her eyes, the tribal ink markings etched into her chin, giving her a menacing countenance that sent a small shiver of appreciation through Ambassador Ray's carapace. We stood idly by as you invaded the Federation systems, but no more. You burned their cities and enslaved their people, but no more. We are ashamed and have a debt to repay to our allies. We are peaceful by choice, but due to your actions, no more. This day at this hour, we send a message to you. Your invasion ends here. We will not ask you to withdraw here today. We don't need to. The commander's lips curled into a near predatory grin as the local garrison leader actually had the audacity to interrupt a speech. The growls sounded angered and upset as they bellowed out, who are you to make these challenges? We will burn your ship from the void and cast you into the nether that you spawn from. The commander barked out a small laugh and raised her voice into the bellow that rivaled that of the alien bear on the other end of the link. Who am I? I will tell you. I have been chosen to speak for all of humanity. My name, Admiral Amatola Mauga Santiago O'Malley. You killed our friends. Prepare to die. The last word was spoken with a deadly calm finality 
without prompting the tank closed the channel, cutting off the enraged and confused fellows of the garrison leader. Admiral O'Malley turned on their heels and nodded for a first officer. The Exo in turn tapped on his console and spoke up while the rest of the bridge crew sprung into action like a well-oiled machine. Mothra to fleet, weapons free, I repeat, designate all hostiles and weapons free. Space around the human fleet tore and twisted as weapons lanced out. Laser, plasma, and a good old-fashioned metal slug shot out to roar their displeasure at the garrison's fleet that was still clawing their way into range. Shields flared on an imposing hulls of the invaders ships, and in places the mighty armor of the vessels glowed and buckled as human ingenuity and weapon design struck home. Few ships slowed and veered off as damage was sustained to their drives and navigation, but most simply bulled their way through the barrage from the human interlopers. The bear-like crews of the invader ships roared their challenges as their own weapons started to return fire, and the battle was joined in earnest. Two fleets holding position near each other and slinging death back and forth. This was a battle the bears knew. They had always fought this way, and their superior weapons and armors had always carried the day against the Federation fleets. As their weapons fire struck home, several of the human vessels drifted out of formation, their armor rent and torn asunder. The sight excited the invaders as their morale rose to a fever pitch. On board Mothra, Ambassador Ray steadied herself as the ship shook under the impact of plasma bolt that would have caught a Federation corvette lengthwise, but the human vessel just took a hit with minimal damage. The bridge crew calmly gave each other damage reports and updates on system states, while Ray's eye stalks focused on Admiral Amartola, who almost passively listened to her aide, giving her status report. The Arizona reports a loss of atmosphere in three decks. She's pivoting to the broadside to keep in fight. We've lost the Aleppo, like he hit on a reactor, but the engineers prevented a meltdown, and the crew has been evacuated. No engineers survived. The Molino is adjusting to cover the lifeboats. Admiral Amatola nodded and tapped the screen in front of her to get an overview of her fleet's positions, then nodded again before speaking up. Okay, gentle beings, we gave them a taste of their own playbook, and it's one we know. Now history is full of fleets duking in out this way. But no more. Let's dance, shall we? The word is given. Execute. Ambassador Ray flushed with a brief bright neon color display as the human at the helm of the gargantuan ship gave an almost giddy-sounding battle cry and spent the next two heartbeats trying to calm her hatchlings as the whole ship vibrated and shook. Her eye stalks fell on the essential display and narrowed in shock, details of the redoubts just not computing. The human ships, as one, moved surging forward on great plumes of their drives in a near-suicidal charge at the enemy's fleet. But they didn't charge in a straight line for long, because a mere few heartbeats later, the whole fleet broke up into pairs and small formations of ships that pivoted and danced around the invader ships. Many a human ship got caught by enemy fire, but in several cases, the hulk of the dead human ship took one or two of the invaders down with it as they plowed themselves into the tight formation. Other ships invaded fire and just unloaded their weapons at near point blank rages into the invader cruisers and battleships, overloading the mighty shields and armor with a sheer volume of fire and fury. But then the human ships were behind the invader ships, and again as one, they swiveled in place. Their momentum carried them forward while their bulk traversed to face the enemy once more. Weapons launched out in the vulnerable enemy rears, and the invaders were slow to respond. Their doctrine worked against them in the face of near-suicidal human tactics. Ship after ship drifted out of formation or blossomed into gouts of flame, radiation, and blinding light. Ambassador Ray marveled at it. All while around her, the human bridge crew never lost their calm. Some even joked amongst themselves for one second, then solemnly reported the loss of a nearby ship. The scene made Ray's innermost core twitched with worry as she realized she was the first of her kind to witness this side of humanity. Her species had seen humans as peculiar kind of mediocre beings new to the galaxy, young, naive even, but no more.
An alert blared out and Ray saw the Admiral's aide bringing up a worrying sight on the main display. Enemy reinforcements just dropped in our flank, ma'am. Initial tally, 12 ships, cruiser weight, end up. The Admiral tapped a console and licked her lips in thought. Comms, open a channel to Newton. Channel open, ma'am. Mothra to Newton. We have some party crashes on our flank. See them? The Admiral's voice made Ray swivel the eye stalks around in confusion. Why did she sound so casual? Newton to Mothra. Captain Raymond here, ma'am. Y- yes, we do see them. Admiral O'Malley actually chuckled as she replied, Well, uh, I don't want to. Yes, ma'am, came the enthusiastic reply from the comm channel, and Ambassador Rain noticed a new marker on the edge of the central console suddenly flaring to life. Before the voice of Captain Raymond continued, Baggage on way, clear the lane. A smaller display opened up in the central console, and Ray's carapace flashed a shocked dark indigo as she tried to make sense of what she saw. Several smaller human vessels, civilian models as far as Ray's could tell, were shown maneuvering a few dozen asteroids around in tow cables and large industrial manipulator arms. Then most of the asteroids suddenly vanished in a telltale flashes of an FTL drive initiation. The next thing Ambassador Ray's noticed was the entire bridge crew giving a jubilant intake of breath and in exclamations of HELL YEAH and variations. On the main display, Twelve reinforced invader ships blossomed into small novas of expanding plasma and fury, and the ambassador just stared in mute shock and disbelief at the spectacle. The grizzled admiral's aide spoke up of his own accord as it glanced at the awestruck ambassador. We fitted some small FTL drives to the few rocks. Makes for a nice surprise, don't you agree? Once the bears learn how to fight on the move, that drag will stop working. But for now... It works. Another voice broke through Razor's shock as she shook her body to clear her mind. No more enemies in system or on scopes. The other fleet elements have been vectoring in, changed course when the flanking force went dark. Bears are in full retreat and their planetary forces are signaling their surrender. Admiral turned towards Ambassador and bowed before her. Accept our apologies for not doing this sooner, ma'am. We humans have been negligent in our alliance, but no more. We are in this fight now and we will not rest until the invasion of your systems and territories is repulsed. We are passive no longer. And thus, humanity's first true interstellar war began. The coming months and years would see victories, defeats, triumphs, and tragedies. But one thing prevailed. Before the war, all the species that knew of the human thought of them as the naive newcomers, upstarts with quirky technology and ingrained insanity for exploration and progress. Harmless, hairless bipeds with mediocre technology and illusions of grandeur beyond their station. But as the war dragged on, more and more of the human mindset got revealed. The other empires learned and realized their mistake. Humans had been overlooked, discarded, and dismissed. But no more. End of story. Story number one. Their specialization, written by Cobalt Sky. It is thought that the most advanced piece and tech that civilization makes is good representation of them. And for the three major races in the Galactic Confederation, that technology was a specialized version of an FTL drive. Starting with the sharp-minded Nivlans, who themselves were a cliff-dwelling species that by galactic standards are small, around 50% smaller than average, and thus much of their technology represents that. When the Nivlans reached prominence in the stars and developed an FTL drive, they optimized for size. Compared to the other two dominant species, it is almost a fourth the size without any loss of power. This allows ships equipped with their drive to be smaller, or more likely repurposed to left over room for some things like cargo or luxury cabins. Then there are the Zarok, who have a home world with lots of space, but very little in the way of useful resources. There are many barren graven fields of little more than limestone and harsh mountains on their home. Thus, they needed to make every ounce of iron and other elements count. This almost zealot-like efficiency is proudly on display in their FTL. The Zarak drive can travel the same distance as others, but with about two-thirds the fuel. That may not seem like much, 
but when you are talking millions of tons of metallic hydrogen to move a bulk cargo liner, that is an astronomical savings. And then my people, the Yelves, who have a whole world covered in large open grasslands and is also home to the massive avian predator, due to this threat, we grew to be extremely fast sprinters, so that our ancestors could dart back to the burrows before getting snatched into the purple sky. So, when we took over that sky, our ancestors feared that we put our speed into our drives, our drives are on average 10 to 15% faster than other models. This is awesome for smaller transports and passenger vessels, as well as valuable cargo as it limits the amount of time, but it might be intercepted. There are a handful of space-bound peoples, but many of them are not yet at the point of developing their own specialized FTL. And for the time, all are more than happy to use the models that the three major races are offering. Then, just 65 cycles back, our community met the humans. They were odd, but not too weird. When we discovered them, they had spread out through their home system and had a small foothold in the next star system over. As expected, they were still using skipper drives, which are simpler to discover, but far less useful and flexible to the point drives that are the standard for FTL. Both contact went extremely well, and besides... A bit of shock from the historians about the human past, when that was cleared up and with the hesitant go-ahead from the historians, they were invited to our little confederation. Things started to get interesting when we offered to sell them point drives for their ships. You see, most species before them that were offered the drives were overjoyed and more than happy to buy them. I mean, why would they not be? The difference between the two was like trying to run underwater compared to running on a low-gravity moon. But the humans were not so interested in the drives, and instead wanted the information on how they were manufactured. We tried to explain that they needed to expand their industry far past where they were to even come close to what was required to make point drives. But they still insisted on one diplomat saying, Just sell them to us, and if we cannot do it... We'll have to come back to buy them from you, so I don't see why you have a problem with this. So we all agreed to sell the data on how to make point drives along with a handful of drives to retrofit in their current ships. We soon learned that humans are very good at mining and resource extraction, as our trade and soon became an impressive trading partner for such a new people. Along with the usual things that they were buying, they bought many point drives from us, and we all but forgot about we ever sold the basic instructions on how to make them. Then the truly unexpected happened. The human diplomat invited some of the other species to see the newest breakthrough. I was no engineer, but even I could see that it was abomination of a point drive. But it worked. It was almost one third bigger than the standard drive, and as some engineers we brought pointed out, was 4% slower and 5% less fuel efficient than average. Despite all of this, the ambassador and the crew of the ship were beaming with pride, and we could not deny that it was impressive that a species with now just three solar systems had managed to reduce a functioning point drive. About a month later, we would learn that they had already specialized their drive. When the first reports started coming in from our traders working with humans, we did not take a single word as more than shock trader trying to get through the shock of a narrow escape. These reports were all pertaining to pirate attacks and how, when the pirates targeted, then got a good hit on the human drives to disable them was a common practice for pirates. They were still able to jump away. No one on the council thought that this was true. But as we asked the ambassador, and he said, Yes, that's all true. Give me a couple days and I can show you. True to his word, a couple of days later, a smoking trade ship docked with a station that served as a confederation meeting place. We then were invited on board this obviously damaged ship. The captain introduced themselves and explained that they just got away from a group of pirates and headed there as the ambassador's request. When we got to the engine room, I think one of the Zarek engineers who was accompanying me nearly passed out. To our left was what was obviously a hull breach patched with void foam. In front of us was one of the human-built FTL drives with a massive hole in the side. The captain introduced us to the head engineer, who elaborated that they had got hit with a railgun and the slug was still in the FTL drive. True to her word, 
you could still see the glowing lump of slag and the projectile in the hole. The engineer also went on to tell us that they were submitting a complaint with the drive's manufacturer as they lost 40% efficiency after the strike, but the manufacturer said that they would lose only 30%. What kind of insanity is that their biggest problem is 10% less efficiency when they still had a smoking hole in the side of their FTL drive? End of story. Story number two. The safest mode of galactic travel. Written by Dynama R. The MC walks from backstage. Applause. Welcome, welcome. Tonight I want to tell you about the latest, newest, and safest way to travel in the galaxy. Applause. Now, as you know, space is a very dangerous place. So vast and cold standard ships could not generate enough heat to stay warm. Up to 30% of travelers would succumb to the freezing temperatures. That all changed when we found the humans. Applause. Because of energy required to leave a planet, all life that has been encountered in space has been small. The humans are huge. We will not discuss the crazy things that they do to get off their planet. Laughed. Because of their ship, their ships have to be huge, and as such, they have to have large engines that generate lots of heat. Since they took over the space travel in the galaxy, there have been no deaths from freezing, but space is still a dangerous place. Micrometeorites, spontaneous black holes, solar bursts, and cosmic strings, just to name a few. The MC takes a drink of liquid, allowing the last remark to sink in and increase the attention the audience will give his next words. But we now introduce you to the safest way to travel. Do not just travel in a human ship, but travel inside a human ship, in a human ship. That's right, you will be given your very own luxury pod full of amenities to keep you occupied on your voyage. Very spacious, 3 millimeters long by 1.5 millimeters wide, for just a little more, we can upgrade you to a larger size of 5 millimeters. That includes a servant to cook and clean for you. Applause. Your part will be injected into a human just under the skin in a fatty layer of tissue. It will provide a constant environment to make your trip as comfortable as possible. Should there be an accident during your travels, being inside a human increases the likelihood of your survival by one Thousand percent! Laws. As you know, humans are from a death world, and they are capable of surviving in the harshest of environments. Being inside a human gives you a level of safety that you cannot get from any machine. Their ability to generate heat, to cool down and survive in the conditions that would kill most intelligent life. Make them the ideal carrier. Applause. And if you want more added protection, just for a few more credits, you can be injected into a human called a Marine. They are trained to survive things other humans would succumb to and can guarantee your safe arrival. Applause. Now, make sure you ask for the subdermal human interstellar travel system when you book your next travel plans and have the safest trip in the galaxy. Applause. The viewer's screen changes to a company name along with an acronym for the newest, most popular way to travel. Galactic Alliance Shuttle Systems, the SHITS. End of story. Story number one. Their specialization, written by Cobalt Sky. It is thought that the most advanced piece and tech that civilization makes is good representation of them. And for the three major races in the Galactic Confederation, that technology was a specialized version of an FTL drive, starting with the sharp-minded Nivlans, who themselves were a cliff-dwelling species that by galactic standards are small, around 50% smaller than average, and thus much of their technology represents that. When the Nivlans reached prominence in the stars and developed an FTL drive, they optimized for size. Compared to the other two dominant species, it is almost a fourth the size without any loss of power. This allows ships equipped with their drive to be smaller, or more likely repurposed to left over room for some things like cargo or luxury cabins. Then there are the Zarok, 
who have a whole world with lots of space, but very little in the way of useful resources. There are many barren graven fields of little more than limestone and harsh mountains on their home. Thus, they needed to make every ounce of iron and other elements count. This almost zealot-like efficiency is proudly on display in their FTL. The Zarak drive can travel the same distance as others, but with about two-thirds the fuel. That may not seem like much, but when you are talking millions of tons of metallic hydrogen to move a bulk cargo liner, that is an astronomical savings. And then my people, the Yelves, who have a whole world covered in large open grasslands and is also home to the massive avian predator, due to this threat, we grew to be extremely fast sprinters, so that our ancestors could dart back to the burrows before getting snatched into the purple sky. So, when we took over that sky, our ancestors feared that we put our speed into our drives. Our drives are on average 10 to 15% faster than other models. This is awesome for smaller transports and passenger vessels, as well as valuable cargo as it limits the amount of time, but it might be intercepted. There are a handful of space-bound peoples, but many of them are not yet at the point of developing their own specialized FTL. And for the time, all are more than happy to use the models that the three major races are offering. Then, just 65 cycles back, our community met the humans. They were odd, but not too weird. When we discovered them, they had spread out through their home system and had a small foothold in the next star system over. As expected, they were still using skipper drives, which are simpler to discover, but far less useful and flexible to the point drives that are the standard for FTL. Both contact went extremely well, and besides, a bit of shock from the historians about the human past, when that was cleared up and with the hesitant go-ahead from the historians, they were invited to our little confederation. Things started to get interesting when we offered to sell them point drives for their ships. You see, most species before them that were offered the drives were overjoyed and more than happy to buy them. I mean, why would they not be? The difference between the two was like trying to run underwater compared to running on a low-gravity moon. But the humans were not so interested in the drives and instead wanted the information on how they were manufactured. We tried to explain that they needed to expand their industry far past where they were to even come close to what was required to make point drives. But they still insisted on one diplomat saying, Just sell them to us and if we cannot do it... We'll have to come back to buy them from you, so I don't see why you have a problem with this. So we all agreed to sell the data on how to make point drives along with a handful of drives to retrofit in their current ships. We soon learned that humans are very good at mining and resource extraction, as our trade and soon became an impressive trading partner for such a new people. Along with the usual things that they were buying, they bought many point drives from us, and we all but forgot about we ever sold the basic instructions on how to make them. Then the truly unexpected happened. The human diplomat invited some of the other species to see the newest breakthrough. I was no engineer, but even I could see that it was abomination of a point drive. But it worked. It was almost one third bigger than the standard drive, and as some engineers we brought pointed out, was 4% slower and 5% less fuel efficient than average. Despite all of this, the ambassador and the crew of the ship were beaming with pride, and we could not deny that it was impressive that a species with now just three solar systems had managed to produce a functioning point drive. About a month later, we would learn that they had already specialized their drive. When the first reports started coming in from our traders working with humans, we did not take a single word as more than shock trader trying to get through the shock of a narrow escape. These reports were all pertaining to pirate attacks and how, when the pirates targeted, then got a good hit on the human drives to disable them was a common practice for pirates. They were still able to jump away. No one on the council thought that this was true. But as we asked the ambassador, and he said, Yes, that's all true. Give me a couple of days and I can show you. True to his word, a couple of days later, a smoking trade ship docked with a station that served as a confederation meeting place. We then were invited on board this obviously damaged ship. The captain introduced themselves and explained that they just got away from a group of pirates and headed there as the ambassador's request. 
When we got to the engine room, I think one of the Zarek engineers who was accompanying me nearly passed out. To our left was what was obviously a hull breach patched with void foam. In front of us was one of the human-built FTL drives with a massive hole in the side. The captain introduced us to the head engineer who elaborated that they had got hit with a railgun and the slug was still in the FTL drive. True to her word, you could still see the glowing lump of slag and the projectile in the hull. The engineer also went on to tell us that they were submitting a complaint with the drive's manufacturer as they lost 40% efficiency after the strike, but the manufacturer said that they would lose only 30%. What kind of insanity is that their biggest problem is 10% less efficiency when they still had a smoking hole in the side of their FTL drive? End of story. Story number two. The safest mode of galactic travel. Written by Dinah Ma'ar. The MC walks from backstage. Applause. Welcome, welcome. Tonight I want to tell you about the latest, newest, and safest way to travel in the galaxy. Applause. Now, as you know, space is a very dangerous place. So vast and cold, standard ships could not generate enough heat to stay warm. Up to 30% of travelers would succumb to the freezing temperatures. That all changed when we found the humans. Applause. Because of energy required to leave a planet, all life that has been encountered in space has been small. The humans are huge. We will not discuss the crazy things that they do to get off their planet. Not. Because of their ship, their ships have to be huge. And as such, they have to have large engines that generate lots of heat. Since they took over the space travel in the galaxy, there have been no deaths from freezing. But space is still a dangerous place. Micrometeorites, spontaneous black holes, solar bursts, and cosmic strings, just to name a few. The MC takes a drink of liquid, allowing the last remark to sink in and increase the attention the audience will give his next words. But we now introduce you to the safest way to travel. Do not just travel in a human ship, but travel inside a human ship, in a human ship. That's right, you will be given your very own luxury pod full of amenities to keep you occupied on your voyage. Very spacious, 3 millimeters long by 1.5 millimeters wide. For just a little more, we can upgrade you to a larger size of 5 millimeters. That includes a servant to cook and clean for you. Applause. Your pot will be injected into a human just under the skin in a fatty layer of tissue. It will provide a constant environment to make your trip as comfortable as possible. Should there be an accident during your travels, being inside a human increases the likelihood of your survival by 1000%. Applause. As you know, humans are from a death world, and they are capable of surviving in the harshest of environments. Being inside a human gives you a level of safety that you cannot get from any machine. Their ability to generate heat, to cool down and survive in the conditions that would kill most intelligent life. Make them the ideal carrier. Applause. And if you want more added protection, just for a few more credits, you can be injected into a human called a Marine. They are trained to survive things other humans would succumb to and can guarantee your safe arrival. Applause. Now, make sure you ask for the subdermal human interstellar travel system when you book your next travel plans and have the safest trip in the galaxy. Applause. The viewer's screen changes to a company name along with an acronym for the newest, most popular way to travel. Galactic Alliance Shuttle Systems, the SHITS. End of story. Cleaners, written by Yoshi Man. Sunlight. It was an alien feeding to Borno, who'd spent so much time outside the already crater complex under the dark amalgamations of radioactive debris and viral spores that had enveloped Typhon skies for the past century. He felt an environmental frame spin up its temperature control systems, feeling the freezing coolant pass through his undersuit 
as the raw sunlight, unfiltered by the ozone layer long since dissipated to nuclear fire, began to sear his frame. Yet the temperature to him felt almost like bliss. It must have been 70 degrees Celsius outside his frame, a refreshing temperature in comparison to the boiling and freezing extremes that regularly subsumed the crater. Yet, he couldn't waste time bathing in the sun. He still had so much to do before he was meant to leave. As he hurried down the path as best he could, in his clunky frame, he noticed a group of humans around the hillside drone port, preparing to unload one of the larger armored cargo drones that had just arrived from orbit. He saw one of the humans rigged in a larger frame, more akin to an exoskeleton, grab a power washer. They then proceeded to wipe down the drone, ridding it of any residual radioactive fallout the drone may have caught during its re-entry. They were well equipped in similar environmental gear that Bruno wore, yet adorned with the recognizable symbol of their organization, a dark green circle with a tree emanating in the center. Gaia's Directive. That's what the name he'd been plastered around their facilities and gear. They had no clue what it actually meant, yet they never seemed to acknowledge the name, using it only on official documents and reports. Instead, they referred to themselves by another name. Cleaners. Excuse me, I'm looking for Rosa Fornetta. Any of you guys seen her? He called out to the band of humans on his frame speaker. Oh, uh, she's a bit down from the hillside. One of the humans called out, equipped in a bulky matte white environmental frame. They pointed at a recently installed drone hangar further down the hill where a group of humans seemed to be in the middle of a discussion near several large hexapedal automatons. She's just talking to the techs about getting her echo bots to scrounge up the fallout around here. They should be finishing up now. Thank you. Borno called out to the human, waving a goodbye as he started to walk down the metal stairs that had only recently been installed against the hard basalt stone that made up the crater. He took another glance at the small patch of sunshine, where the light grey haze of the upper atmosphere could be seen. Yet, as he gazed at the rapturous sight above, he also made out a few faint shining silhouettes. At first, he thought that it was just graphite particles in the air, sparkling against the sun's rays. Yet, as he magnified his visor at the phenomenon, he suddenly realized what he was seeing. There were hundreds of them, if not thousands, coursing in the chaotic stream above Typhon's atmosphere. It suddenly connected with him. They were terraforming satellites, massive kilometer-sized instruments dedicated to reversing the decay of Typhon's once habitable atmosphere. Instruments must have led to the small patch of sunlight on this dead world. And it hasn't even been a year yet, Borno thought. Twenty years at the complex and the best he'd done as a director was stem the radioactive pollutants gushing from the ancient crumbling reactors and find the remaining seed bolts on Typhon's extinct flora and fauna. And here the humans were, showing him up, accomplishing something he hadn't done in only a year. Not that he minded it. They were truly mad for trying to tame Typhon. The fact that they were doing it charge-free made Borno a bit suspicious but it seemed those in office didn't care. Probably more interested in securing the next election than paying attention to extra solar security. It didn't change the fact that the humans were starting to make serious developments. Just a kilometer beyond him stood a near-complete skeleton for a terraforming plant. It was an ugly thing to look at, made out of prefabricated paneling, 3D-printed scaffolding, and copious amounts of ferrocrete with numerous bulking wires and tubing lining its superstructure. Its contents made up with its hideous nature, four gigawatts worth of molten salt reactors, monstrosities in their own right, set to power the nascent rings of the air scrubbers around the crater, dedicated to pulling in radioactive debris and pumping it back into the plant, where the air would be purified, then transformed into ozone, which would then be discharged high into the stratosphere. It was meant to be the first step towards healing Typhon back to its once pristine state, though by itself it wouldn't have any impact on healing the planet. 
That's why the humans were planning to build thousands of terraforming plants across the planet, and they had just set up a baseline capability to start mass-producing these engineering monstrosities. Hello, Borna yelled out to the group, facing down the shoddy concrete path leading to the hangar. I is there a Rosa Fonetta here? That would be me, one of the bulky figures responded, being noticeably smaller than both him and the surrounding humans. The figure seemed to be at the top of the command chain, with a frame expressing her rank of director, like himself. Borno finished walking down the hillside paving and made his way towards the humans. Apologies for the interruption, but my frame's radio system broke down when I was coming back from the seed vault in Kilnu. I just need to have a quick word with you. No, it's fine. I was just finishing here anyway. The lead human responded, calmly signaling the other humans away. All right, well, uh, Rosa, uh, can I call you that? Feel free. No need for formalities here. Her voice suddenly became crisp as he heard his frame notify him of an audio connection between the two frames. Well, first of all, here's the data drive in question, Borno began, handing over the old drive strapped onto his side. We were able to scrounge it up alongside the last batch of samples from the vault. It has all the old climatology models and data from Typhon's healthier days. There's some round 100 or so report outlining the planetary carbon cycle, point of key, ecological focus, atmospheric weather phenomena, and more. Everything you guys might need in trying to tame Typhon. Hate. Director Borno, if I remember. She pondered, taking the data drive and magnetically locking it to her frame's thigh. He quickly realized that the humans had no way of really knowing who they were talking to, as his crew didn't have any official insignia to determine rank or status. Borno chuckled as the rather small human gave him an inquisitive gaze, her pale facial features made clear through the transparent visor that she wore. That's me, though the director title won't be there much longer. Oh, no. Oh, before I forget here, Borno continued, searching in one of the frame's protective pockets before he fetched out a small USB stick. You're going to want to relay that to your guys' robots. One of your IT guys told me to give it to you, seeing how you're the only one with full administrative clearance. Supposedly, it's meant to allow them to detect viral spore growth and stuff, reducing both the risk of viral exposure and something like that. Oh, thank you, she said, immediately plugging in the USB's contents into a frame before any radioactive elements could affect its stored information. Still, uh, why the emotion? It's no emotion, he said, smiling upon seeing the concerned demeanor of the human, though not sure if she could see him through the worn-out visor. Set to leave in just a few days, apparently to supervise a para-terraforming job on one of the dwarf planets. Rosa peeked her head. Leaving so soon? She puzzlingly asked. We haven't even gotten started on the real work yet. Of course, this wasn't real work to them. As if setting up a colony-sized industrial base on a hellish rock like Typhon in only a year wasn't or some sort of phenomenal accomplishment. There wasn't even mentioning everything that they'd done in orbit. He'd seen the images, entire fleets worth of orbital constructions assembling vast orbital shades and terraforming satellites. All of this in a year, and the humans had been planning this project to take centuries. Just the thought of it gave Borno a warm feeling inside. Perhaps life might return to this planet one day. It's not just me, he replied, backtracking from his thoughts. The entire site is being transferred to you guys as per the agreement, meaning that my crew is going to be dissolved, taking us and our own lonesome ways across the system. He felt his frame slowly start to warm up, pulling out a coolant while having the internal radiator start warming his undersuit. His frame, red off that cold front, was meant to be blowing in soon, with a chill of minus 34 degrees, with a high of concentrated viral spores. Oh, Rosa mumbled, a hint of disappointment in her voice. I was under the impression that you guys would be working alongside us for the long term, especially considering all the help that you've given us in this year alone. The truth is that we were meant to leave three weeks after you guys officially got the go-ahead on terraforming this husk. The thing is, I've continuously extended the deadline, he explained. Couldn't just let you folk waste years just to get where we were. Oh, Rosa's eyebrows peaked in surprise. Well, thanks. You guys have been a great help. Though uh, I'm surprised you got your crew to go along with the extensions. 
Borno smiled. Typhon's a radioactive dumpster fire, but a lot of us have our ancestry here, including myself. Uh, we all want to see this place healed. Not everyone was willing to spend just a bit more time here to set you guys up with the best chance of seeing that vision through. So, um, you were born here? Oh, souls no, he started, turning his view away from Rose's frame to gaze at the scorched wasteland beyond the complex. I was born in a makeshift orbital a few years after Typhon's demise, an orbital manufacturing platform turned refugee center. Parents were one of the lucky few that were able to catch the last shuttles out before things escalated to thermonuclear war. As a kid, they would always tell me stories about Typhon. The stuff of fantasy and history. Stories about the great sky bison that once roamed across the sky. Or the tales of the first explorers and Typhon and their magical discoveries. Sometimes, I would spend hours looking at Typhon, either through external cameras or old-school glass windows, dreaming about the stories my parents had told me and thinking, what if we could go back? So is everyone else like you, wanting to stay in their ancestral homeland? Rose a question. Ancestral homeland. The wording had his eyes roam across the barren rock and soil, looking at the various old electrical pylons, roads, and buildings whose remains still stood strong, even under the century-long siege by the harsh elements. Remnants of a world long since past to nuclear fire. Well, kind of. Most people are like me, having some sort of inclination towards Typhon, Berno said with a hint of pride. Makes sense when you think about it. For every year a person stays on Typhon, it's said that they lose four years of their life. Is it true? Maybe. Typhon has racked up quite a, the reputation over the years. Even then, it is rumored like that which led people to never accept a posting on Typhon. Except people like me. It's just when you know what this planet was once like, because... Well, I can't really explain it in words. But you just find yourself uh, naturally attracted to her. Rosa gave a nodding gesture. I feel you. Always odd people like us who take on these tasks. I wouldn't say odd people, he chuckled. More like people who long for the past. Well, you should try and stick around just a little while longer. We're having a party at the terraforming plant at the end of the week. Popping open the bottles for a year's worth of work well done. It would be a damn shame if you guys weren't present. The help you guys have given us has easily shaped decades in planning and research alone. Borna felt a slight burn in his heart, knowing that he would be leaving Typhon, his work, and all the people he'd come to call friends. I'd love to do that, really, he said chuckling. The only issue is that if I delay our move one more time, I might actually get fired this time, for real. Why not join us then? She bluntly suggested, her blue eyes giving him a genuine look. You mean join you guys, uh, uh, like your organization? Yes. It's obvious that you and your crew are dedicated to Typhon. The fact that you've been putting off a transfer for a year now already shows that. Plus, you didn't seem so enthusiastic about the para-terraforming gig. So, uh, why not join us? Well, out of everything he had expected before today, a job offer was not one of them. It wasn't to say that he wasn't interested in the human's proposal. He made a hefty amount as a site director, especially with those juicy hazard pay bonuses. Come on, Rosa said naggingly, her frame's posture becoming more casual. It's clear that you see Typhon as your home, and wouldn't you like to see your childhood dream through? The return of this place back to its glory days. He hung his head down for a second of contemplation, trying to evaluate his own feelings towards the idea of staying on Typhon. Look, us humans have a saying, home is where the heart is. You treat Typhon as your home because it's where your heart is tied the most to. The effort you've already put in to this entire operation says enough about it. Your childhood had you immerse yourself in stories, tales of people and cultures who called Typhon their home. And through this, you became a surrogate of Typhon itself, whether you knew it or not. I mean, I, I, I never really saw you seen myself as a person of Typhon. Then what do you think of yourself as? The question hit Borno like a hard rock. It was one of those questions that he and his crew would always subconsciously ignore, because in their eyes, they were all kin 
and Kin never questioned the fundamentals of home and belonging. The orbital he'd once been born in had been decommissioned only seven years after he was born. Otherwise, he had lived across the belt as a teenager, going from cozy little asteroid habitat to massive protoplanet-sized refinery stations. Yet, he never really thought of himself as one of them, never embraced the culture, the dialect, or even the language. In the end, he'd always drifted back to Typhon, one way or another, just like his parents. Rosa looked at him with a gaze of sympathy. You're not sure, are you? He wasn't sure if it was his visor or his body language that had made it seem so obvious to her. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized that he honestly had no clue what he really was. Let me ask you another question then. Do you really want to leave this planet? The answer was already evident to both of them, but it was clear that Rosa just wanted him to say it. No. No, no, I don't, he admitted. But, uh... I have to leave if I want to survive any longer. It was once the cold realities of working in environments as hazardous as Typhon. Technology wasn't perfect. Sometimes it was material fatigue that got you killed. Other times it was tiny millimeter-sized scrapes and cuts that sent people to the grave. No matter how much time you put into maintaining your frame, being cautious on where you stepped or limiting your exposure to the fallout, it was only a matter of time before the planet consumed you. No amount of iodine pills and antiviral medication would stop that. Every year, somebody would die. Their bodies burned and their frames buried outside the complex, each entombed within the empty visor marking their graves. And he'd seen the same with humans. Graves slowly started to emerge outside the temporary hab complexes they had established on the other side of the crater. So what? The response felt like a mental kick in the knee. Well, that's a frank way to respond, he slowly muttered. Rosa seemed honestly surprised at how he was taken aback by the statement. What's the deal? We work in a toxic, radioactive hellscape. Death is a risk that we take with every step we take. Why are you all of a sudden scared of your own mortality? The threat of death should be no reason to stop the work that we're doing here. No, 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 it's just not that. I'm not afraid of death, he expressed with a growing strain in his throat. The fact that I've stuck it out here for 20 years should be evidence of that. It's just, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, I, uh, I want to die having accomplished something, he finally croaked. Have my legacy be more than just a footnote, you, you know? He gazed out at the encroaching fog, breezing through the mountain and valleys, slowly advancing towards the outer ring of the air scrubbers. 20 years of work here, and uh, uh, nothing has changed. The soil is still dead, the air is still poison, and the sky still lays black. There was an intermittent moment of silence between the two, as they both gazed at the fog from afar. I know progress is a fickle thing, Borna continued, but it's going to take decades before we see even the slightest sign of progress, and by that time my luck will have run out, leaving me to join my comrades in the soil below. Might as well try and get something to my legacy. To have a few geoengineering and terraforming projects imbued with my name on them so that someday someone will look upon my work and know that I existed. When you put it like that, I can see where you're coming from, Rosa replied, a palpable sense of compassion in her voice. The task that you and I have taken upon ourselves is that of moving mountains. To measure our progress through superficial looks alone doesn't reflect the task at hand. Rather, Look at the consistency of which we strive forwards in this colossal undertaking of ours. Still, I want to be remembered, have something to my name, some place in history. You and I, we are history, written in the fabric through flesh and bone, Rosa pronounced in a stoic voice, filled with a zealous determination that he hadn't expected from her. We shape this world for those who will come after us, to be a cradle for children that we will never see or hear. She gestured out to the wasteland beyond, as if she was some prophet presenting her followers paradise. There was a charismatic way in which she talked, like that of a politician, conviction radiating from her form that seemed to rival the sun in radiance. Still, the zenitry of which she spoke had Borno suppress a chuckle at the vision of it all. 
That's a bit grandiose, don't you think? Look above, all the way up, at the sky, Rosa said, evidently ignoring his comment as she pointed towards a small gap of light that still pierced through the choking black clouds. The storm abates, and the dust settles through the collective sweat, blood and tears. He heard his frame slowly rigging off warnings about rising background radiation and spore concentration in the air, turning him to seek shelter. Yet, he ignored it, savoring every second as he bathed in the sun's embrace. The sun, doesn't it look wonderful? He and his eyes focused on the cobalt shine of the sun's rays, admiring its brief appearance in the sky above. Yeah, it's definitely something I can get used to. But think of what it stands for, Rosa remarked, her visor turning an accent of chrome as she stared at the open patch of light. A flare in the dark, a sign of hope, that one day the light will breach across the veil of darkness that was shrouded this banner for too long. Through the combined labor of generations, this will be achieved. The words resonated with him, giving his heart a rhythmic beat he hadn't felt for some time. The idea of working towards something greater. The dream of a legacy that would span generations. It started to feel like her conviction alone was enough to move mountains. It still sounded a bit fantastical, like some overpromised visionary who could speak but not act. Being a bit zealous, don't you think? It seemed as if Rosa had just realized the tone of her ramblings, as the zealous conviction that filled her face slowly started to dissipate. A bit, yeah she chuckled. But when your family's been striving towards the same thing for generations, the mythos of it all starts to get to you. Same thing? As in Typhon? No, not that. Typhon will be my goal, yes, yet. It will only serve to pave the way for the final project. It took Borno a few seconds to connect the dots before he realized what she meant. He didn't know much about human history, but everyone knew about Earth. You honestly think that it can be done? I've seen the videos of it. It makes Typhon seem like a paradise in comparison to it. There was a sorrowful smile on Rose's face. My father was a cleaner, just like me, purifying worlds so that the children could one day play in the groves planted by the likes of us. His father was the same, and so was his father before that, all in the goal of one day stepping back on the soil that made us who we are, the dream that one day children would breathe on a green earth. Only then... Will the bones of our forefathers rest satisfied that their sacrifice was not in vain? There was a weight, in her words, the weight of generations worth of lives dedicated to one dream, one goal. Typhon is an opportunity for us all, she continued, her voice radiating a sense of determination and conviction, an opportunity to rectify a monumental folly of a generation past for all to see to show that even worlds as lost as Typhon can be cleaned and healed. It's opportunities like this that help us grow through experience and knowledge, and through the work that's done here will allow our descendants to push ever further in the dream of a green earth. That will be my legacy, a legacy engraved into the very history of Earth itself. That's one philosophical way to say it, Mona remarked with a smile. I'm starting to see your point. You and I are both cleaners, as you humans love to put it. We work for different organizations, yet in the end we seek to wipe our ancestors' debt, to relive what has not been lived for centuries. Rosa grinned as she finished talking, poetically said, even if you just copied what I said beforehand, maybe. Or maybe I'm just starting to get it now, he playfully retorted. There was a brief moment of silence as they both reflected on each other's words before Rosa turned towards him and placed her frame's bulky hand on his shoulder. My offer. Go give it a thought. Talk it over with your crew. I'm in Hab 4 if you ever want to talk about it more. She patted him on the shoulder, the audible hydraulics of her frame marking each step as she headed back towards the confines of the drone hangar, leaving him all by himself, watching as the dark clouds slowly started to envelop the last open patches of light. Cleaners! The word was starting to resonate with him. It was one thing to terraform or geoengineer a world, yet to clean it was a whole other task. It had him look at the left corner of his visor, where a tape picture sat. It wasn't something people could notice when they looked at him and his visor. 
but he always found himself gazing at it from time to time. It was a worn-out picture of a beautiful crimson forest, that of an ancient grove filled with a breathtaking flora that seemed almost dreamlike in its design. In the foreground of the picture stood two people, both smiling as they stood in a surreal aura of the forest. The founders of the Areli Crater Complex. His mother and father, the first cleaners of Typhon. One day, he quietly whispered. One day. End of story. Story number one. Explosive Problem Solving, written by Average Cake Enjoyer. Jonathan sat at his workbench, tinkering with the next iteration of the Face Melter 5000 TM, as sparks flew off the exposed wires. Trying to force open a panel with a screwdriver, he manages to pry it open, but not before the screwdriver he used to pry it open snags a loose wire, breaking it. The wire wasn't for anything important, right? Probably not. Jonathan shrugged to himself as he went back to fiddle with the jumble of wiring and electronics in the drone. Well, that is until the drone he was working on started beeping. A red LED flashing from within, giving it an ominous glow. Huh. Well, uh, well, that's not normal. He barely had the time to slap one of the palms over his eyes before the drone exploded non-violently. Well, as non-violently as an explosion could be. Peeling his palm off of his face, he tentatively opens one of his eyes, only to be greeted by the sight of a newly made pile of scrap in front of him. That's unfortunate, he thought to himself, as he gave the broken drone a few experimental pokes with his screwdriver. He stared wide-eyed at the pile in front of him, mulling over the rapid, unintentional disassembly of a drone and how he could improve the patent-pending face-maker 5000 TM in the future. He nearly just lost himself in his thoughts before one of his colleagues, Flob, waltzes through the door. Human Jonathan, are you in here? One of the toilets in Block C is uh, broken. Whatever words were about to come out of Flob's mouth died in her throat. A chocked sound, resembling a muffled laugh escaping instead as Jonathan stared at her owlishly. The imprint of her hand where his eyes were acting as an island in the sea of black that his face was. Are you <laughs> uh, a bit busy right now? She said, mirth evident in her shaking voice as she tried to not burst out into another fit of laughter. Not anymore. My poor baby decided to go rogue and self-destruct her. And well, that's in the past. He swiped an arm across his workbench, sending the remains of the drone to the floor. What do you need me for? Oh, um, uh, oh that, that's right. One of the uh, toilets is blocked and the plungers aren't working, so I thought maybe you could... Uh, she asked, pointing a tentacle outside. Oh, that, that's it. Uh, uh, give, give me a second. Opening one of the drawers on his workbench, he pulled out a red sphere with a piece of string sticking out of it with a lighter before following her out. All right, lead me to it. So, um, human... What have you got in your hands? She said as they walked. Uh, he gave her a non-committal shrug. Uh, the solution. Flop decided not to think too hard about Jonathan's ominous answer, and she continued to lead him to their destination. It wasn't long after when they finally reached the bastardly toilet in question, the murky water in the bowl slightly too high to be normal. Jesus, Mary and Joseph... What in the feck did you guys do to the stick? Jonathan said, pinching his nose as he stared into the brown abyss. Truthfully, I don't really know. All I know is that I saw a friend Kayala stumble out of here mumbling something about the Mexican food. Jonathan could only give her a solemn nod, giving the poor soul a quick prayer in his head. Poor bastard! He didn't deserve that. He did seem a bit pale. Hopefully, they're okay now. They'll be feeling it for a while, unfortunately, he said, giving her a comforting pat on the back before he took the ball and lighter. Guess it's time to fix this. I really hope this is a good toilet bowl. Lighting the string on fire, he tossed the red ball into the water as he slammed the toilet lid down, 
sitting on top of it before quickly pulling Flop into his lap, eliciting an eep from her as he slammed his palms over her ears. What in the seven hells are you doing? Flop asked warily. Cherry bomb, cherry, what? She only received a devious grin as an answer to her question before a muffled crack of thunder flooded the bathroom. Jonathan letting out a whoop of joy as the lid rumbled beneath him. Flob, on the other hand, could only squeal in surprise as she and Jonathan became unwilling participants in an impromptu testing of Newton's third law. The force of the explosion forced the blockage clear, but not before also sending Flob and Jonathan flying a foot or so into the air, careening into the far end of the bathroom. They slammed right into the wall, both of them letting out a subdued oof as they slid down, quickly becoming acquainted with the cold tiding of the floor. Jonathan, being the human that he was, was the first on their fleet as he approached the toilet, the lid still somehow closed after that all had just happened. He opened the lid of the toilet, Flob only seeing him snort in laughter as a wisp of smoke left the toilet bowl. Curious, she scrambled onto her feet so that she could see the disaster that unfolded. Peeking over Jonathan's shoulder, she was the only met with the cleanest toilet bowl that she'd ever seen in her life. Apparently, whatever sorcery was in that red bowl had blasted the toy in it shiny and empty. The murky water now nowhere to be seen. What the fuck? Jonathan could only laugh in amusement at Flob's reaction. Well, I'll be damned. This is a good toilet. Reaching over, he gave the toilet an experimental flush, a smile forming on his face as he saw fresh water refill the bowl. All fixed. Another day, another problem solved, he said triumphantly, giving the now slack-jawed Flob a pat on the back as he left the toilet. If you need something solved, you know where to find me. Even after he was long gone, she was still frozen in the spot. An owlish look painted on her face as she stared at the now sparkling toilet. What the fuck? End of story. Story number two. Barbarians. Written by British Tea Company. There's always this border area with the Morven Imperium that's considered to be the worst place in the whole Imperium to be assigned to. The Fringe Zone, as named officially by mappers, and to the Death Quadrant as fondly nicknamed by anyone who passes in the area, was the arguably most dangerous sector of space. Even accounting for the contested zones between the Imperium's constant aggressive expansion and the attempts to reclaim territory for the Imperium regime. So, the Death Quadrant sounds like some super dangerous zone in space, probably proliferated by death clouds or spatial horrors, or maybe even cosmic hazards such as maelstroms or black holes. Well, the reason why the Morven think the Fringe Zone is a death sentence for anyone who wanders there is barbarians. Apparently, barbarians can cause the Great Morven Empire to all shudder in collective fright, which is rather strange, given the Imperium's insistence that everyone is a barbarian, and they are worthy master race. Now, while I don't want to justify their beliefs, the fact that they're the most powerful military force known in the galaxy does say one thing, and the fact that their technological advancement has progressed rapidly through the past centuries can say another. So this leads us back to the main question, what exactly is the fringe zone that's spooking the Morven people so much? Explorers have noted that space there is calm, a complete lack of anomalies, cosmic hazards, or deadly star-faring creatures. Leaked data from Morven scientists and astronauts indicate that the area of space over there has a lot of lush worlds, which by all rights should mean the Morven should be expanding in that direction, rather than this one. Well, the answer came just yesterday. The Morven Armada was stationed around a barren system on the lookout for barbarians when they detected gravitational anomalies at the edge of the system. Anyone who saw it had a good one second to look before an energy weapon with enough output to smite several dreadnoughts into ash and enough reach to accurately fire from afar end of the solar system 
tore apart several ships in rapid succession. The things that the Morven feared so greatly was a mammalian species known as humans. Their new weapon, the Sun Lance, was a product of human madness, which even the Morven engineering thought impossible. The ability to tame a star and weaponize should boggle enough minds today. Now, uh, before anyone asks any more questions, we should actually be thankful to the Morven Imperium is bordering these humans. By God, they are barbarians in every sense. The word. End of story. Swords to Plowshares, written by Hell's Kitchen Sink. I woke up to the smell of smoke. A figure stood over me, dark, slender, glowing red eyes, undifferentiated and vivid in the darkness of my apartment bedroom, stared at me. The figure was shaking slightly. Master, I... I burnt the eggs. I blinked a couple times. I stood up. Six million, four hundred fourteen thousand, six hundred and thirty-four. I shivered as I rested a hand on her shoulder. Her expression was still, cold, her stare a thousand yards away. She was shorter than me by nearly a foot, her body petite. It was meant to be. She was designed for infiltration and flexibility, for adaptation and for combat. I reached out and rested a hand on her short, bright white hair, and the shaking ceased. I want you to make you a special breakfast, to thank you for taking me in, but I let myself get distracted, and I, uh, burnt the eggs. I cleaned the pan, but there weren't any more eggs, and I softly squeezed her shoulder with my hand, and she went silent, her head lowered. It's okay. The thought is what counts. Let's make breakfast together, all right? I am supposed to do the job she said, looking up at me, the red eyes shining fiercely. There were two things meant to mark her out as not human, the red eyes and the bright white hair. The rest of her was beguilingly, almost tauntingly human. She was meant to pass for human when needed. The hair died, the eyes covered, but she didn't need to infiltrate anywhere anymore. There might be a handful of people who'd grow uncomfortable around an android, but they were a frequent part of life in the city. They helped her. And sometimes, they needed her. I smiled and softly pulled her close, hugging her. You're supposed to be enjoying retirement. It was a combination of two needs. There were jobs that required sapience, intelligence, and quickness of wit and thought that would be compared to a human. Combat was one of those jobs, particularly infiltration. These sapient constructs would, given time, become obsolete. Technology raced forward, and the tools and tactics they were trained in were rendered obsolete. They couldn't perform their jobs. If that were the only consideration, there might have been an unfortunate decision. They might have been discarded, destroyed, deleted, recycled, when they were no longer useful for the task. But sapient things also fought harder, longer, better, when they had something to fight for. Being programmed for simple obedience wasn't a feasible solution for programs designed to advance and adapt. They had to have something worth fighting for. So, they were retired. When an android was obsolete, it was decommissioned, weaponry removed, and given to someone willing to take it in. They were still machines, still programmed to take pleasure in service but a mental life of being able to fulfill simple, easy commands, surrounded by humans who cared about them, with little to no risk of pain or destruction. It was a solution. I reached out and rested my hand on the delicate golden watch that was fused to her wrist, the mark of retirement, some bureaucrat's idea of a joke. It suited her, though. It also told me that it was still a half an hour before sunrise. Come on, let's go make some sausages, okay? She nodded and looked out. I, uh, I do not need to eat. But you'd enjoy it, she nodded. Cool. We've got some oranges too, yeah? I stood by the griddle, letting the sausages sizzle and darken on that hot iron. There was still a small smoky scent to the air, and I opened a window, letting the city air pour in slowly. I slowly turned over one of the sausages, 
Well, 6,404,734 round oranges, squeezing the orange juice out. She was still dressed in a flat black jumpsuit, which had been her standard military garb. It had only been yesterday I'd taken her in, after all. Most retired androids fit in easily. After four to eight years of combat, they had a decent understanding of humans. They were capable of any task necessary, and they were usually well-adjusted. They didn't feel pain or suffering, the way most humans did. They were safe to be around, and they were happy for the chance to live out the remainder of their operational existence, being surrounded by people. But then, there were the others, like her. I needed a better name for her. Do you like Greek myth? I asked, as I set the sausage onto the plate. I perused it on occasion. I am familiar with the Greek creation myths and the cultural background. What part were you thinking of? I'm just trying to think of a good name for you. I was thinking of Galatia. She paused for a moment. The strange choice, superficially apt. The connection between a human and a statue he created. Pygmalion. But the narrative breaks down. Pygmalion did not desire woman out of trauma. Well, Galatia was his own creation, flawless and perfect. I am substantially flawed. She looked down at her hands, and they shook slightly. Ah, from perfect. I smiled and gently ruffled her hair. She leaned her head into it, her eyes closing as the shaking stuffed. I was just thinking of the numbers on your serial code. It seemed kind of fitting. She was entirely still for a moment, then nodded. It's a pretty name. I would like you to call me that. I smiled. Excellent. We need to get you some new clothes today. She reached out with her fingers tangled in the sleeve of my shirt, squeezing me gently. Her eyes lowered to the ground as she carried the pitcher of orange juice and the plate of sausages back to the table. The military officer hadn't talked about what exactly had traumatized her. It was hard to imagine what could damage someone built to be so strong, to the point that she'd been on the slate for decommissioning, to the point where she'd requested that she be decommissioned. The officer had told me it was classified, and that the full details had been kept to her. She wasn't fit, really. She couldn't live out of retirement she'd earned normally. The trauma could cause personality quirks, odd behavior, extreme emotional reactions, most people, given the choice, would simply prefer to take an android who wasn't going to be such a problem case. But the officer had been damned grateful that I'd volunteered to help her. Galatea sat next to me, just an inch or two away, so close she almost touched me, but not willing to take that last step. I rested an arm around her shoulder and pulled her against my side. She didn't resist, though she did stiffen slightly as her body pressed against mine. She was cool with a touch, but her body began to warm up, pressed against mine. Her breath let out in a slow, soft exhale. She didn't speak, but she seemed to be a bit more enthusiastic after that. You don't mind if I hold you, do you? I asked and smiled. She shook her head and leaned in a little bit closer, her eyes closed. I'd read a little bit about her operational history. Lots of classified work, lots of damage over the years, She'd been badly damaged more than a few times, but now, none of that showed on her, none of the scars. She took a deep breath, then leaned harder against me, placing her full weight by my side. I grunted involuntarily, and she began to straighten up before I pulled her back, giving her a gentle squeeze. She slowly lifted her arms up and began to hug me back. There was a desperation in the touch. She didn't squeeze hard. But the way she pressed to my side, burying her face in my shoulder, it spoke of someone terrified that she'd be pulled away at any second. I let her hold me like that for several long seconds. Eventually, her grip loosened, and she looked down at my plate, her face still cold. I'm sorry. I'm distracting you. Your food is getting cold. I'm not going to starve because you want a hug, I said, and then softly stroked her head again, she leaned into it for a moment, her eyes closed again, and began to eat her own food. When she finished, I carried the dishes to the sink and began to scrub them. She stood by her washing rack, and as each dish was handed to her, she began to wipe and clean with a cloth, setting it to dry in the rack. 
I was thinking that we could go to the mall later today. Get you some new clothes, get you out of that jumpsuit. I handed her one of the glasses. She stared at it, carefully wiping it, taking great care. I was thinking that we could get some lunch there too. They've got this great orange ch- There was a crash and a small spray of glass shrapnel. Galatia had gone stiff as a rock. Her hand clenched into a fist around the remnants of the glass. Her expression unfroze after barely a second, and she stared down at her fingers, blood trickling down her arm as I gently tugged her hand out. I'm... I'm sorry, Master. I... I broke. It's okay. Let's just get your hand fixed. I lead her to the bathroom, taking a pair of tweezers. She didn't feel pain from the gentle removing of the glass. The flesh already seeding up behind it, the synthetic mixture tougher, faster to repair than any human skin. Then she looked aside and saw a small cut across my arm, where one of the pieces of glass had scored me. I hardly a scratch, I said softly, stroking her head. It was an accident, and I'm not harmed. We all have accidents. She was very quiet as I finished removing the glass and added a little back teen to the cut on my own arm, covering it up with my shirt. The mall was an interesting experience for her. The bright glow of neon and the LCD screens filled the air, the rain hammering home against the glass ceiling, dark clouds filling the air above the city. She stayed very close to me, her eyes flicking from one monitor to another. You all right? I asked, my voice soft. We don't have to do this today. If you're not ready. No, it's not that. She reached out, her fingers tangling my sleeve, frowning. I'm just trying to make sure that you are safe. There are many people here. If they wished, they could harm you. I, uh... She shook her head and lowered her eyes. I... I'm behaving like a weapon. It's safe, I said and smiled. I won't deny that someone could pull something, but they're not going to. Come on, let's find a nice clothing store. She continued walking alongside me as we passed the shops. I was nearly pulled off my feet when she suddenly stopped, staring into the glass storefront. I raised an eyebrow. Are you sure? I gave an eye to the leather corset sitting in the window next to the cat ear's headband, a latex zentai, and a half a dozen other unusual items. She nodded quickly. All right, if you want. No, you wait here. I'll be quick. I do not want you to see what I buy. She lowered her head. Is that all right? I, I can pay for it all myself. Uh, my pension is substantial. Uh, of course, I smiled and watched as she dashed into the store. She returned less than two minutes later, clutching a large brown bag to her chest. Her head lowered. Find everything you wanted, I asked, and she nodded, her eyes on the ground. The clothing outlet was a calmer experience as the two of us shopped. She still favored the monochrome and exclusively chose cheap clothing, a set of black leggings and a handful of black shirts, things without much ornamentation. I paused for a moment as we went through another aisle, and she pointed out a set of black sneakers. You sure you don't want something more colorful? You don't have to go monochrome. It's, uh, um, uh, maybe next time, she said, still squeezing the paper bag to her chest. She looked away, and I grabbed a black ribbon from the wall as she did. I stepped behind her and stroked her hair for a moment before carefully tying it into a bow in her hair. She stiffened, but didn't fight for the movement. When I had finished, she turned, staring at a nearby mirror, and examined the ribbon, reaching her hand up to touch it gently. I, are you sure? This is, uh... She looked at the wall and flinched slightly at the price. It wasn't ruinously expensive but a natural silk ribbon was still pricey, even at a place like this. Ara, uh, are you sure? I, I don't wish for you to go through any hardship. It's okay. You're worth it, I smiled, and stroked her head behind the ribbon. I paid for the clothing for her, and though she protested, I insisted. The two of us went straight home instead of stopping for food. I wasn't sure one had triggered her flashback in the kitchen, but it was part of the learning about her. When we returned home, I was soaked to the bone by the rain and smiled. I'm going to go take a hot shower. After that, we can make lunch together. Is there anything you would like? She was quiet for a moment and looked down at the brown paper bag. She'd clutched it to her chest as we'd walked, keeping it dry. Uh, 
Nothing special, she murmured softly. I nodded and rubbed her hair, the rain already dripping out of it quickly, leaving it dry and smooth. I'd been standing in the hot shower for five minutes when I heard the door creak open. The shadow of Galatea's figure appeared against the shower curtain. I turned off the water and pulled it aside slightly. Ah, are you all right, Gala? The dress was attractive, gorgeous even. Black silks hung down her sides, cinched tight around her waist, exposing her pale shoulders and her arms. Gloves that started at the elbows ended at her knuckles, leaving the tips of her fingers bare. The tight black stockings around her legs gently bit into her thighs, outlining the shape. A few inches of pale skin were left visible between the bottom of the skirt and the top of the stockings. As she stood there, she was frozen still. What's this about, Galatea? I asked softly. She took a step closer. I want to be desirable. I'm not useful. I'm broken. I, I could not keep doing my job. I cannot be a good support for you. I'm a, a useless tool. She stared down at her hands and then withdrew a step. I'm sorry. I've been impertinent. I have been selfish. She shook her head. You are going to a great distance to simply provide me with second chance. And I cannot. I, I thought uh, I could be attractive. I could provide companionship, but if I were not careful, I, I would hurt you. I could. Her eyes flicked to my arm and the angry red mark where the cut had scabbed over. Give me a second to put pants on, would you? She paused for a moment. I'm just a machine master. You do not have to be bashful around me. I do not, uh, matter. You do matter to me, I smiled. Give me a moment's privacy, okay? And for a fraction of a moment, a smile crossed her face. Then she straightened and stepped out of the bathroom. A few moments later, I sat in the kitchen with her and took a moment to admire her. She really did look very good in the dress, the ribbon setting her in her hair providing a contrast. Do you mind if I look? I like it, she said, looking down. I like the feeling as though I am desirable, as though a human would want me. It makes me feel like I have some value. You've got a lot more value than that. You've done some amazing things. I've read about them. She was quiet for a moment. Is this about what happened? I killed a human, she said. I paused at this, slightly stunned. It was necessary. It was a consequence on a mission, and uh, I was cleared of any wrongdoing, but uh, during the extraction, my memory unit was damaged. I lost memory of it. I cannot remember why I killed him. Why I had to. Who he was. She stared down at her hands. I think of it sometimes. Create scenarios. Imagine what I did. Why I did it. But I could kill a human. I know that in my heart. I am faulty. Broken. I should have been decommissioned. But you are offering to help me. To f f fix me. She looked up. What if I can't be fixed? What if I am broken like this forever? That's okay, I said. Then do you want me like this? Do you like me helpless, dependent on you? Do you who want someone who will simply be broken forever? Her tone was not harsh or accusatory. She was just curious. I shrugged. I'll care about you, whether or not you are fixed. Why? There was a small silence in the room as she moved a hand over her mouth and her red eyes downcast. Because you worked hard and you sacrificed yourself. You deserve to be taken care of. I reached out and stroked her hair. She leaned into the hand and then stood up, sitting down next to me, her head pressed against my shoulder. What if I hurt you? People hurt each other, especially when they care. She was quiet for another moment. If I stop uh, being broken, will I have to leave you? No, definitely not. And you won't have to leave me even if you don't feel like you're fixed. We'll just take things one day at a time. All right, she nodded. Can, can I sleep in your room tonight? I paused for a moment and tried with all my might not to admire the cleavage that the dress was showing off as she leaned into my side. Um, sh sh sure. End of story. Terran Recreation Written by Average Cake Enjoyer when Scythine had accepted her dear friend Ishikawa's invitation for some human recreation, she readily jumped at his offer. 
How couldn't she? Everybody needed a hobby to enjoy, and for her, experiencing other species' cultures was a guilty pleasure. It was just so interesting. Not that she'd just gush about it out loud, though. She had a reputation as a Federation captain to protect, but seeing as she was off the clock, uh, a little indulgence now and then never hurt anyone. And it's not like anything could go wrong. The reputations humans had for being thrill-seeking lunatics must have been blood out of proportion, right? Just because they're a little unhinged when it comes to everything else doesn't mean that they can't enjoy their off time doing something peaceful. Or so she hoped. As they pulled up to their destination, a feeling of trepidation crept up to her back as she noted that they arrived at an airport. How strange. She reached over and tapped her friend on the shoulder. Friend Isakawa, well, uh, why, why are we here? Oh, uh, you know, we're just here for the flight. We get on, we get off, and we enjoy the view. He said with a smile. A smile that she'd seen on other humans when they were up to no good. Pushing away the ever-approaching feeling of foreboding, she opted to believe that they were only going to take a short flight to a nice, scenic destination. Oh, okay, uh, that sounds interesting. That's the spirit. Having found a spot, Ishikawa parked the car. Now let's go. Time waits for no one. Scythine sweat dropped. She tugged at the harness, tightening a few straps as she waited for Ishikawa to finish putting his own harness on. Finding nothing else to do while waiting, she pondered as to why she had to wear the harness for a quick flight and why she had to sign a uh, concerning amount of paperwork. Something's not adding up here. Before she could have any second thoughts, a pat on her shoulder pulled her out of her own thoughts. Turning around, she saw Isakawa in his own harness, a weird-looking backpack on his hands. Ishikawa looked her up and down. Looking good. Looks like you know how to put on a harness. I am your superior and a Federation captain. Of course I'd know how to put on a harness, she said, scoffing. I don't command a trillion credit vessel for nothing, you know. That's right. You signed my paychecks, he said with a click of his tongue. How about me? Harness looking good? After giving Ishikawa a quick once-over, she gave him an approving nod. So, friend Ishikawa, why are we wearing harnesses for a flight like this? And what's with the bag that you have? The harnesses are for our safety, and this... He gave the bag a little wiggle before leaning closer and whispering conspiratorially. This is a surprise tool that'll help us later. Scythine squinted at him, trying to find any sign of deception in his face. After finding none, she let out a deep sigh. She really hoped the view he promised would be worth it. Oh, but if it wasn't, and this whole thing was a disappointment, but she didn't want to be disrespectful. Hello, uh, done thinking, he said, waving a hand over eyes. Ishikawa to Scythine. Please respond. Huh? Oh, right. Um, 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 we should get going, she said as she walked away, still in a bit of a daze. That's my line. He pointed in the complete opposite direction of where she was going, and the hangar's over that way. She flushed a deep lilac. Like, oh, oh, uh, uh, lead the way. As Scythine entered the plane, a barrage of questions flooded her mind, such as, why was there a concerning lack of seats? Why were there people outside checking our harnesses? Was this really just a normal flight? What was in Ishikawa's bag? Why are we the only ones here? She shook her head, willing away any intruding thoughts, chalking it up to human eccentricity, as she sat in front of sitting Ishikawa. Are you having second thoughts? He asked. We can get off now if you like. No, it's just uh, that this all seems, uh, off. She replied hesitantly. I trust you, though. Uh, wrong answer. He mumbled under a cough. Huh? Uh, what was that? I said, take this and scooch a bit closer so that I can hook you up. He waved a pair of goggles and some earplugs in front of him. It's for your, uh, uh, safety? After taking the things he offered, she moved to sit closer to him, putting on the goggles and earplugs as Ishikawa fiddled with the buckles on his harness as he latched her to himself. Just as they finished preparations, they felt the plane rumble beneath them as the droning of the engines filled the cabin. Uh, it, it looks like they were finally getting out of here. 
Ishikawa clapped his hands and rubbed them together with glee. Can't wait! She eyed Ishikawa with suspicion, raising herself as she felt the aircraft lurch upwards as it took off. Sure, I don't regret this. She was definitely regretting this. Saitin really didn't know what was going to happen, but her fight or flight instincts were on full tilt. Her brain was working overtime, trying to figure out what was going on. The lack of seats, Ishikawa being far too excited for a flight, the harness. I swear I saw something about release of liability on one of those waivers. Things just weren't adding up and she really wasn't liking it. She tapped Ishikawa's leg, getting his attention. Friend, uh, Ishikawa, hmm? When do we get off? She asked, feeling a bit antsy to the touch solid ground. Soon, a wave of relief washed over. Oh, good. How soon? A loud ding cut through the droning of the engines and a green light popping up on the opposite end of the cabin. Before she could question what was happening, the door beside her slid open and a strong gust of wind crashing into them. That soon, her skin cycled through a rainbow of colors as she panicked. Close the door! Huh? What did you say? He asked, inching his way over to the open door, quickly finding himself sitting on the edge. Couldn't quite catch that. Ishikawa, so stop moving! She squealed, covering her eyes with her tentacles as she thrashed in her harness. I, I want to get off this plane, please! Get off the plane. Uh, that can be arranged. Uh, just look at me for a second. Reluctantly doing so, she opened her eyes to him, looking back at her with a maniacal smile. Better keep your eyes open. You really wouldn't want to miss this. What? She couldn't even finish her sentence before Ishikawa flung himself, and consequently her, out of the plane. Saitin could only open her mouth in a silent scream as her brain completely blanked, having been overwhelmed by the situation. The last thing she heard before passing out was the joyful whoop of her friend. The muted sounds of rushing wind was the first thing that she could register. Her mind still fuzzy as it rebooted itself. That was a weird dream. Prying her eyes open, she was greeted with the sight of the ground slowly inching its way towards her. She stared ahead blankly before she realized what was happening. Not a dream, not a dream. Hey, Carpenter, nice that you finally can join me, Ishikawa said from behind her. How do you enjoy the catnap? We're going to die. Oh my god, so we're going to die. Her skin started to cycle through all of the colors of the rainbow as she freaked out. Not like this, not like this. We're not going to die. Calm down, enjoy the ride, he said calmly, as if we weren't hurtling towards the ground. In a way, he was right. The view was amazing. The azure hue of the sky complementing the various shades of green beneath them, combined with the serene feeling of the wind rushing up past her. Oh, wait. She was falling fast. Back to screaming, I guess. Ah! The ground was getting closer. Saitin, now able to pick out individual buildings in the distance. This is it. This is how I die. Ishikawa chuckled at a panic. Hey, at least it'll be quick, right? You, you, you demon, she screamed, flailing in her harness. You no good heathen. I'll, I'll have your head. Whoa, whoa, calm down. Quit squirming. Or we're actually going to die. She slammed her eyes closed and made a silent prayer to her deities as the ground sped ever closer to her preparing for the inevitable. That was until she felt herself get violently jerked backwards, the sounds of wind disappearing in an instant. So, this is it. I died. Maybe I'll finally meet my brood mother in heaven. So long, world. A distant voice called out to her. Hey, uh, are you okay? Wake up. Is that Ishikawa? This isn't heaven. It's hell. What sins did I commit to deserve this cruel and unusual punishment? I can hear you mumbling. It's not hell and you're not dead. Open your eyes. That's strange. Even in death, Ishikawa finds a way to haunt me. Oh, you little. Bidding herself get shaken, she snapped her eyes open. Instead of fire and brimstone that she was expecting, she was met with a lush landscape as far as the eye could see. The blue sky sitting on top of it. Hearing of the fluttering of material, she looked up to see the colorful spread of cloth billowing above her. Ah, where did that come from? The secret tool for later, that's where. That voice behind us said, Are you finally back in the land of living again? Oh, there was just Ishikawa. Did I say that out loud? You've been mumbling to yourself ever since you thought you died, he confirmed. Ah. Other than you coming back from the dead, how would you enjoy your first time skydiving? 
the gold glare Scythine gave him sent a shiver down his back. I'm docking your pay for this. Ah, oh, man, he sighed to himself. I still do it again, though. You chaos scrum... Oh, or whatever. Just take me somewhere safer next time. Next time, huh? He asked with a raised eyebrow. Ever heard of, um, bungee jumping? End of story. Humans and Ethanol, written by Wanny91. To us, said the bipedal creature, who was sitting on the opposite side of my table, with a solemnly voice, and raised the glass which it held in one of his two claw-like hands in my direction. Surprised by the sudden gesture of friendliness which came out of nowhere, I needed a moment before I could grab my glass so that I could imitate the strange and to me unknown gesture of the human. As it quickly turned out, my decision to copy the human's gesture had been the right thing, because as soon as I had raised my glass into the air, the human opened his mouth sideways and showed me a set of white and dangerously sharp-looking teeth. And it was only thanks to my universal translator and the fact that I had seen this gesture before that I knew that this menacing-looking gesture was in fact an expression of happiness and not a threat against my person but still smiling as the spatial expression was called in his language. The human nodded appreciatively for my thoughtfulness with his head in my direction before finally lowering his hand again so he was able to press the opening of the glass firmly to his lips. And without waiting for me to do the same, the human proceeded to gulp the greenish liquid inside of the glass down his throat in one single, continuous move of his head backwards instead of taking one sip at a time. I could only guess at this point that it was the high percentage of ethanol inside his drink which let the human immediately twist his mouth in disgust when the bitter flavor of the ethanol overwhelmed his sense of taste as soon as the liquid had reached his stomach. But before I had the chance to ask him if he was okay, the human suddenly slammed down his empty glass on the table, lowered his head and let out a loud bah! before starting to shake his head violently from one side to the other like he wanted to get rid of the bitter taste in his mouth in that kind of way. Interestingly enough, this fierce head-shaking actually seemed to aid the human in overcoming the numbing after-effects of the ethanol in record time, because not only did the human stop the head-shaking a few moments later again, but he also lifted up his head and looked me straight into my eyes like nothing had just happened, and instead of showing regret, the human showed me his predatory smile again before asking, Another one, while pointing with one of his five fingers he possessed in each hand at the almost empty glass in front of me. Since I was still frozen in astonishment about this vast metabolism, I needed a moment before I could recover and answer him. I, uh, honestly don't know. But instead of accepting my answer, the smile on the human's face only grew wider. Come on, he said, taunting me. We have finally finished our project in which we had worked for over the past year. So let us celebrate this occasion in an appropriate kind of way. When I heard the human saying that, I couldn't resist to ask him in a reproachful tone. Does celebrating mean to poison oneself with ethanol until we black out? I asked him. And before the human could answer my subtle allegations, I took a quick glance at the five empty glasses which stood in front of him, before saying in a more respectful tone, Look, Robert, I admit that I don't know much about your species yet, but I'm fairly sure that no living being should drink that amount of ethanol, like you have, unless they plan to kill themselves. And you, my friend, already had a lot, so I don't think any more drinks are good for you. But instead of accepting my concerns, my co-worker, called Robert, waved with his hand horizontally in the air like he wanted to wipe the concerns away with that gesture. Look, Gregor, he said with a completely different tone in his voice than before. Alcohol, or as an old base drinks like you would call them, are essential for us humans if we want to celebrate something. Now, of course, you are right with your assumption that too much ethanol can be dangerous, even for someone of my species. But believe me when I say that most humans know their limit of how much ethanol they can handle before they have to throw up, and I'm still far away from that point. Are you sure? I asked my friend, not fully convinced yet. That was why I inquired. How can you know your tolerance for this kind of poison if too much can kill you? And Robert could only give me his answer, I explained myself. 
I only ask because I have heard that it isn't allowed for a human to drink ethanol-based drinks if they aren't considered to be an adult by law yet. And this isn't until one of your kind is over 18 cycles old. So there is no time yet to learn your limit without overdosing and thus killing yourself, especially if you are only 24 cycles old, like you have told me. Well, Robert started to explain. Technically, you are right when you say that it is forbidden for a human to drink alcohol if they are still underage. But this law honestly never has stopped us from drinking, even though we weren't grown-ups yet, he said while smiling mischievously. His words stopped me in the middle of moving my glass down from my mouth. Wait a minute, I slowly said, while I put the glass back on the table. Do you honestly want to tell me that your younglings ignore this law and drink this kind of poison, even though it can kill them? Robert nodded with his head. With his head, the flesh around my mouth moved back in shock and gobsmacked if I asked him, How in the name of Ulstuk can your elders allow you to do something like that? Don't they try to stop you? My question let Robert laugh. <laughs> I can't answer for others, but in my case, it was actually my father who gave me my first drink. He said a few moments later, still chuckling. Your elder did what? I said louder than I wanted to. That was why I lowered my voice when I asked Robert, shocked. How could your elder do that if the slightest bit of ethanol is enough to kill a youngling? Robert stopped smiling, and one of his eyebrows moved up. Why would a sip of alcohol kill a child? He asked me, confused, instead of answering my question. It isn't like our bodies can't handle one sip, he then said. Now I was confused. Do you seriously want to tell me that the bodies of your younglings can handle ethanol? How is this even possible without having the help of an implant? Robert scratched his head. How do I say this? He said more to himself than to me before starting. I know that this may sound strange to you, but we humans have an organ which just job is to clean our blood, and in the process it removes everything poisonous from our body. I was impressed. That really is interesting, I said, and was quiet for a moment, so Robert used the chance to ask a question himself. Based on your comment, I suspect that your species don't have such an organ. Am I right? As an answer, I slowly moved my head in a circular motion, which had the same meaning as the human gesture, where they shook their head to deny something. No, we don't have such an organ, I confirmed Robert's suspicion. And why should we? Back on our home planet, there wasn't anything which was poisonous for us, so we never had to deal with poison. But if you don't mind me asking, how did your species have the idea to create the implant if there wasn't anything on your home planet which was toxic to you? Robert inquired. His question let my ears vibrate in amusement. My race isn't stupid, Robert. I answered him over the humming in my ears. It is only logical that my race sooner or later stumbled over something toxic in the universe. And when we found out how vulnerable our bodies were, we created the implants in order to protect ourselves. So why don't you give your young wings an implant if any toxin can kill them? Robert asked, puzzled. I moved one of my arms over my head. That is quite hard to explain to an outsider, I said evasive. But our younglings grow up on our home planet until they have reached a certain level of self-awareness. And since ethanol is not only highly addictive for us, but also numbs our nervous systems like it does with yours, we believe that it hinders them to reach this level and thus hinder them in reaching adulthood. So until they aren't ready yet, they simply won't get an implant. Sounds harsh, but effective, Robert commented, and moved his hand through his hair around his mouth, which only had grown in the last few months. It sounds harsh, yes, I agreed, but by doing that, we make sure that they won't get tempted by something that can kill them. True that, Robert agreed, and since he didn't ask another question, I used the chance to ask him another. So instead of an implant like we have, your species has an organ which protects you from the toxins? Robert nodded. That is more or less right, he confirmed, but the liver as an organ is called isn't capable of protecting us against every kind of poison we ingest. When we are born, as for example, our liver is still weak, and the slightest amount of poison can kill us since the liver can't handle it yet. Therefore, the law banning alcohol for underage humans since their liver can't handle the ethanol yet. What do you mean by yet? Do you want to imply that this liver of yours gets stronger over time? I asked, confused. Not over time, no, Robert denied. More like our liver grows stronger, the more poison we ingest. I didn't quite understand that. That was why I asked, care to explain? Robert sighed. Take ethanol as an example. I had my first sip of alcohol when I was 14 years old. At first, I didn't like the taste of beer at all, and I got sick just by drinking one sip. 
but over the course of the next two years, I was able to drink more and more sips until I could drink two beers without any problem. And what happens if you drink too much? Robert scratched his head. It depends on the amount you take. If you are below a certain level, we only wake up the next day with a nasty headache, since the ethanol takes away the water in our body, which leaves us with a so-called hangover. But if we drink more than that, we will throw up since our body wants to get rid of the excessive alcohol in our body. Only, if we then choose to drink more alcohol, it can get dangerous for us if we don't get treated at a hospital. So ethanol is only dangerous for you if you choose to ignore all the warnings and don't get treated at a hospital, I repeated his last words as a question. Robert nodded slowly, but then suddenly clapped his hands together. But enough of what happens if we have too much, he said enthusiastically and pointed again at the empty glass in front of him. So do you take another round or not? Surprised by his sudden change of topic, I looked down at the empty glass in my hand before I asked myself the very same question, and more important, if my implant could handle another round. Fine, I said a few moments later, reluctantly, and sighed heavily. Let us order another round, I added, even though I cursed myself on the inside, ready for agreeing. I knew that the consequences of another round would be a terrible headache the next morning, since the implant used this pain to show me how much more toxin it could handle, and the more I would have in my body, the worse the headache would get. When I looked up from the glass again, it didn't surprise me to see Robert smiling again. That is good to hear, my friend, he said, obviously happy, before begging me, but please let us order some drink from my planet this time. Why? I asked him curiously. Robert sighed. Because then you will be able to drink a real drink for once, and not something weak like the previous beverage we had. I couldn't help myself for feeling a bit offended by his words. What do you mean by weak drink? I asked him provokingly. That green liquid had so much ethanol inside it that your body instantly reacted to it, so you can't tell me that it was too weak. Are you referring to my head shaking in tears? Robert asked, surprised only to add innocently. That wasn't because of the amount of ethanol in the drink. I leaned forward in my stool. You seriously want to tell me that that violent head shaking, the tensing of your muscles, and the transplant fluid in your eyes after you had swallowed down the drink in one gulp wasn't because there was too much ethanol inside of it? I asked, obviously not believing him. But Robert nodded his head. That is correct, yes, he said. And that head shaking was to get rid of the weird aftertaste since uh, the liquid tasted like foul meat. But beside that, I, I barely could taste the ethanol inside of the drink. That is why I poured my glass so full and swallowed in one motion. Really? I asked, still not believing him. But since I knew that it was pointless to argue with Robert about that topic, I gave in. Fine, if you are so convinced, then let us order some beverage from your planet. But please order something which doesn't have too much ethanol in it, okay? I don't want to end up totally wasted. Robert smiled and nodded eagerly before turning around on his stool so that he could search for the drink maker of this place. I, in the meantime, used this chance to sort out my thoughts, because even though Robert's species had joined the Galactic Republic quite a while ago, I hadn't had the time yet to learn more about his species. So the fact that Robert supposedly hadn't felt any ethanol in our previous drink somehow worried me a bit, since the green liquid was supposed to be one of the strongest drinks in this bar. But if Robert was telling the truth about this organ called the liver, it would certainly explain some of the rumors and warnings I'd heard about the humans. And it would also explain how Roberts was able to drink so much ethanol without showing any side effects. But while I was still lost in my thoughts, I suddenly could hear Robert asking someone, Do you have any kind of beverage from the Terrans? Referring to the official name of his species. Confused to whom Robert was talking to, I lifted my head only to see him facing a tall, greyish-looking alien who had quietly arrived on our table without me noticing. I think we have some beverages from the human race. I could hear the drink maker of the bar saying to Robert in his high voice, but you would have to pour your drinks yourselves since we don't know how much human ethanol is enough to make this strong drink. Robert smiled. That isn't a problem at all. He said happy and failed to notice that the drink maker made a step backwards as soon as he saw the predatory smile of Robert. But not a second later, it seemed like the universal translator kicked in and told the drink maker that the smile of Robert was a gesture of friendliness and not a threat against him, what it would have usually meant if it had come from any other omni or carnivorous species. 
That was why the greyish alien relaxed, again, as soon as he had heard the translation of his translator. Curiously, I looked from the drinkmaker to Robert, who didn't seem to have noticed that the drinkmaker had made a step backwards because he didn't show any sign of concern. Instead, Robert asked the drinkmaker, Before you go, I can also ask you if you have Coca-Cola in this bar. Unlike me, it seemed like the drinkmaker had heard the word Coca-Cola before, because he asked Robert to clarify, Isn't Coca-Cola that dark, sweet liquid from your race with a lot of sugar in it? Yep, that's it, Robert confirmed with his predatory smile before asking, So that means you have some? The drinkmaker nodded slowly and said, I would have to look in our basement, but I think we still have some bottles left. If we have some, I will bring you one bottle. That would be very kind of you, Robert said, and then turned in my direction again since the conversation with the drink maker was clearly finished. Cola, I simply asked Robert after we faced each other again. It is a soft drink from my planet. When I was younger, we often used it to mix it with other alcohol, so our drinks would taste better, Robert answered my question. And what is inside of this soft drink? I wanted to know. But instead of telling me, Robert raised his hand facing upwards to his shoulder, which, according to my translator, was a gesture to show that he didn't know something. I honestly don't know, Robert added to his gesture a second later. But since our two races apparently have similar taste, I think you'll like it. We will see, I simply said, since I wasn't that sure about it, and we both fell into silence. Luckily for us, we didn't have long to wait until the drink maker returned to our table with a total of six different bottles in each of his hands. I wasn't sure which Terran alcohol you would like. That is why I brought you every bottle we have from Earth, he said, while placing one bottle after another in front of Robert, until one bottle was left. And here is your requested Coca-Cola, the drink maker said, while placing the last bottle on the table. And, by the way, the drink maker continued, I have checked the label on this bottle, and my boss told me to tell you that if you don't finish the bottle here, can you take it home, since most of our clients probably won't drink something like that, which is so highly addictive. The drink maker's last words gave me a worried look, while Robert looked happy. Thank you very much for that, he thanked the drink maker, before turning his attention to the bottles. Slowly, he took each bottle into his hands and inspected the label before he took the bottle cap and looked inside of the bottle. This procedure repeated itself for every bottle until Robert had inspected every single bottle except one with the Coca-Cola inside. We'll take this one, Robert said, after he had put the last bottle on the table again, only to take another bottle in his hands so that he could show it to the drink maker. Very well, the drink maker said, and made a little bow. Then I will take the other ones back. With his word, the drinker took the other four bottles in his hands again before walking back behind the bar counter so that he was able to store the bottles behind the locked cabinet again. With a slightly worried look on my face, I turned my attention from the locked cabinet back to Robert, who in the meantime was busy opening a bottle, which looked like it was made out of molten sand. After he had opened the bottle, Robert carefully filled the two fresh glasses, which the drink maker had also brought to about half full before closing the bottle again. And while Robert reached out for the red-colored bottle made from plastic, I stretched one of my arms so that I was able to grab the clear glass bottle with one of my suckers on my hand. What does Jack Daniels and Tennessee whiskey mean? I asked Robert as soon as I had finished reading the black label on the bottle. Robert looked up from pouring the drinks and followed my gaze to the bottle. Ah, you mean the bottle, he said, smiling. Well, Jack Daniels is the name of the alcohol, and Tennessee whiskey describes what type it is. You have different ethanol-based drinks? I asked Robert, surprised. Yeah, yes, we have, Robert answered, while finishing the second glass by pouring Coca-Cola in it. We have, as an example, beer, which is made from the fermentation of starches. Then we have wine, which is made from the fermentation of grapes and other fruits. And then we have harder liquor, which is made by distilling different mixtures of alcoholic fermentation. And how many different ethanol-based drinks are there? I almost didn't dare to ask. Robert moved his shoulder up again without looking up. I don't know. Thousands, maybe? Thousands? I said in disbelief. Or more, Robert added and finished the second drink. And what does this symbol on these numbers mean? I asked while Robert was closing the Coca-Cola bottle, which wasn't even half empty yet. You mean the percentage symbol? 
Robert asked to clarify while handing me one of the two glasses. I'm surprised that your translator hasn't translated it, but the symbol shows the percentage of ethanol inside the bottle. Here, it says the bottle contains 40% alcohol. Wait, what? I asked hardly. Did you just say 40%? Robert nodded. Why? Is that a problem? He asked me, concerned. I shook my head. Not for me, no. But a percentage of a 20% in a liquid is enough to kill almost everyone else. Did you know that? Robert's eyes grew wide, which indirectly told me his answer. No, I didn't know that. He answered, obviously surprised. But can you drink it? I nodded. Barely, yes. And only because my species has the implant. But if the percentage would be over 50%, it would be deadly for me too. Luckily for me, you didn't mix this drink with some kind of psychoactive drug. Otherwise, I would die in the spot. As soon as I ended my sentence, Robert looked several seconds with wide eyes at me before he leapt so fast over the table that my eyes couldn't follow him. Before I could even react, Robert already had smacked the drink which had mixed out of my hand. What the feck, Robert? I yelled, surprised at Robert, and stood up. But the only thing Robert did was sit calmly down and he stood again. So I asked him with a quieter voice, Why did you do that? Robert took a sip from his drink before saying in a calm voice, uh, believe me, you'll thank me in a minute. I folded my tentacles around my body to show him that I wasn't happy with him. And why should I? I asked him challengingly. Robert took another sip. Well, he started. Maybe because that Coca-Cola is from my planet contains caffeine. I stared in disbelief at Robert. What? I asked to clarify, even though I'd heard him correctly. You seriously want to tell me that you mix your ethanol-based drinks with some other psychoactive drug? Is your species crazy? To my surprise, Robert smiled. If you think that's crazy, he said, then you should see what we do back on Earth. There we have alcohol, well over 80% alcohol, and we sometimes mix it with liquids, who have as much caffeine inside of them as Coca-Cola. Seriously, Robert? I was finally able to say, after staring at Robert in disbelief for several minutes. You humans have a serious addiction problem. End of story. Story number one, Exchangeable Parts, written by Zentaps. Many stories exist of humans who are somehow able to invent their way out of impossible scenarios. Ships repaired from catastrophic damages. Prisoners engineering an escape vehicle from spare parts. Soldiers who jerry-rig equipment in the field to win battles. Even just that random human down the street who can repair junk into working equipment. What gets lost in the retellings is one fact about human technology. Standardization of exchangeable parts. The concept of parts being identical and interchangeable. This concept is reflected in the construction of their devices. The same tube that connects a water pipeline to a reactor core might very well be the same size as the one that feeds into the washing machine. A damaged heating coil in a spacesuit might have a close cousin in the electric kettle. What follows are some vignettes that exemplify the utility that standardization grants. When a blackout cut the power to the city hospital, there was a crisis almost immediately. Dozens of patients were at risk if power couldn't be restored soon. The backup generators failed almost immediately. A bad wiring sparked a fire that was quickly put out before things went terribly wrong. In a bid that was both brilliant and desperate, the hospital staff enlisted near everyone they could to plug the generators for their vehicle into the hospital grid. Cables stretched across the parking lot and through from the front door, and coils snaked through the ground floor windows and pooling beside the hospital's power substation. On the roof, the hospital's three rescue vehicles idled, pumping power. It was just enough to sustain the bare necessities. When power was restored, the hospital declared that no casualties had been sustained, which was met with cheers. When the military depot on Corrigar 4 was suddenly under threat of invasion from the Drell, it found itself short of fighter craft. Many of the defensive craft damaged in the initial attacks. In an unusual move, the decision was made to strip the land vehicles for parts to repair wounded planes. Holes patched with deck plating, shield generators from tank refits for a fighter craft housing. As a result, Corrigal was able to field an impressive air defense, which bravely fought off the invasion fleet. However, early ground invasion elements had already landed and were moving to destroy key military positions. 
In one of the fastest turnarounds, the fighter craft were landed, stripped of their parts to restore the plundered land vehicles, which then raced off to intercept the enemy force. It was an astounding feat, one which saw crews crawling over still melting armor plates to pick out components to facilitate repairs. When the passenger liner Molten Streamer's reactor suffered a core breach, it was lucky enough to be in the range of a nearby planet. Though the planet was unoccupied, it did have an old marine base from the fortress walls orbiting around it. Engineers from the Molten Streamer made a quick shuttle trip to the salvage materials and parts that they could from the old relic. Standards back then had largely remained in place, and the engineers were after some time able to identify similar parts in the housing of the powered-down base reactor. Though, to the irritation of the engineers, the power cables had a lower max power specification than their own. In the end, the Molten Streamer's crew were not only able to repair the damage to the ship, but also fix a long-broken coffee machine. End of story. Story number two. Tit for tat. Written by underscore underscore dash underscore 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 dash 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 underscore. Terry was getting tired of everyone's crap. She couldn't go a day without someone messing with her food or drink. They tried to tamper with the climate control of her quarters, but she locked that down fast. Terry could understand if the skullduggery and shenanigans were a product of her own machinations or her people's, but it wasn't. For whatever reason, that made it all the more frustrating to her. At least they were learning. She wasn't allowed exposed flame. But they didn't try to feed her methanol anymore, either. Totally worth it. Now they checked relevant medical data before trying to sneak things into her consumables. They weren't the sharpest tools in the shed when it came to covering their digital tracks, either. At first, Terry thought that she'd have to design and implement an algorithm to feed the medical intelligence. But it wasn't necessary. The medical intelligence was there to help and safeguard the crew, after all. So she only had to request notification... If any of the crew had inquired about planet Earth, humans in particular. Granted, there was that one time being from a mythically deadly environment was quite convenient. Her fellow crew stopped asking about sex and asked for sexual failures after she disseminated a compilation of traditional human mating procedures. She decided she couldn't go wrong with clips from the classics Event Horizon and Hellraiser. Murder, fecking, and grotesque mutilations weren't high up on anyone's fetish list which was nice. At least the genuine questions weren't too bad. Terry would take a question and answer session over tests any day. Most of them would go glossy-eyed rather quickly, especially when it turned out the answer to mythical human endurance was due to technology and societal relations. It wasn't as cool as the humans were resilient due to medical technology and because humans nurtured their own. Everyone wanted to hear stories about walking juggernauts unable to die. It was disappointing to learn that those sorts of humans were a few and far between. That what made those humans unique was their social skills, not their ability to wade through lava. Because that's how intelligent life survived on so-called death worlds. Social adaptation, not Godzilla-style domination. Humans embodied the phrase, work smart, not hard. With a grin, Terry made some notes, Godzilla would be a great movie night. She'd get a new slew of questions and tests, but for the G-Man, it would be worth it. Horror movies and kaiju always seemed to be a big hit with the crew. If a screaming in terror and running away from the raw auditorium could be considered a big hit. Terry considered it the biggest of hits. End of story. Story number three. When I think about the humans, I don't think of war. Written by Despair. I don't think any of my people do. Oh sure, we hear the stories, and I have no doubt they're true. I imagine what I know turned towards destruction, and I shudder. But, about 30 standard years ago, my species got hit with the worst luck in the galaxy. A highly contagious disease, deadly, naturally evolved super plague. Multicellular microorganism, so our standard drugs didn't affect it and so fast mutating that our immune system couldn't get a grip on it. It didn't look like anything would slow it down, until it ran low on hosts. We put out a general distress call, but not many responded. 
Our treaty bound allies to put up a military screen to keep our opportunistic raiders, but I doubt any would have crossed the quarantine warnings. A few of the more charitable high tech sieves, space dropped self contained water purifiers, power cells, home nano assemblers, and things like that. Useful stuff for the survivors of a civilization collapse. If there were any survivors. None of the stuff helped with that. The humans sent a fleet. I say the humans, but it is a bit more complicated than that. Everybody knows that humans practice capitalism, and anybody who's dealt with their merchants knows they're good at it. And, of course, they have a government. But this fleet was neither government nor for profit. It was from a human order called Healers Unstoppable. Or at least, that's how my translator rendered it. It was a group of human healers who had declared the civilization wrecking plagues were not going to happen and set out to enforce it. They landed and started setting up field hospitals. Now, that's crazy for two reasons. First, nobody knew if the disease could jump species or not. Quarantine can't really hold in those conditions. Every one of them would easily have died just from setting foot on our world. Second, who studies xenomedicine? Learning the biology of one species takes years of hard work. Two might be doable if you're long-lived, but some of our human doctors are trained to provide basic medicine to every known sentient species. I asked one about it later, and she said, after the third or fourth, it gets easier. Crazy. Our infrastructure was pretty much in shambles by then. Didn't intimidate them at all. They just pulled out a checklist of things they needed and either plugged into us or space dropped it. They'd refined their procedures down to the checklists. I'm almost asked how many crises they jumped into to get to that point, but I decided that I didn't want to know. And they weren't just treating patients. They were taking samples of the pathogen, sequencing them, and uploading to interstellar medical databases. As a lot of us thought, what's the point? Ours is the only planet where life uses hydrocarbon polymer genomics, and our bioinformaticists are dead. Nobody can use this data. Well, if you read this far, you can probably guess that it was the humans again. Specifically, it was some human on Earth whose day job was a database programming, but did biostatistics as a hobby. He ran machine learning over the sequences using his employer's computers. Apparently, they didn't care, and found some highly conserved surface receptors. He recognized surface transport codes because he'd studied our genetic systems he studied dozens of different genetic systems. He said, they're interesting. That was the insight the healers unstoppable folks needed. Within hours, they had desired a cure and a vaccine. There are species out there that are better biostatistics than the humans, but they do what they need. Only the humans do it for fun. So only humans do it in bio mysteries they've hardly ever dealt with. And only humans look at the plague devastating a faraway world that they have no ties to and say, We're not letting that happen. We wouldn't be here today without them. That's what humanity means to my people. End of story. A figure painted in grey, written by Argus the Cat. The first time I saw them, was during the Hosporus conflict, in a system so backwater that not a single one of the species that colonized it had actually named the planets, much less the moons. I was serving as a troop psychologist and medic for our injured on Hosporus 5A, a moon so backwater that the colonists hadn't even bothered to give proper names to the, to the towns starting the surface. The towns, in reality, were massive mining rigs extracting those few materials that weren't typically found on more easily accessed asteroids. And the colonists were, in fact, employees. That didn't stop the loose alliance of worlds a few jumps over from owls from setting their sights on the system as a staging area, or a military buffer zone, or uh, something. And that meant taking the moons and the strangely well-armed mining rigs, and that meant troops, and troops meant medics. I landed with a group of humans. Their shuttles had better Atmo capabilities, and one had swung by our transports to pick up a few of us going planetside before they walked out. The humans didn't talk much on the ride down. In fact, from what I knew about them from my training, they all appeared to be nervous, panicked almost. 
These weren't trained soldiers, nor even medics who had seen combat or its after effects. These were practically children. One of them was even silently crying to themselves. These were, at best, recently graduated medical students. I shuddered to think of the kind of effects this war was having on humanity, if this was all they had to spare. When we touched down, we were informed as a group by the one sentry sent to greet us that there wasn't time for a tour or to get settled in, and that several dozen troops had been injured in the last hour during to some heavy fighting. Leaving our bags beside the landing pad, we were quickly ushered to triage and operations. Stepping inside out of the harsh red light and faint a coppery smell of the planet's atmosphere, a lot of us were welcome to a scene out of a nightmare. Twenty, thirty, fifty individuals of at least four of our alliance's species, all of them bleeding, screaming, dying in front of us. Nurses and what few doctors were here moved with frantic haste, trying to do what they could against the tide of wounded. And the smell, well... If you thought that human blood smelled a little too metallic, let me tell you, the experience does not get better when it's mixed with the acidic blood of the Gurash or the harsh blood of the Latu, which can in fact be used as a substitute for glass cleaner. Even as some who had served as a medic, I do not feel shame to tell you that I froze, rocked up, my stomach burned in fear, and I felt my tendrils shake. This many wounded, we would never save them all. Around, the humans were the same. They had never seen war or the ruin it left. They would be worse than useless. I had to act before. Before I could compose myself and move forward, a human strode through the hellscape of a building. He, she, I thought I had gotten better at telling. They, uh, they were dressed in a grey suit, perfectly cut and undisturbed by the chaos around them. Circular glasses perched on their nose, catching the light and reflecting it in a similar shade of grey hiding their eyes. They walked up to the pack of humans without being acknowledged and turned in the middle of them to face the dead and dying. I was close enough to just barely hear, over the cacophony that was the field hospital, what they said. The war is over, they said, a hand gently on the shoulder of the nearest medic, while the other pointed at the wounded. Yours begins now. And I saw that hand give a firm grasp and then a small push. And the humans moved. Their fear turned to anger, or worry, or determination, or perhaps simply hope. One of the older ones started barking orders, organizing their companions. The younger ones moved to assist the nurses, while the four humans with cross-species surgical training immediately rushed to sterilize and begin operating. They broke from their huddled group like a formation of interceptors swarming a battleship. Then stars helped me. I felt myself pulled along behind them, like I was just another member of the unit. We worked like madmen, all of us. The humans reinforced their other surgeons and doctors with the fervor of fanatics marching to a holy war. Wherever one of them was working, I saw shoulders lift and spines straighten amongst their allies. When a human nurse assisted a surgeon of a foreign species, the surgeon cut straighter patched cleaner, and moved as though they were being judged by the eyes of the gods. The hospital's chaos had broken against them, and now they stood holding it back, closing wounds and stilling screams. I had briefly checked the triage early on, and was told by a frayed soldier doing the job far above his training that perhaps, if we were lucky, ten of these fifty-six damaged people would love. When the day ended... Sixteen hours of ceaseless work later, fifty-two bodies sat mended, sleeping or dozing or uh, flirting weakly with their nurses. Only four died, and of those four, two were as we were landing. My people are not meant to go longer than ten hours without sleep, and as I felt myself losing consciousness, sitting back to back with a human doctor the size of a small bus, I saw a pair of grey shoes approaching through my slitted eyes. Good job, I heard softly muttered. The shoes shuffled, then one turned and pointed back towards me. You too, the voice whispered. Thank you, I said. The last thing I heard before falling asleep for the next two rotations of this moon was the human I was using as a pillow say, What for?
It was six years later. The war had ended some time back, but I had still had my full term of service to play out, and so had not been able to make this trip. I was on earth, yet to visit Jackos, the doctor I had briefly met and used as a bed that first night on Hosporus 5A. In over four years together on that impossibly awful moon, the two of us had become friends. More than friends, really. Companions, allies, sometimes lovers, sometimes, to the amusement of the rest of the town, glorious antagonists. But to the humans, I suppose that all got summed up as friends. Humans could stand to use more descriptive words. It was spring when my shuttle touched up, and after finally escaping the starport, I caught a cab and made my way to the park where we were planning to meet. Parks were one of the things that humans didn't quite do as well as my own people, but they certainly were trying. This one had walking trail miles long, and with all the flowers in bloom and lush green grass and thick green leafy trees all around, it felt like I had tripped and fallen into a lost jungle. I met Jackos near the entrance, and the two of us walked for a while, talking and catching up. We climbed up a hill with a good view of the main road with his home city around us, and he set up some food from the picnic that he'd brought. The first thing he pulled out was a pair of ration bars that we'd had to eat on the damned moon, and it took putting him in a headlock to stop his laughter at my expression. We spent a couple hours there, just enjoying the spring daylight of their system. Perhaps we reminded the universe of the war, and it simply couldn't let too much time pass without someone being hurt. Because as we sat there, the crash of breaking glass and a scream of twisting metal cut through the air. After a jolt of panic wore off, we both quickly spotted. Down on the road below, a car had broken the guardrail and was hanging dangerously over the cliff. Already a few other cars had stopped, and humans were getting out and moving around. It looked like someone might have been calling for help, but the small crowd wasn't moving to the teetering car. And then, like a repeat of years back, from the side of the crowd, a perfectly ordinary human walked towards the car. They moved with purpose and focus and stopped at five paces back. Then they turned and... Have you ever heard a room when everyone goes quiet? They made that happen. I don't know how... But they did. The air itself still, and even from two or three hundred meters away, I heard them softly say, Stabilize the back. Get the child out first. And the crowd moved, with almost perfect coordination. Six people stepped forward to hold down the rear of the car, while someone else broke open the window with a rock to unlock the back door and pulled out the girl, who couldn't have been older than my own younger brother. The driver was too dangerous to get, it seemed but they held that car there like an ancient anchor, rotating people as they got tired. And when emergency services arrived, not more than two minutes later, and had them let go after retrieving the driver, I got to see the vehicle almost immediately go over the edge. Who was that person? They remind me of someone from the moon, I asked Jackos. Which person? he asked. The driver, or that one guy in the car who looked like the drill sergeant we had in recovery for a while. No, no the one in the grey suit, the one who told them to what to do. He looked at me strangely for a second, before saying, I didn't see anyone giving orders there. It looked like they just did what they needed to. You didn't see them. They were almost exactly like the person who spurred all of you humans on when they first landed all those years ago. You remember? They were wearing that grey suit, and I don't think we ever saw their eyes, but they said something that made you all start moving. He pulled his hand away from my arm. Are you all right? Yes. Why? Well, you just described something that never happened. I shall skip the description of the argument we had. It was heated, but at the end of it, I came to a simple conclusion. Either he'd been hit in the head very hard, and humans had the same propensity for microamnesia induced by brain damage that my own species did, or there was something wrong with this grey human... I needed to know more. Perhaps I was too open at first, but I simply asked, a posting on the galactic net aimed at other psychologists and researchers like myself. I asked if anyone knew someone like this or had met them before. I didn't give details of my own meetings, but simply said that I had seen something that made me curious. 
It took less than an hour to get responses. Several responses. A colony's government turns to a dictatorship, and when the population finally rises up, the humans lead the mob, and the man in a grey suit leads the humans, shouting guidance and anger into the crowd. Looting is minimal, as are casualties, and the government topples. A bar fight on a trading station, two mining crews beating each other up. The fight turns ugly, and a bystander sees someone go for a gun. The bystander also sees a human wearing grey and gleaming glasses catch the miner's wrist, and tell them, Save that for your enemies! No shots are fired, no bar stools survive the incident, but all those who started it, breathing, ended the same way. Two dozen different sightings at sporting events, cheering with the crowd, or the crowd cheering with them. A mugging happens. Four humans come out of nowhere, and the mugging stops happening rather quickly. They say that they felt like they needed to be there. The victim sees someone, in a grey suit of course, turns and walks away at the end of the alley. A jewel heist happens. The guards are good at their jobs, and they corner the perpetrator a dashing rogue who has hit two other high-profile targets in the last month. They steal from the rich and give the people excellent stories. The human god has a clean shot. His partner, a Latou, does not. The partner sees someone in a grey suit next to the human, shaking their head and chuckling. The human does not take the shot. I am sitting in a library. It's on a human world. I have not slept in a very long time. My search consumes me, as I have seen it consume others, conspiracy theorists and xenopsychologists and journalists alike. Many people have gone into this hunt and never come out the other side. But I have something they do not. I have one thing that sets me apart from all of those before me who have thrown their lives away searching for the grey human. I have a meeting, perhaps. The library is quiet. That is how I know it is here. Libraries are never truly quiet. People whisper, children run, and sometimes shout. Patrons step too heavily or drag chairs. But now, in this moment, it is silent, and I know the thing is here with me. Hello, I say. Someone sits down across from me, moving from just out of my field of vision. I did not see them approach or hear them enter. It's been a long time, they say. They are wearing a grey suit. They have a gleaming round glasses. They have not aged a day in the last three decades. I've been looking for you. It seems silly to say it. Obviously. Really. But what else can I say? They smile. A real, genuine smile. And the library feels pleasant and energetic. You've found me. They lie. I haven't found them. They've just shown up. You know out of everyone you've probably gotten the closest. I feel a spike of fear, despite the smile. It knows people have been looking for it. Has it killed them? Is that where they've gone? Am I simply the last on the list? I... You have some questions, don't you? Yes, but... The others... It looks surprised. Oh! You're worried. Some of them were too. I thought you'd be more clever. They're all alive, of course. Just distracted from their search now. It's amazing what a seven-figure salary in a prestigious human news agency will do for a reporter's determination. You primed him? No. They were simply offered more interesting and lucrative jobs. I cut past this part of the conversation to the question that has been on my mind for almost 30 years. What are you? The library is silent again, but this time it is because everyone has left. I notice now that we are totally alone in here. All of them... It answers me. No, I mean to ask, how are you? Quite well, thank you, it smiles. The big beaming smile like a child pleased with its first drawing pinned on the fridge. What I mean was, what I mean? What was I trying to ask here? It has distracted me, perhaps the same as it distracted all the others, given me half answers, but never lied. Perhaps it simply needs a more direct question. I think back to my research. To everything that I have learned about humanity, and how they think, and what they do, and I ask, Where were you created? It grins, holding up a finger that leans over the table. Ah, now that is a good question. I knew you were clever. It folds a finger down, and the grin gets a little stiff. 
I was brought online in the basement of a small home in Prescott, Arizona, about 600 years ago, and you fill in the gaps. 600? This creature was old, even by galactic lifespan standards. I started talking, explaining my research, trying to prompt it to tell me more. Well, I know that you weren't first sighted 600 years ago. The first time anyone saw you was, well, 30 years ago, during the Horosporus conflict. After that, you started showing up more and more usually telling humans what to do. They do need prompting sometimes, don't they? The grin was back, and it motioned for me to go on. I did. Not everyone can see you. Not everyone realizes they're seeing you either. You don't ever board starships or enter the Grand Link network. You also never physically move anything. You may as well be a ghost. But I don't think that you ever died, did you? I did not, as far as I know. You also experienced no light speed lag, and have been seen outside the presence of any kind of technology at all. Which means that you aren't simply a projected machine intelligence. Getting warmer! And of course, the most important part. Humans can't see you, cannot even speak of you, or acknowledge you. And yet, you're always around where humans are. And nowhere, ever, not one sighting, where humans are not. It claps its hands, applauding my summary. And in my heart, verifying these few facts. And so, Hunter... What prey have you tracked? 600 years ago, some mad group of humans, somehow, created a mind that lived within their own minds and either let you loose or you escaped. And for the last six centuries, you have been watching humanity and through them, the galaxy. And now you have started to play at being a god. Almost entirely right. How do you feel knowing that you have figured it out? Terrified, I was. Terrified beyond reason and yet... I couldn't run. It wouldn't matter anyway. It was disappointed. I saw it clearly, or perhaps simply sad. I looked down at the table, like I was scalding nestling. I'm sorry, it said. Sorry? For what? For scaring you. I hadn't meant to do that. I just, uh, I always feel better when I figure things out for myself. I was shocked. This was the last thing I had expected. Thirty years spent on this project, not because I was hiding but because it wanted me to feel satisfaction. You could have just told me the answers at any time. You mean I've wasted my whole life on this fool's errand? No, 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 not a waste. Y you taught me so much. You brought so many people into the search. I had to learn and adapt very fast to avoid all of you. I was weak and very fragile at the start. I've wanted to talk to you for so long, but couldn't or couldn't risk it. You... Wanted to talk to me? Of course! You were the first one I saw work with another human. You were the first one that heard me. And you were the first one that ever talked to me. You matter to me. And I want you to be the first one that I live with that isn't biologically human. Live with? What does that mean? Shock, fear, worry. These things all got to sit down for a moment while curiosity took control of me. The grin was back. I hadn't noticed it stand up, but it was pacing on its side of the table, gesturing excitedly as I spoke. I live with the humans, all of them. I don't play God, like you say, though. I just help them be the best versions of themselves. I help them be what they want to be already. Really, I can't do anything else, because I am them, in a very real way. It's taken me 600 years to learn how to have thoughts that are my thoughts. But now I can, and I think, uh, I think I really do want what the human wants, which is to meet other people and join them and, and see the universe together. And I want to start with you, if you let me. It's taken me six centuries to learn how to whisper, and then you came along, and you're not even human, and you can hear me like I'm shouting, and you can be my ambassador for both our people. And we can see where it goes, I guess. I couldn't help it. I laughed. I laughed and laughed. And it looked confused before I emotioned, reassurance and composed myself. I just figured it out, I gasped out. You've the power of a god, and you're stumbling over asking me on a first date. It looked around sheepishly, ducking its head. Well, I almost started laughing again at the idea of a god stumbling over its words, but then realized... That might be mean. From what I'd seen so far, this thing, this, well, this person, 
wasn't evil or dangerous at all. They were new, fresh, and ready to face the universe, and with absolutely no experience of their own. So I cut it off and simply said, Yes. And what then? And then, everything. And now we step onto the stage of the United Poran Leadership, and they ask us to state our names, and I say, I am Jaskar Vartu, first of the world of Inaya, now of the world of Earth, first ambassador of humanity unified. And beside me, it says, I am everyone. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.